Hello everyone, Future Nachos here. I'm here to tell you that Past Nachos is an idiot and has no idea how to start off a video unscripted. Actually, I still don't because this bit is scripted. Anyway, there are a few things I want to preface this video with. First off is the reason why I decided to read this VN. I was actually going to read it eventually anyway. I have a mental list of visual novels I intend to get to at some point or another. But the reason I went with this one specifically is because another YouTuber I watch and have occasional friendly conversation with started playing it and I wanted to watch their videos. That's it. Their name is Godzi, their channel will be linked in the description, and honestly you should go watch them instead of me if I'm being honest. But after you do that, I'll be happy to have you. Then I have to clarify a few things about myself. I think a lot of this information is doled out vaguely at different points throughout the recording, but I'll go ahead and preempt to them. I am not a charismatic or talkative person. In fact, I talk about as much as required of me on any given day and almost no more. Even reading off scripts is challenging for me, so imagine how much of a problem it is for me to maintain a constant stream of commentary on top of lots and lots of reading out loud. The mental energy I exert talking so much kind of takes a toll on my capacity to actually take in information I am receiving at times throughout the playthrough. So on top of being uncharismatic and straining my voice, I'm also inexplicably a dumbass at certain times. Not that I'm a super genius the rest of the time. I really am not selling myself well here. But I don't expect this video to take off or anything, it's mostly just an experiment proving to myself that I can do this in. And hopefully going forward I will be able to improve and make something actually worth watching. Finally, yes, I do intend to do more VN read-throughs in the future. If you have any suggestions for what you'd like to see next, leave them in the comments below. I can't speak very highly of the read-through specifically at this point in time, but people have gotten something out of my scripted videos and I am definitely steadily improving in their production. So if you have a VN you think would be interesting for me not just to read but to talk about after the fact, then fire off. At least in terms of writing stuff out, I can barely shut up. Speaking of, future nachos will see you at the end of the video. Later. Hello everybody, this is Tasty Nachos. It's been a while since I've been able to sit down and do a sort of VN read-through, and I apologize for that. Circumstances just haven't been able to allow it, but I am here with uh, Saya no Uta, or the Song of Saya, which is quite a um, revered title, as I understand it. A classic some would say it's apparently a horror romance and um i'm into at least one half of that but i guess we'll be able to go in and judge it um ourselves this isn't going to be like an intensive sort of read through i don't know if there are voices for this or not but i'm not going to end up doing them i might not even read all of the dialogue i guess we'll have to see or we'll read all of the um narration even but without further ado let's just get into it the story is a work of fiction the procedures and conditions described herein are imaginary and do not reflect actual medical practice This work of fiction contains grotesque images that may disturb some viewers. Please select how you would like images displayed. Alright. Um, so that's your warning if that's not your that's not your stuff. Uh lower focus, lower brightness. We're gonna go all in, but I will be censoring if I have to. Okay, well that's quite the start. Indeed. This is a lot louder than I thought it would be. Hold on. Uh, okay. 
Gonna adjust some volume stuff here and there. Okay. Three such creatures sit around the table in front of me, slurping filthy sludge from their cups as they trade whines, growls, and sounds I cannot describe. This, I'm not gonna lie, this just sounds like someone screaming into a very low quality mic. By listening carefully, I am able to grasp the gist of their conversation and respond when it is required of me. This is necessary to avoid arousing their suspicion. This looks like an AI generated image. Like if you put in like a meat classroom, it would generate something like this. However these creatures look, they are my friends, apparently. I wish I could still deny it, but I gave up on that a long time ago. Night after night, I went to sleep praying for an end to this nightmare, only to wake up each morning to the same twisted hellscape as the day before. I know now that I have to blend in, that I have to act like one of them, such has been my life these past three months, and so it will remain until the day I die. Dude, get a better mic. Judging by its tone, this one must be Koji. And the one next to him, squealing more than the others, is probably Omi. Oh yeah, did they tell you that? Which means that the one next to me is Yo. Though I can no longer see any trace of her once attractive features, I try my best to ignore the rotten stench of the excrement that issues from her quivering flesh. Uh-huh. I see. Intriguing. Everything has changed. Or almost everything. By some cool trick of fate, my relationship to the world alone remains the same, as if an insane architect took the blueprints of my life and rebuilt it out of blood and gore. These monsters and I were part of the same college club. We studied together, ate together, we even went skiing together every winter break. I like the shading on this. Now these are but painful memories of days that will never return. If only no one recognized me, I might have been able to disconnect myself from the world. It would have been comforting in comparison to believe that I had been abducted by aliens or that I had stumbled through a gateway to hell. But no, this is beyond, beyond a doubt the city where I was born and raised, the society I was a part of for 20 years, save that I and I alone can no longer see it that way. The world as I know it is gone. I have no place to call home. I forgot to mention this at the start, but I did download the 18 plus patch just so that I could have all of the material that was intended to be in here. I know for a fact I will have to censor stuff at some point, and I'm going to be honest with you guys, Edoge stuff doesn't really appeal to me at all. I don't really get anything out of it, but I'll sit, I'll sit through it through authentic authenticity and maybe we'll be able to find some some value in it, depending on how it goes. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off there. Oh, I did it again. Oh, what a shame. Anyway, I can tell that whatever they're discussing is of no importance to me. I decide to keep quiet while pretending to listen. But just then... Hey, Fuminori, one of the flesh beasts says as it swivels its bloodshot eyes toward me. What do you think? About what? I try desperately to suppress my loathing and behave normally, but my hoarse voice ruin ruins the attempt. Yeah. 
slimy hole near the top of the creature writhes nauseatingly as it vomits some semblance of words. That must be Koji's face, or what I would have seen uh, as such three m months ago. Unable to stomach the sight of it, I avert my eyes and give a neutral answer. Why is he? Why is he so much quieter than everything else? Is there like audio settings? Um, config menu. Voice volume go up, I guess. BGM down a little bit. As well as SFX, maybe. Okay. That sounds better. Those are my closest companions. One of them had even wished to be more. How many nights have I spent crying in loneliness, lamenting the friends who no longer exist? In three months, my tears ran dry, and now there is only loathing left in me. Surrounded by hideous creatures that I can only assume are Koji, Omi, and Yo, I spend each day trying to act as I always have. If I fail at this, I'll surely be sent back to the hospital. What does that mean? Only this time I'll be locked away forever. I'm getting the feeling that hospital means something different than, than we might assume. No matter what, I won't let that happen. I can't look at them or bear their screeching any longer. I jump to my feet, desperate to escape. I'm about to lose it. I want to grab a chair, a desk, anything in reach, and use it to smash the life out of this creature, ending it all. I barely suppress the impulse. I mustn't let on that something is wrong. However they look at me, this is their world. I'm the outsider here. Struggling to put on a smile, I reach into my wallet, pull out the first bill I find, and put it on the table without even looking at it. I don't care about the change. I just need to get out of here now. Flee to the cafeteria. I'm not crazy. It's not lost on me that this is an NVL mode, by the way, which I do appreciate. I do tend to prefer it to ADV mode as uh, hot a take I know that might be in, in some cases. Tsukuba Yo frowns at the suggestion. <laughs> Tono Koji supports Omi with a laugh. Her impromptu suggestions are nothing new, and it's Koji's role as her boyfriend to provide backup. They're a good match for each other, Yo thinks. Sometimes it makes her jealous. <laughs> ハタチになって初体験ってのは興味早々いないんじゃないかな子供の頃はなんとなく怖かったのよあの靴なんだか刃物みたいでさ。で、あれやってすべれたの海ちゃんすごくない夜量は好きとそう変わるもんじゃない
Your bad luck doesn't even begin to compare. Hmm. スケートはスケートリンクに行けばできるじゃない。わざわざスキー場に行ってまでやる？あ、good point. だから屋内じゃなくてさ、屋外スケート、コータ湖とかで滑れるところ。そんな都合のいいとこあるかな？Well, Although the conversation has only involved three people so far, there are in fact two couples at the cafeteria table. Yo's boyfriend, though there's still some doubt whether he could be called that, is beside her, as silent and expressionless as a statue. Oh, look at this guy. Perhaps Koji sensed Yo's pain in his usual quiet and considerate way. The cause of Yo's distress, Saki Saka Fuminori responds to Koji's sudden query with a vague mumbled question of his own. Make sure I got this right. Gotcha. Koji speaks gingerly as though probing a tumor a few months ago. He would not have hesitated to rebuke Fuminori and for all for his attitude. Their long acquaintance had forged a strong and honest friendship, but now it's no desire to be. Even Koji, Fuinoi's best friend, cannot communicate with him as before. What hope does Yo have of breaking through his shell? The scars left by the events of that late summer day are still deep these months all these months later. Each one what each one of them each one of the four bears them, not only Fuminori. Fuminori. Okay. I mean typically that's how it works. So these are just the lo um, can you see that? Oh no, okay. I just saw one of my friends go online and I had to check if that was showing on the screen. Um so these they are just saying the lines that they have said in the past in the future. So maybe it's not so much that the monsters are completely sentient as much as they are just repeating memories or something like that as though that answer drained the last of his patience fuminori bolts out of his chair Oi, even koji can't keep his voice from rising as he tries to stop fuminori from leaving fuminori reacts sif swiftly throwing his hand over his face as though to shield himself from something terrifying maybe some spit flew inadvertently from Koji's mouth, but that happens sometimes. Fuminori's reaction is beyond the pale. So is it that whatever injury this has prevented the meetening from happening to him, as I'm lovingly calling it? Even as he tosses money on the table to pay for his coffee, he acts like he's touching something filthy. Fuminori stalks out of the cafeteria, almost as if he's running away. Cloaked in heavy silence, the remaining three lower their gaze to the table, where the abandoned 10,000 yen bill sways forlornly. Fuminori's coffee is untouched. Losing your whole family like that. Alright, that's, that's something you can drop on us. It could have happened to anyone. A tractor trailer flipped over on the highway, crushing the Sakisaka family into twisted scrap. They said it had been difficult to tell the bodies of Fuminori's parents apart. For a while, it had looked as if there was no hope for Fuminori either. It was nothing short of a miracle that he was able to leave the hospital and return to a normal life. Fuminori 
ベッドに縛り付けられて今はよくあそこでそれにしたって変よ先坂くん私たちのこと見るねつきよせオミまあ、コジーズ kindness makes her happy. Yo also knows that she mustn't take advantage of it. Uminori is the victim, just as Koji said. He is the one who deserves, who most deserves sympathy. Yo's feelings for Fuminori are her problem, and no one else's. She doesn't blame Fuminori for not giving her an answer after she worked up the courage to ask him out. In fact, she she thinks even more fondly of him, uh, for taking the time to consider. Than she would have ha had he treated their relationship casually. I'm sorry, I'm dying. I read, uh, I had to read out a script for another video earlier. Um, so they're definitely setting something up where we had, uh, Fuminori from his perspective say that he isn't crazy, uh, when seeing all of this, all of when he's, when he's seeing the meat space. Um, but here we are getting the perspective that something is psychologically um, impairing him. There was s something that resulted from his injury that um, altered his brain in some way, whether it just be amnesia or something greater. I don't know if that's there's going to be like a supernatural element. I uh, I, I mean, I assume there's supernatural stuff going on, obviously, with the whole meat space, but I wonder how that's going to be worked into his injury and his psychology. Um, I don't know if we're going to be getting any sort of, like, delusions in here, if that's the, the route it wants to take. I'm not sure. I don't know anything about this visual novel, really. Apparently, the fact that Fuminori did not reject her was enough to make them a couple in Koji and Omi's eyes. They've had plenty of fun at Yo and Fuminori's expense since. The truth of it, though, is that he still hasn't given her an answer. After revealing her feelings to him, Yo didn't see Fuminori again until a week later, and then she could only stare at his broken body through the window of the ICU. When he was finally released, after 50 days that seemed an, e in that seemed an eternity, he was somehow different. She's starting to doubt that he even remembers what she confessed to him before the accident. So it was before the accident that she confessed. Um, and we know that he knows that she uh, wanted to be in a relationship with him. So perhaps that memory remains? Or maybe he's just uh, picked up on that from the conversations they've had since? Now winter is coming and her feelings hang forgotten in the cold, lonely air. You get the impression that he doesn't show his hands to his friends much, so they don't really know what he's thinking. Dr. Tanbo Dioko had has this is what? Dr. Tanbo Dioko has never had a more troublesome patient. <laughs> Yoko is a surgeon, not a psychiatrist, but even she can sense the thickness of the wall he has erected between himself and the world. That's what I was just talking about. Okay, so we have hallucinations just brought up here, which means the 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 gun has been set for, uh, on the table for someone to pick it up in Act 3 and shoot it. But we'll see. We'll see. It could also just be misdirection. Or it could just be simple dialogue, who knows. While Sakisaka appears to be looking at Yoko, his gaze is actually aimed a fraction down into the side. He's only superficially engaged in the conversation, when in truth it does not interest him in the slightest. Perfect rejection. I mean, I do that, but only because I can't maintain eye contact with very many people. Realizing that she can't interview him like this, Yoko sighs and set her chart aside. Experimental neurosurgery. Okay, here we go. Treatment of the subdural hematoma through the use of micro machines, a procedure available in Japan exclusively here at T University, 
had been the only way to save Sakisaka Fuminori from a cerebral con 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 what that should have been fatal. Sakisaka Fuminori's oh, excuse me, lips twist slightly in what might be a bitter or mocking smile, but it is gone before Ryoko can discern its meaning. Okay, so it's thoroughly established that this is going to be a theme. Hence these weekly checkups, if only he would have taken them a little more seriously. Is that uncommon knowledge? I didn't know the words. I didn't know some of the words earlier, but I knew that one. There was nothing, not the slightest hint of abnormal activity. For a procedure that had such a low rate of success, the results have been nothing short of miraculous. However, something still bothers Dioko. She can't shake the feeling that he's hiding something beneath his guarded exterior. Some terrible weight on his soul, perhaps. But if it's an inorganic problem, then there's nothing she can do as long as he refuses to explain it. I was just thinking about it, and if we are to take the delusion angle, the fact that the the meatified friends were just repeating stuff that they had said in the past could also play into the fact that it could just be in his brain because he's, he's heard them say that before. So, who knows, it's still a very early point. As before, the patient is inquiring about someone whom he has no business knowing. Doctor, have you learned anything about Dr. Ogai? <laughs> Yoko is used to patients treating her with hostility. Some degree of paranoia is natural when you're dealing with a person whose mistakes could kill you. In Sakisaka, however, she doesn't see the anxiety that other patients exhibit. His demeanor is perfectly calm, almost like a detective questioning a suspect. <laughs> Nyoko realizes that her answer may have been a little too quick. She should have acted more surprised. Point it to, you know, the, the doctor has gone missing. Mm. A relative, Dioko considers this with a frown. Oh, is he trying to extract information from her by just asserting facts for her to correct?
Yoko falls silent knowing that this isn't a topic she can brush away with a smile. Sakisaka seems to have finally grasped her mood, however, as his strangely stiff tone softens a little. Although she makes it sound like the most obvious thing in the world, the suggestion is actually a gamble. If Ogai Masahiko's disappearance becomes a police matter, then the university will be investigated. Everyone who is involved in the incident will be at risk of exposure. Interesting. He left the university. Okay. okay. So, th there's a girl who needs him. Okay, so he's a missing person. And she's saying... Okay, I get it. I get it now. But... Hmm... The incident. Was this the same incident as before? Oh, what's going on here? And of course, that includes Yoko herself. So she's got stuff to hide. She knows, however, that Sakisaka is unlikely to go to the police. First of all, his excuse is obviously a lie. They already made sure Ogai had no relatives who might come looking for him, which is why they could bury the truth of what happened. But then how did Sakisaka, a mere patient, learn about Ogai? She can finish. Sakisaka is gone. Back to the meat dimension. It looks like someone sprayed the walls with pig guts from ceiling to floor. What color should the walls of a hospital be? White, of course. And to the creatures of rotten flesh shambling around me, I'm sure this hospital looks just as white as it should. I know intellectually that the walls are white. I know that the flesh beasts are really human. I'm the one with the problem and it's because I've accepted this that I'm able to lead something approaching a normal life. Even if my university's medical department is nowhere near as good as T universities, I'm still a medical student specializing in neurology. I have a basic idea of what is happening to me, though it's hard to believe. So I'm guessing that this is from the perspective of a different character who, um, unlike Sakisaka, has acknowledged that this is a delusion, it's not real, and is trying to make something of their life knowing that, trying to work around the fact that there are all these delusions, and this is going, they're going to meet him, and there's going to be conflict around this, is what I believe. But I will be right back, I need to take a break. I'll see you guys in a second for you. Hello, I am back with a drink. So if you hear me drinking, I am sorry. I have my noise suppression and noise gate up, but I am far from an audio engineer. I basically know nothing about this shit, so sorry. This isn't a pathological condition, it's probably some form of agnosia unlike anything that has ever been studied before. That sounds familiar to me. Let me look that up. An inability to interpret sensations and hence to recognize things typically as a result of brain damage. Yeah. That makes sense to me. Okay. The flesh beast called Tanbo Dioko. Hold on. That is the nurse's name. At least Dioko is. I don't know about Tanbo. 
Uh, uh, almost there. That is her name. Okay. So it is her. Um, the flesh beast called Tanbo Ryoko said that other patients had developed neurological disorders after receiving the same treatment that I did. So I guess I'm just another failure. Makes me want to laugh in that know-it-all the doctor's face. Okay, so is this... So this is directly after the previous scene, and this is actually our protagonist. So I guess his mind uh, just changed about the fact that this is real. Later on, he got some information that uh, made him think so. That said, I don't blame the doctors who operated on me. After all, I do owe them my life. I know as well as anyone how low the chance of success was, and that I had no other hope of survival. This, this is 3D, what? I was unlucky, that's all there is to it. The point is that my condition isn't treatable. Just like someone adapting to a hearing aid or a wheelchair, I have no choice but to adapt to this nauseating scenery. Of course it's hard, it wasn't easy to resign myself to this fate. But now there's more than just despair. Even for me, there is a glimmer of hope. Keeping my eyes on my feet, I hurry home. So is it actually the same situation um, in the first scene as it is now? It hasn't like gotten worse or anything. He just kind of changed his mind about it being real or something like that. I live in a quiet suburban neighborhood in a house that's too much. That's too. That's much too large for me alone. My parents, even unluckier than I was, died in an accident three months ago. I couldn't even go to the funeral for being in intensive care. I had to sell my father's business, but at least that, but at least that left me with the house and enough money to live on for a while. Of course I'm sad, but the accident took more from me than my parents. In fact, being on my own has probably saved me. If they were still alive, my parents would never have allowed me to live with some strange girl. Is this the titular Saya? As I open the door, a bright voice greets me from the kitchen. The voice is beautiful and clear as a bell, human. Its sweet sound washes the day's cacophony from my memory. Yep. He didn't say her name in the actual uh, voice acting. Interesting. Even the patter, even the patter of feet coming from the hallway, is music to my ears. Nowhere else in the city can I hear such footsteps. Only in this house with Saya am I so privileged. Oh, sorry about that. Sorry, I'm just moving my window around. Okay. In her smile, in the inquisitive tilt of her head, is everything that I have lost. Since my accident, this girl is the only person I've met, perhaps the only person in the entire world, who does not trigger my cognitive disorder. True, her skin seems too white, and the color of her eyes and hair is probably different in reality, but even so, her form is undeniably human. And it's not just her appearance and her voice, either. You gotta like the hair, um, obviously designed to suggest, like, cat ears without actually being that or something. As I bend down to take off my shoes, Saya wraps her arms around my neck and pulls me gently into her tiny bosom. Her skin feels truly human, not cold or slimy, and her hair wafts a sweet feminine fragrance. Please don't get me into lolly shit. In all of the world, only Saya is pleasing to my five senses. And what's more, she smiles at me, embraces me. She knows that she is my salvation, and for some reason is happy that I need her. If I had not met Saya, if I had been all alone in this twisted, filth-ridden world, I would no doubt have succumbed to madness. 
It is no exaggeration to say that Saya alone is keeping me alive. Okay. He said, he said, all right, I'm looking forward to it. But, okay. But do some more work. What are you going to even do? After I see the humming Saya off to the kitchen, I step into the living room. I realized one day that if the natural colors of the world were sickening, all I had to do was paint over them with colors that seemed pleasant. That's interesting. That that's very interesting because it you would think that this sort of I guess disorder is painting over everything else with the meat stuff. It doesn't look like that. So you can't just like paint over the meat stuff. It would be painting on the real world that the meat stuff would be covering anyway. So wonder how that works. I went to the hardware store and bought every color of paint I could find, then Saya and I tried different combinations until we found one that worked. After painting the bedroom from ceiling to floor, I was a finally able to get my first good night's sleep since the accident. When we first started on the living room, Saya, unsure what to do with the curtains, just painted carefully around the windows. Without a moment's hesitation, I tore the curtains down and painted over the glass itself. There will never be anything out there I'd want to see, and as long as we keep the storm shutters closed, the neighbors probably won't think anything of it. As she enters the living room with a tray of food, Saya sniffs the air. Now that she mentions it, I suppose the smell of paint thinner must be building up in this closed room. It doesn't really bother me, though. There are far worse smells outside. Okay, but are you going to consider what the girl who's living in your house thinks about it? Oh, okay. Okay, it's immediately addressed. Saya sets the food on the table. Unfortunately, neither its color nor its smell is at all appetizing. Not that food, any, not that food elsewhere is any different. As has become routine, I steal myself and methodically transport the food into my mouth. I like that sort of play on the wording. Um, how it's just like um, a task that has to be completed rather than something that uh, he enjoys or anything like that. The taste is, gut is as gut-wrenching as I expected, but it's not Saya's fault. I'm sure she made it exactly like the cooking show said. It's just that my taste buds can't accept it. <laughs> Lying won't make Saya happy. She knows about my condition. In the t all the time we've been together, Saya has never once eaten with me. I don't know why she refuses to do so. It makes me a little sad. Still, I'm not about to push the issue, not when she's putting up all, with all the problems I have. I don't know why this is just a random shot in the dark, but the first thing that I thought of is maybe the maybe Nah, this this that's not true. I was gonna say maybe the world is a meat world just around where he is just in proximity to him. So the food becomes meat, uh when it, I guess it could already be meat, but it becomes this human meat or whatever when um, close to him, but I don't think that's true. Papa no? 
Okay. Dr. Ogai Masahiko is Saya's father and her only living relative. Saya has asked me to unravel the mystery of his disappearance. I expected Saya to be a, a little more disappointed. I thank you for my meal and set my chopsticks down next to the perfectly clean plate. As wretched as the taste was, thinking of the care that Saya put into it gave me the strength to finish every bite. Ever since Saya moved in, it's been like having my own wife. Uh, how old is she? Saya, why are you so good to me? Oh, here we go. Okay, so there was an H scene that I had to skip there. I don't think there was really anything that important that you guys really needed to see there. Um, we got a tidbit that Saya feels, um, I guess, equally as alone as Fuminori does and uh, sort of sees him as the only, like, thing in her world, which, um, I'm not sure how you feel about this. I don't know how old this girl is and she doesn't seem to be an adult which is very worrying to me um even if canonically she is i i don't i feel like we're uh, appealing to some lolly shit here uh not about that but whatever i guess i'll look past it doesn't even really feel like that scene happened it just sort of comes out of nowhere and doesn't add much Anyway, Yo is determined to talk to him today. Nothing will happen as long as she hesitates. It will only prolong her suffering. The time has come to show courage once again. Yo's fourth period on Thursdays is biology. This is her one chance to see Fuminori. As a required course with many students, the lecture is held in a large hall that can seat well over 200. Excuse me. But since the room is usually only half full, it's rarely difficult to it's rare it, it is rarely difficult for Yo to find the seat she wants. Yo prefers to sit near the center where it is easiest to hear the pr professor. Most of the students congregate in this area for the same reason. Fuminori usually sits beside her, although given the ambiguous state of their relationship, she knows better than to take this for granted. Still, she tries to save a seat whenever possible. The classroom isn't crowded today, so Yo is able to set her bag on the seat next to her without inconveniencing anyone. But when the professor arrives at the usual time to start class, there is still no sign of Fuminori. After waiting for about 10 minutes, Yost scans the room furtively. Fuminori is there, sitting alone in the far back corner. Did he miss Yo when he came in? No, he couldn't have, and besides, no serious student would willingly sit so far away from the front. Yelling miserable, Yo slides her ba bag back over to herself. Fuminori is out the door the moment class ends. Yo barely manages to catch up to him before he disappears down the hallway. Hmm. Fuminori jer jerks at the sound of his name. You would think she just screamed at him. Nanika. Now that they are face to face, Yo is painfully aware of how much weight Fuminori has lost. His sunken eyes and protruding cheekbones are a far cry from the features familiar, familiar to her. She wonders if he's under a lot of stress or perhaps not getting enough nutrition. Maybe it's both. He definitely looks more tense than he should, afraid, even, 
though of what she though of what she can't imagine. His eyes move restlessly from point to point, and he refuses to look Yo in the eye. It hurts to see Fuminori this way. What could have changed him so? Today, she reminds herself, rekindling the flame of courage in her heart. Don't you remember? Yo almost blurts out the question, but manages to keep her composure. I do appreciate the amount of CGs we've been getting so far. He smiles like it's nothing, even though it seems forced. He's even standing precisely one pace farther away from her than he used to. Yo managed to keep from flinching at the harshness of his tone. Rather than answer, Fuminori grinds his toe into the dead grass at his feet, fearing that her determination might flag. Yo lets the words come as they may. Yo can no longer stop the words pouring from her lips. She fears that if she does not unleash her feelings now, they will be lost forever. Higurashi moment. We're having a Higurashi moment right here. The look in his eyes is not anger or any other warm-blooded emotion. It is hate. Murderously called hate. He remembers, he remembers, and still, he has to treat her so coldly. That is all the answer she needs. If his words stab any deeper, she might very well die. Don't cry, Yo tells herself. But too late to stop the tears pouring from her eyes. We do go the same school. Good grammar. That's all Yo can take. Even after shedding tears in front of him, she absolutely refuses to let him hear her cry. Any disgrace would be preferable to breaking down here. So she runs, fleeing breathlessly from the courtyard with Fuminori's cold smile at her back. Omi was the first to catch sight of Yo and Fuminori leaving for the courtyard. Reluctant to interrupt him, but still unwilling to leave them alone, she and Koji ended up watching the whole thing from the shadows. 
Throughout the exchange, Omi was clearly itching to jump out and punch Fuminori in the face. Knowing her temper, Koji kept firm hold of her arm until the end. If he hadn't, she might very well have done it. Fuminori leaves after Yo, his every step seeming to take an act of willpower. Koji sighs hev heavily into the once more empty courtyard, but the bitter taste in his mouth will not go away. Even Koji cannot forgive Fuminori's treatment of Yo. However, the first thing that he feels is confusion, not anger. I like how his sprite is really, really trying his best to fit vertically onto the screen. Koji has known Fuminori since long before college. Fuminori was never this cruel before. There was no question now that the accident changed him. ねえ、コージ。このまま放っておきたくないにしたって。のぞ君より<笑> Yo and Omi are best friends just like Koji and Fuminori. In fact, it was the re relationship between Koji and Omi that brought the other two together. Omi's anger is only natural. さきさかくんと Ending the conversation before Omi's mood gets any worse, Koji heads off to find Yo. Here we are, back in Half-Life. I've, I've never even played that, by the way. I feel awful, miserable, but also refreshed. I finally crossed the line. I knew it would come crashing down like this sooner or later. Having, beca having become unable to feel anything but disgust for other people, there was no way I could hope to maintain the relationships I'd had before the accident. Today's incident will definitely get back to Koji and Omi, and everyone will be convinced I have had a, mag a major change of character. Honestly, I don't care anymore. At least I probably won't be committed for this. I just need to avoid act acting any stranger than I already have. If this puts a rift between me and the others, good. The thought of all the stress I'll avoid brings a smile to my lips. I'm fed up with them sticking their noses into my life. It's like... Excuse me? It's like they don't care that they make my gut turn just by being near me. I've been terrified of them until now, but today I struck fear into one of them. In that sense, it's something of a relief. But I'm not entirely without remorse for what happened. The person I just demolished with, verbal, with the verbal equivalent of a nuclear bomb used to be my friend Yo. Even if my senses don't believe it, my mind accepts the theory. I don't have any particular grudge against Yo herself, I just don't want to- and I didn't want to hurt her. In retrospect, perhaps I should have just ignored her outright. Yo was an attractive girl. I certainly didn't think badly of her. To be honest, though, I was annoyed when Koji and Omi tried to stick us together. It felt like they were using us as entertainment, and Yo seemed totally oblivious to the fact that she was dancing to their tune. Her cluelessness was irritating. Hello, sorry about that break. Still, I knew that none of them meant any harm. Back then, I didn't have any reason to hurt others, just... What? Didn't hurt others just to get my way. If a, having a casual relationship with Yo would keep our circle of friends together, I was willing to make that compromise. Now, however, there is no room in my heart for such a forbearance. For such forbearance. If merely talking to someone is an ordeal, then how can I be expected to show them kindness? These ruminations have left me exhausted. I want to return to Saya as soon as possible, but thinking about the packed trains and crowded downtown streets between here and home saps my spirit. Catching sight of a nearby bench, I sit down and close my eyes to the horrors of the world. I can't do anything about the stink or the noise, but at least I can calm my, ner calm my nerves enough to rest.
When I regained consciousness in the T University Hospital Ward, the world was as dark as it is now. I had not yet recovered my sight, even though my eyes and optical nerves were undamaged. It must have been an after-effect of the accident. Blindness was a shock, but now I know that my suffering then was nothing. After all, my senses of hearing, touch, taste, and smell were all fine at the time. The real horror began when my sight returned. The one small mercy was that I was able to come to terms with the accident and my neurosurgery while still blind. I panicked when I first saw the nightmarish hospital and the blood-curdling shapes of the doctors and nurses, but I soon guessed the cause. It chills me to think of what might have happened if I had recovered my sight along with my consciousness. Suddenly awakening in what can only be described as hell, I would have no doubt... I would no doubt have lost my mind instantly. Soon my disorder spread to the senses of touch, taste, and smell. As it turns out, sight exerts tremendous influence over the other four. That that's actually true, and it's not just with sight either. A lot of um a lot of senses do have an effect on other senses. For example, smell and taste are like intrinsically linked if you can't smell for example your ability to taste will be greatly hampered it's not as uh separated as we like to think the taste of my food the feel of my blood sheets the fragrance of my get well flowers all became unbearably foul as my eyes said they should be eventually when even the doctor's voices became unrecognizable as human I decided to kill myself. I didn't believe for a second that I could live in this new world. At least, not until I met Saya. One night, while thinking of a painless way to die, I found myself succumbing to sleep. Drifting between the nightmares of my dreams and the nightmare of reality, I didn't notice her enter my room. The next thing I knew, there was a face staring down at me from, the, from next to my bed. The face was not covered in pus or slime or earth-like feelers. It had smooth white cheeks, round eyes, a lovely little nose, all things I had never expected to see again. The face was that of a girl, undeniably human and positively glowing with beauty. I sighed in admiration, savoring the first peace and joy since regaining my sight. She had not expected such a reaction, apparently. Looking at the clock, I saw it was exactly three in the morning. No time for a young girl to be alone in the hospital. Perhaps she expected me to mistake her for a ghost. But I would not have cared if she had been a ghost. Either way, she was a godsend. <laughs> I assumed that she was the daughter of a late shift doctor or another patient. It was unusual, but not unthinkable for such a girl to be wandering around the hospital. No longer concerned with propriety, I let the words come as they willed. Ever so carefully, as though catching snowflakes, I paced, placed my palm up against hers. I could feel her human warmth and the softness of her delicate fingers. She was there, just beyond the palm of my hand. Thinking back on the joyful tears I shed then, I know that this is the moment I have s I was saved from my fate. Huh? <laughs> Shikina 
大丈夫よ夜は私のものだから So our rendezvous began Saya came to my room every night at 3am skillfully taking advantage of the duty nurse's shift change I was astonished to learn that she was living inside the hospital she had been living in the suburbs with her father, she told me, until one day he'd suddenly stopped coming home. After she had tired of waiting, Saya had decided one night to sneak into the hospital where he'd work. And there she lived over two months, searching for his whereabouts all the while. <laughs> She was a strange girl. On one hand, she looked and acted like a child. On the other, she was remarkably self-reliant and, at times, exhibited a sharp intelligence and deep knowledge that many may have found unsettling. Hmm. This is someone's fantasy. I didn't care. Saya was the only other human in the world in a world gone mad. Her existence meant far more to me than the standards of society. Excuse me? So it's a little bit fucked up, actually. It's actually pretty damn fucked up. Her confession reminded me that the hospital was famous for its ghost stories. Who could have imagined that there was actually a real girl amplishly roaming these hallways? While her pranks were hardly praiseworthy, I couldn't bring myself to scold her for the very thing that had brought us together. By the way, I almost cut off this line right here. Yeah, sorry, are you mad? Because, I mean, but I didn't because I was wondering if she was like insulting his mental health based on what we had heard before or whether she meant angry. Um, so I was listening to the line and she did. It was it was angry is what she was she was like, are you angry? Okay. So you kind of just abducted a child? With extreme care, I was able to conceal my sensory disorder. It was glaringly obvious that the doctors had no way to cure me, and the fact that I had undergone a still experimental procedure made me even more cautious. As a medical student, it was easy for me to imagine how the doctors would react if they discovered I was exhibiting such unusual side effects. I was not about to become a guinea pig, a mere specimen to be examined with clinical detachment. You know there are laws against that, dude. Um... I don't know, I don't know about Japan, or whenever this story takes place, so maybe I'm wrong about that, but... And so I hid my discomfort and loathing behind a mask of normalcy, convincing the doctors that any signs of stress were merely a result of hospitalization. Saya was my support, looking forward to her nightly visits gave me the strength to endure my daily torture. Hope can make an enormous difference in a patient's progress. With the aid of my secret nurse, I recovered at a pace that left the doctors stunned. On the last night before my release, I summoned the courage and asked her. Did he not already ask that? Did I miss it? Did I... Was it this? Okay. I'm sorry, I'm tired. But I was still right. He did basically just abduct a child. 
部屋はいくらでも余ってる人目を忍ぶような必要もないし住み心地もそんなにずっと文みのりと一緒に暮らすの君の父さんのことは代わりに僕が探してあげる約束するよ難しいと思うよ多分パパ何か悪いことをしてこの病院をやめたんだと思うだから警察とかは困るの頑張るよどんなことださやと離れたくないんだ少しだけ考えさせて。The day of my release, I managed to smile as I accepted the hideous, foul smelling cel celebratory bouquet. The flesh beasts, calling themselves Goji, Omi, and Yo, came to pick me up. Though they had come to see me many times before my many times during my stay, it never got easier to see my friends change so horribly. My sudden tears of despair drew suspicion, but I managed to explain them away as tears of joy. While we walked, Walked to Koji's car. I looked desperately for Saya amid the grotesque scenery. Even as we drove away, I could keep. I kept watching the hospital fade into the distance, praying for a last glimmer of hope. But Saya never appeared. After Koji and the others dropped me off, I paused a while to regard my surroundings. I had lived my entire life on this block in this house. There was no other place I could call home, but nothing was as I remembered. As I walked up to, the, to as I walked up the path to the front door, I took and took in the yard where I had spent my childhood. I could feel those memories being defiled by the twisted, festering shapes around me. Inside the house, I found nothing familiar, nothing to offer me comfort and warmth. What I had once called home was now a whole other world. There's one last stop to make, one last nail and the hammer into my coffin. I stepped into the room that had cradled me from childhood. The walls were prepared with human entrails. The bed, a tangled mess, mass of warm flesh. But none of that mattered. There, curled up on the bed like an abandoned cat, was Saya. As I stood there in shock, she looked up at me and in a tiny, weak voice said, I responded by sweeping her into my arms, embracing her tightly so she, that she wouldn't, so that she would not escape. Saya did not resist. When she arrived, at, arrives at the Sakisaka house, Omi first takes a deep breath to calm herself. Her anger does not vanish entirely, of course, but at least now she can hear herself think. While waiting for a response from the intercom, she looks over the patch of yard that she can see from outside the gate. Even Omi isn't normally one to complain about other people's housekeeping, but this is going too far. The grass is growing wild, and there are piles of dead leaves scattered everywhere. It doesn't just look un t untended, it looks like an uninhabited ruin. It's still light. It's still light out, but every window has its storm shutters tightly sealed. Omi guesses they've been closed since morning. What kind of life is Fuminori leading? Even if he's alone, he can't neglect his housework forever. And is it just her imagination, or does something stink like rotten meat? It could be coming from the yard, could it? There's still no response, so she presses the buzzer a second time, and a third and a fourth. Finally, after this had gone over... Gone for over 10 minutes, Omi loses her patience and opens the cover of the intercom. So what was that about? Rotten meat. It's interesting. Is maybe Saya doing something to take advantage of, um, of Fuminori's uh, condition. Like I imagine if she just hypothetically was killing people and storing their body bodies or like uh body parts in the house he wouldn't be able to recognize it from the rest of the world so and 
by doing that, she basically has a haven for these crimes. That's just an idea, anyway. As she suspected, the power has been disconnected. Perhaps Fuminori has a good reason for shutting out the world, but Omi can only see it as a lack of respect for others. Her anger has re her anger rekindled. And she pushes her anger rekindled. She pushes the gate open and stops through the yard to the front door. Given the state of his intercom, she doubts that Fuminori will, will respond to a knock, so Omi decides to just open the door and go in shouting. And if the door is locked, she'll just have to. Surprisingly, the doorknob turns easily in her hand, and the enraged Omi finds herself throwing the door open wider than she intended. Her nostrils are instantly assaulted by a choking stench. Eh? Omi can't believe her ears. The voice she just heard could not have been human, and its intonations were too complex for any animal she can imagine. Okay, so maybe Saya is actually a flesh beast, and in that case, if somehow that means uh, Fuminori just sees her as a normal human, is that what? Okay. She hears the sound of something soft and wet flapping its way deeper into the house. Finding it difficult to find a meaningful image to the voice she just heard, Omi stares blankly at the empty vestibule. There's nothing there, not even Fuminori's shoes, which can only mean that he's still outside somewhere wearing them. The house should be empty. What was that voice just now? Her anger has vanished as if it was never there. Nonetheless, Omi sets foot into the hallway, leaving the door open so the cowbell won't ring. The floor creaks, setting her nerves on edge. Omi isn't sure why she's acting like a burglar, but something tells her to make as little noise as possible. The, potent the potency of the stink inside the house makes the whiff she caught outside pale in comparison. It's sickening, like rotten flesh guts. But rotten fish guts. Has food been left to spoil in the kitchen? She hears a bubbling sound ahead. Stepping gingerly on the creaking floorboards, Omi makes her way to the end of the hallway. She finds rooms to both sides of her, one lit, the other dark, and chooses to look into the lit room. It's the kitchen, lit by what must be the only window in the house not covered by a storm shutter. Apologies? It's the kitchen, lit by what must be the only window in the house not covered by a storm shutter. The sound she heard was the pot boiling on the stove, and on the chopping board next to it lay a butcher's knife and some half-diced carrots. A perfectly normal household scene, with the light of the setting sun making everything the color of decomposing fruit. Excuse me? Something is wrong. What? Who's, who's cooking here, and where did they go? Suddenly, she feels cold seeping through her pantyhose. Her fingertips come away covered with a vicious, a viscous olive green slime, like the filthy water from a tank uh, long clogged with algae and dead fish. The whole floor is covered with it. it must be the source of the stench. Omi now wishes that she had worn her shoes inside, manners be damned. When she looks back ruefully the way she came, she realizes that her current position is not visible from the entrance. This kitchen must be where that strange voice came from. The next room is probably the den. As she expected from the closed, the closed storm shutters, it's pitch black inside. Ami wants nothing more than to flee this house, but that would mean turning her back to the darkness, and that she can simply cannot bring herself to do. Moved by some irrational compulsion, Omi sets foot into the den. It's too dark to see anything, and the stink is far worse than before. She slides her hand along the wall, feeling for the light switch. Finding it much sooner than she expected, she flips it on like it's her last hope. The colors... 
the colors, so many colors. The purple of entrails, for the brown of rotten meat, the crimson of flesh, fresh blood, the yellow of rat. These colors and more that cannot be described covered every inch of the room in a maddening array. The colors say all that needs to be said about the painter is hatred, malice, and insanity. <laughs> Ummy's legs give out from the shock, sending her to the floor. Slime immediately soaks through her jeans, its cold tendrils creeping up her legs, crotch, and her neck. Her hand flies to her neck, where it is greeted by another drop of chilly slime. Above her, something is dripping onto her head. Making perhaps the worst decision of her life, Omi looks up. The predator clinging to the ceiling, poised to leap, up, leap upon its prey. She sees it in every detail. Her mouth and nose are sealed forever before she can scream, and her belly is torn open as something enters to feast on her innards. But by the time she feels any of this, Omi has already gone mad. I bit the bullet and tried to take the train, but the rush hour crowds were so bad that I had to get off halfway and walk. I'm running pretty late. Is Saya worried? I hope she's not mad. When I enter the yard, I realize the front door has been left wide open. Light from the living room is seeping out into the hallway. And I hear what sounds like someone smacking their lips. There's also a tantalizing fragrance in the air. Is it Saya? I consider calling out to her, but decide to enter in silence instead. Something smells strange, though not unpleasant. The aroma is quite soothing, in fact. It reminds me of Saya's hair. At first, I am surprised by what I see in the living room. The floor is what is covered with what looks to be some kind of grass, probably the source of a herb-like smell. And there are fruit or vegetable-like balls of varying size scattered everywhere. Saya. <laughs> Saya turns around, her eyes wide with surprise. She then looks away sheepishly, like a child caught at some prank. Remembering that she's never eaten in front of me before, I realize that she must be quite embarrassed. Scoop up the closest fruit thing and pop it into my mouth, ignoring Saya's attempt to wave me off. It has a strange texture, soft and pliable like peach or a pear. When I bite, it, bite into it with my back teeth, a succulent juice fills my mouth combined with a sharp, strong fa fragrance. It's unlike anything I've ever tasted. I pick up a different lump, this one consisting of fruity flesh around a hard core. Taking a chunk off in my mouth, I find it has a similar taste to the last one. Yeah, even I can eat this. In fact, it's good. At first, Saya looks dumbstruck, but then she bursts out laughing. There's an impressive nature preserve not too far from here. I've never heard about fruits like these growing there, but, well, of course, they only look like fruits to me. They're really something else. Saya seems really happy. I'm happy too, of course. Eating with someone is much more fun than eating alone, and it makes the food taste better too. Seeing the small fruits and Tupperware and large ones in pots and bowls, Saya and I store the remaining food in the refrigerator. Thinking of tomorrow's dinner fills me with anticipation. I feel that little by little I'm starting to regain the joy of living. Saya will guide me. With her, I can live on. Yeah, sounds cool, bro.
What? Drew Scary Stories Hospital Edition? I'll have to get to this later. Um, I am actually going to stop the recording session now. Um, shouldn't be much of a hiccup for you because I imagine I am putting all of these together into one long super video. So, um, I guess I'll see you in a moment. Hello, everybody. It has been a week since the last time that I recorded this which tells you a lot about my current availability when it comes to making videos. But we're just going to get right back into it because it has been about two seconds for you. And I wouldn't want to delay you from the story any longer. True Scary Stories, Hospital Edition. Chapter 4, The Monster in the Hospital. A medical student relates his shocking experiences. Will you believe him or not? Strange things started happening at the hospital around the end of last spring. It began with patients waking up in the middle of the night, screaming. They all spoke of terrifying nightmares, and many of them had to be sedated. Some patients even transferred to other hospitals because of it. By the way, I don't know if I mentioned it, but I've turned down my audio turned up the game audio because i realized the disparity between those two things was a little bit great um the last time i recorded uh and also i am uh washing clothes in the background and i hope you can't hear that but if you can i'm sorry there's a very limited time window i have to record today the weird thing was that they'd all had exactly uh, exactly the same dream a dream about a horribly disgusting monster staring at them from their bedside. But the really strange stuff started happening after that. There used to be a lot of stray cats around campus looking for scraps from the students. I'm sorry, this is actually... This game is very loud for me right now, so I'm going to turn that down. I hope that didn't affect the volume on your guys' end. Um, but one day the cats suddenly disappeared and it wasn't that they'd stopped coming it was more like they'd vanished from the area entirely and then people stopped walking their dogs around according to the rumors the dogs were refusing to go anywhere near the school I've had that before where I'm walking my dog and um, I'm trying to go somewhere and she just stops like she'll just sit on her butt and won't move and I've and it's like hard to understand why exactly because every time she's done that there hasn't been a noticeable reason like a reason that I could deduce but I don't know maybe they know more than we do eventually things started going missing at the hospital organs to be precise okay transplant organs kept disappearing from the storage people came close to losing their jobs over it and it wasn't just two or three times that it happened. They tried to keep it from the students, but we'd heard it was a lot worse than that. People started saying that there was something living in the hospital. The janitors would find strange messes that could only have been made in the middle of the night, traces of something that had crawled down the hallway or weird stains caused by something dripping through the ceiling. The late shift nurses talked about hearing strange noises on the same nights that patients woke screaming. There's one last story, which one that you never mention inside the hospital. One day, the obstetrix department went crazy. They said that a newborn had disappeared in the night. If that were true, the police would have come and it would have been all over the news. But they say the big shots managed to make it all go away. It's just a rumor, of course. This looks like Phi from Zero Escape, doesn't it? These strange incidents suddenly stopped toward the end of summer. Now there are almost no patients complaining of nightmares and the cats have started coming back to campus. Still, what happened at the hospital in the summer, even now just thinking about it, gives me the creeps. So obviously it's supposed to be Saya terrorizing the mental patients. <sighs> it's the third day in a row they haven't been able to get in touch with Omi. Um, 
Yeah, you might have a little bit of trouble with that. There's no sign she returned to her apartment, and even her family doesn't know anything. Her parents have already filed the missing persons report. <laughs> Yo hasn't seen Fuminori since then, and Fuminori hasn't made any effort to approach her or Koji. Four people used to be in this cafeteria between classes, but now there were only two. It's a lie, of course. Koji knows where Fuminori... No. Koji knows where Omi planned to go that evening, but he doesn't want to bring Fuminori up in front of Yo. Planned to go? I don't know if I said plans. Their awkward silence is mercifully broken by the bell signaling the start of the next period. <laughs> Unless Koji is mistaken, Yo is supposed to have class next period too. But she just sits there staring off into space. I keep pressing space. Unable to come up with anything, he leaves the cafeteria reluctantly. Both Omi's disappearance and Yo's depression worry Koji, and both problems lead back to the same place. When Omi went missing, the first thing he did was question Fuminori. After all, the last time he'd seen her was just before she stormed off to give Fuminori a piece of her mind. Fuminori responded with, an, with unequivocal denial, and acted like he hadn't the slightest idea of why Omi would have gone to see him. Perhaps that was only natural, as he was a... Unaware that Omi and Koji had witnessed him reduce Yo to tears. Did Omi even make it to Fuminori's house? She had been riding a wave of emotion when she left, and might have calmed down and changed her mind halfway there. Perhaps she ran into trouble along the way? Koji concluded, or more accurately, convinced himself, that one of these possibilities was the truth, subconsciously denying the other remaining possibility. That Fuminori was lying, that he hadn't met Omi, and was involved with her disappearance. Okay. So he doesn't want to believe that Fuminori is involved with the disappearance. When questioned by the police, Koji told the truth about Omi's destination only up to the train station, maintaining that he had no idea where she'd planned to go after that. He wanted to cooperate with the search, of course, but Omi couldn't have made it to Fuminori's house. Fuminori said himself, didn't he? In that case, he told the police everything they needed to know. Not wanting to get the still fragile Fuminori involved, he forced himself to accept this flimsy logic. But the conflict has built up inside of him without his notice, leaving an, an, leaving unanswered suspicion to fester in his mind. Koji is deep in thought, paying no attention to his surroundings, but perhaps that is what allows him to catch sight of his friends back through the crowd of milling students. Fuminori. At first, Koji assumes he's headed to the lecture hall, but it soon appears that he is instead going home. Strange, medical students have required courses in the afternoon. Though he's initially surprised, Koji's hesitation lasts only a second. He follows his friend, taking care to stay far enough behind that he wouldn't, won't be noticed. Fuminori wasn't going home, as, as became obvious when he boarded a train heading in the opposite direction. Koji's next guess was that he was going to see his doctor at the T University Hospital, but Fuminori rode straight through the closet state the closest oh, station. Doctor. The stranger it gets, the closer Koji feels to discovering the truth behind Fuminori's sudden transformation. Any knowledge would be welcome, no matter how slight. Even Koji is beginning to think that there must be 
more behind Fuminori's change than the accident alone. He wants a more satisfying answer, one that will help him decide whether Fuminori can be trusted. Fuminori gets off at a small station in a nondescript suburb of Tokyo. Toji follows, trying not to lose sight of him amid the other disembarking passengers. The area is quite desolate, with only a small bookstore, a convenience store, and a market in front of the train station. It is easy for Koji to keep Fuminori in view. This neighborhood was carved out of Fuji foothills, and here and there remain st steep inclines and wood wooden areas, wooded areas that escape assimilation. Koji is amazed that such quiet place exists less than an hour out of central Tokyo. Fuminori seems to know these streets. He moves quickly and purposefully through the suburban community, his eyes fixed straight ahead. Before long, Fuminori reaches a house. Without ringing the bell or even knocking, he opens the door and vanishes inside, leaving Koji to wonder how Fuminori can treat the house as his own. After waiting to see if Fuminori comes back out, Koji approaches the gate and checks the nameplate. Ogai, it reads. Koji has never heard of anyone by that name among Fuminori's acquaintances. Next, his attention is drawn to the thick wad of leaf that's sticking out of the mail slot. This, coupled with the general dilapidated feel of the place, suggests that it has been abandoned for some time. A small playground about two blocks away provides an adequate vantage point from which to watch the front of Ogai home. Fortunately, it does not appear to be the sort of house that has a rear exit. Koji settles down on a bench and begins to stake out. I should have brought more smokes. One hour passes, and then another, but no sign of movement around the Ogai residence. Soon twilight settles upon the neighborhood. He kills time by redialing Omi on his cell and sending her short text messages but his efforts are futile, as he knew they would be. When the, sky when the sky begins to turn a deep blue and the sunlights come on. Streetlights come on. Sunlights. I'm sorry. We know that finally emerges from this house and heads back toward the station with the same hurried stride. After some brief consideration, Koji decides that right now investigating the house is more important than tailing Fuminori. He rings the doorbell just to make sure. After receiving the expected silence in response, he checks to make sure no one is watching and turns the doorknob. The door is not locked. The moment he enters the house, stale air thick with mold and dust fills Koji's nostrils. There is a faint hint of something else in the air, something reminiscent of damp sewers and fetid cisterns. Flipping the light switch does nothing. The power must be cut off. Koji uses a cigarette lighter to illuminate the immediate area. In the thick dust covering the floor, he notices several brand new trails of footprints that could have only been made by shoes. Koji decides to follow suit and dispense with courtesy. He enters with his shoes on. Hey, you're already one step ahead of the other girl. Pardon me. The lighter's flickering flame pushes back the deathly silence and gloom of the house. Koji is surprised to see evidence of life remaining. Everything from furniture to tableware and appliances, nothing seems to be missing. The thickness of the dust suggests that the house has been empty for several months, meaning which means that the owner must have must have left with little more than clothes on his back. Could he have gone on a long vacation? The calendar in the den is still turned to April, empty and silent, yet still exhibiting signs of life that once lived there, the house reminds Koji of a passenger ship entombed at the bottom of the sea. In the graveyard-like quiet, a sinister thought suddenly enters his mind. No one is living here, but that does not mean that the owner left. Maybe he was murdered and his rotting corpse is right under Koji's feet.
he finds himself wanting a stronger light. A flashlight in his hand would make him feel much better. Yoji follows Fuminori's footsteps to the second floor, where he begins to catch the scent of paper in the stale air. It's the smell of old books, instantly recognizable to anyone who has worked in an antique bookstore or library. first room on the second floor turns out to be a study, its towering shelves packed with such a vast number of books that Koji feels for the stability of the floor. As a medical student himself, he is able to discern at a glance that the study belongs to a medical professional, and a high-level one at that. Judging by the content of the books, a smorgasbord of technical volumes far beyond the simple student's understanding, the, in the owner's interests lie more with medical research than with clinical practice. Fuminori must have spent most of his time here. The scattered dust suggests he was searching for something, and the contents of the desk drawers are in obvious disarray. A small pile of books stacked on the side table catches his eye. Being next to the desks, they must have been more the most frequently read. Their nature could shed light on the character of the person who worked here. Koji frowns as he examines the three books. These aren't scientific texts like the rest, but old leather-bound rest leather-bound rest western tomes like the sort you would find in a rare bookstore. Whatever they are, they clearly have nothing to do with medicine, refuting Koji's earlier guess that Ogai was a doctor. Looking down, Koji suddenly notices the glint of something black and metallic underneath the chair. A pocket-sized flashlight, quite out of place among all these dusty books. Fuminori must have brought it in. With relief, Koji exchanges his lighter for the flashlight. Its tiny body emits a powerful white beam that casts away the darkness. His courage restored, he decides to explore the rest of the house. Hmm? Koji notices something strange, something that was not visible in the lighter's weak flame. The slime. It's just like in Goosebumps! Dark, oily stains are everywhere. The stains are especially thick around the doorknobs and stair, st stair banisters, like someone grasped them with hands wrapped in a greasy cloth. Looking closer, he sees places where the, lime splash, where the slime splash low on the walls, almost as if a mop was run violently across the floor. Could Ogai have made these marks? If so, how? Koji begins to feel sick as he imagines a man shambling through the house with slime dripping from his body. Listen, some people really gotta take a shower. Must have been a gamer. Finding the bedroom next to the study, Koji checks the closet on, on a hunch. He discovers two empty suitcases. Not, one, not what one would leave behind when going on a long vacation. A sudden chill runs through him. Whoever was living he here is still somewhere in the house. Hmm? Not, I mean, not necessarily. Suppressing the urge to flee, Goji goes back downstairs to check the first floor. If you find it's a corpse, he'll have to call the police right away. He might get away with trespassing if he reports it at first, but if they find the body later, it'll be awfully hard to explain his fingerprints all over the house. The flashlight reveals the den to be covered in even more slime than the rest of the house. The sofa looks as though it was dredged from the bottom of a swamp. In the kitchen, Koji takes one look at the sink and decides not to get any closer. He doesn't want any more fuel for his imagination. He reaches the door to the bathroom. A common scene from TV dramas flashes through his head. A body with slit wrists floating in a bathtub full of water. There wasn't a movie where a hitman disposes of his... Wasn't there a movie where a hitman disposes of his victim in a bathtub filled with lye? Opens the door slowly, then shines his light into the ceramic bathtub that appears from the darkness like a white ghost. 
bones, a mountain of bones, black with dry flesh and blood. Goji puts his hand against the wall to steady himself as his legs threaten to buckle. Something is wrong, he realizes as he tr desperately tries to get his thoughts in order. The bones are too small and there are too many of them. They aren't human. After taking several deep breaths to calm himself, Koji enters the bathroom and examines the tub. The bones are piled atop each other like fallen leaves. They appear to be from small animals, perhaps cats or dogs. Even so, the quantity is mind-boggling. How many bodies would it take to produce this many bones? The bones have been separated from one another, so it doesn't look like bodies were thrown in the bathtub and left to rot. Each bone is covered in deep grooves, marks left by teeth biting through flesh. Koji's sanity won't let him consider the possibility that a human could have done this. The owner of this house must have kept some sort of carnivorous animal as a pet, giving it the bones of small animals to eat and disposing of the remains in the bathtub. Why not dispose of the leftovers properly? They could have just been thrown out with the garbage. Was there something keeping him from leaving the house? The relief Koji felt when he realized that the bones weren't human is once again under attack. In the first place, what the hell was Fuminori doing here? Oh, hi. Uh, uh, we were just, um... Getting ready to take a bath? <gasps> Koji whirls around, his light revealing Fuminori's expressionless face. Minori pushes past Koji and looks into the bathtub. He doesn't even flinch at the sight of the bones. Koji doesn't want to believe that this old that the old friendly Fuminori could have had a contact with the denizens of this house. Oi, Fuminori! Koji runs after Fuminori. His heart is finally beating normally again. Standing in the entrance, Fuminori glares coldly at Koji over his shoulder. The utter lack of emotion in his eyes give Koji pause. Koji swallows. What can he say? Fuminori walks away without another word, leaving Koji alone in the entrance. Up until this very moment, concern for his friend was still up at the forefront of his mind. Now, however, that concern is swiftly giving way to a growing sense of dread. Does the Fuminori he knew never no longer exist? Was the person who stared down who stared Koji down an imposter wearing Fuminori's skin? This is like, um, I don't know if you guys ever experienced this, but if you've ever had a lucid dream, um, which is a dream where you know that you're dreaming and you have a great degree of control over it, um, I've had a few of those, and in all of them, the humans were fucking terrifying, because for some reason I couldn't control them, and they're, like, dream people, they're, they don't act like normal people, um, they're, they're completely unpredictable in their actions, which is, oof, some of the scariest stuff. Oji had begun to believe that it might be so. What a nuisance. Why does he insist on interfering? He only spoke to me with to exchange pleasantries, even I could bear it. But now he's sticking his nose into my business just to satisfy his curiosity. Koji is a perfect example of someone who thinks it's always good to take interest in other people's affairs. Probably thinks he's doing me a favor by prying into my life. He couldn't be more wrong. If he keeps this up, I might have to find some way to deal with him. Like Saya said, I have to keep my search for Dr. Ogai a secret. Koji could ruin everything. That's right, wasn't Ogai... Um, Saya's father? 
Sorry, like I said, it's been a week since I played last, so I didn't remember the name. I didn't have time to fully investigate the Yokai residence today. At this rate, it would probably take several days just to go through the study. Saya didn't believe that I'd find anything to help with the, re with the search. But I think there's still a lot to explore. Who knows what I'll discover. The problem is Koji. He knows about the house now. Will he make things difficult? Suppressing a shudder, I put on a fake smile and turned to face the writhing mass of rotting, rotten flesh that is staring at me with bulging eyes. Ah, uh, of course. This is my next-door neighbor, Suzumi. A middle-aged painter, I think, who spends all day at home with his while his wife works. I haven't had much contact with him since the accident. Why is he suddenly talking to me now? Uh, What is this? Did he just stop me to deliver a lecture? The flesh beast undulates foully. As though it still has something to say. The sight of it is driving me close to the edge. Now I get it. He's worried the unsightliness in my house might diminish the image of his own damn snob. Why won't everyone stay out of my life? I just want to live together with Saya, alone where no one will ever bother us. Suzumi Yosuke sighs in annoyance as he watches the neighbor boy retreat into his house. What's with his attitude? Even while talking, he keeps his eyes averted as if to avoid looking at something repulsive. Yeah. Has he always been such an unpleasant young man? No, of course not. When his parents were still alive, he had been a normal youth. A little shy, but sensitive and caring. It must be the stress of his sad situation. If it continues to build, he might start to develop serious mental problems. You think? Or is it too late already? Yosuke wonders as, his gaze, as he gazes warily at the Sus Sakisaka yard. Even during dinner, Yosuke can't shake the neighboring house from his mind. Mmm. <laughs> The stink from the Sakisaka house grows worse each day, and the Suzumi family is at its wit's end. あの草村の中に死んだ猫でもいるんじゃないかしら。まさかとは思うが。そんな。いや、今の様子だとやりかねん。一日中ずっと雨通し。お兄ちゃん、頭おかしくなっちゃったのかな。これ、ひろみ。
Right now it's five in the morning. Soon the sky will begin to show the first light of dawn. Even if she left right before I returned, she's been gone for almost half a day. I can't sleep. I can only wait in anguish. I tried to distract myself by painting more rooms, but I couldn't concentrate on the work. If I had known this would happen, I would have left the Ogai house sooner. I wish I hadn't wasted time on Koji. If Saya doesn't return, the thought makes me want to tear out my hair. After its long absence, the terror of true loneliness was too much to bear. Tadaima. As I jump out of my bed in relief, all the stress that has built up throughout the night is relieved in a wave that threatens to sweep me off my feet. <laughs> my question trails off as I notice the thick bundles of paper she's carrying under her arms. <laughs> Saya drops her bundles on the floor, sending paper flying everywhere, then pulls her favorite cushion over and collapses into it, stretching luxur luxuriously. こんな夜中に、ディライから歩いて戻ってきたのか。ごめんね。本当はもっと早く帰れると思ってたんだけど。Maybe it's just the exhaustion, but I'm not understanding a word Saya's saying. だから、そんなもの持ってきてどうするつもりなんだ。どうするって、もちろん調べるのよ。うちで時間かけてじっくり。えっと、うんうん。あら、何やってんだか。あとはうんなんだ君わかるのかパパにいろいろと教わったからそれじゃあ、ちょっと、これじゃあ、いつまで経っても直せないよね直せないのか can't tell if she's being serious. Watching more closely, I realized that her eyes are scanning each page rapidly. So rapidly, in fact, that I was unable to notice it at first. Could Saya actually be reading my charts? Hmm? Saya,今日はもう疲れたし、寝ないか。海のりがそうしたいなら、そうする。Oh boy, I'm gonna get another age scene. Saya tosses aside papers she was sorting, then leaps on me and begins. Yeah, okay. I might have to skip this one too. We'll see. It's either gonna be skipped or censored. Contrary to her appearance, Saya's appetite for sex would put any adult to shame. You could even say it's a little unnatural. She's not just passionate. Uh, she also has unlimited stamina, making me wonder where her slender body gets all the energy. Never satisfied with letting me feast on her to my heart's content, she always uses me to pleasure herself until I'm forced to tap out. Masaya. Hey, so what's the implications? What, what what what's the implications of the age scenes if she is a giant flesh monster? That's what I really want to know. Yeah, you think? Okay, so that's it's confirmation that she is indeed underage, which is a little bit disturbing that Okay, see I understand uh, arguments. I know they're gonna be the arguments that well, this is meant to show just how depraved of uh, human affection uh, Fuminori is. 
and to an extent you'd have a point but then when they just have full-on age scenes that are clearly meant to get you horny over this little girl that's where it kind of draws a line for me you can portray these things without trying to get your audience horny at <laughs> you know she laughs playfully as she pushes me onto the bed the familiar sweet sensation of her weight and skin rendering me helpless oh to my astonishment saya is completely uninterested in safe sex she doesn't eschew protection she doesn't just eschew protection she even insists that okay Surely she knows the rest, which means she only which can only mean she wants to get pregnant. How can I respond to that? Saya seems unsure how to reply, but not because she doesn't understand what I said. Rather, the bemused look on her face makes it seem as though I'm the one not getting it. <laughs> By the time I break the spell of her angelic smile, Saya has undone my belt and is removing my pants. <sighs> yep. Okay, so there was another age scene that I have skipped, hopefully. Um, if it wasn't skipped, then I'm going to have to take the video down and edit it. I don't know, maybe I'll forget. But, nonetheless, there wasn't much, again, that you could really get out of that. Other than that, Saya is okay with having a child with... Uh, Fuminori, uh, and apparently has no problems with taking, uh, his excrements inside of her, regardless of the hole. Um, so, that's, uh, basically all they really got. Also that, obviously, uh, Fuminori is shutting out the entire world except for Saya, but we already knew that. Um... So, again, kind of pointless, kind of just, why? Like, I paid an extra $5 so that I could get the closest to the source material as I could, and I guess I did, but honestly, so far, I don't think it's worth it. Unless you, unless you're really into underage women, please, if you are, just close out of this video i don't i don't want you on my channel other than that i guess we're just going to continue two o'clock for suzumi yosuke this is the most fulfilling time of the day after seeing his wife and daughter off taking care of the morning chores and eating a leisurely lunch it's finally time to sit down at his easel he's not a particularly popular painter and he would only hold an exhibition if he were hurting for money However, the design work he does on the side ensures that there is always enough to support his lifestyle. Al along with the salary his wife er <laughs> along with the salary his wife earns working for a magazine, they're able to pay their mortgage, send their daughter to school, and still have plenty left over. Yosuke's life is perfect, leisurely and absent of want. He loves his house, considering it a symbol of his, of his success. When he mows the lawn, polishes the windows and floor. Okay, we get it. Oh, let me read that. Wait. Okay, so he's like, uh, OCD-ish. Now 
Now then, where should I leave off to go shopping? As he ponders this dilemma, he... Is that a dilemma? A dilemma... Excuse me if you heard that. A dilemma implies two... Um... Decision. Two... I mean, two options, right? So is there, like, two places he could go? Just then, a breath of air tickles the back of his neck, bringing him to a halt in the middle of the hallway. A breeze. Impossible. Every window in the house was closed. Yosuke shut him... So shut them himself during his, his morning cleaning. Yosuke enters the living room, searching for the source of the breeze. Something stinks. It's the same pungent smell of fetid swamp land that emanates from the Sakisaka house. The window facing the yard next to the door is open, and its curtains billowing loosely in a gentle breeze. There's a hole in the glass next to the wall lock. It looks strange, as if it was melted by some chemical instead of broken. Someone must have reached through the hole to unlock the window. Yosuke stands paralyzed, his heart pounding with anger and fear. He listens carefully, but hears nothing. Perhaps the intruder has already finished his business and left, but a burglar wouldn't have left the room untouched, would he? Maybe he heard Yosuke coming and hid somewhere nearby. Yosuke realizes that his still wet pallet knife was in his right hand, must have forgotten to put it aside before going downstairs. He stares numbly at the knife for a minute, then decides it's not enough protection. Instead, he grabs the ashtray sitting on top of the table, made of thick, solid glass that is big and heavy enough to serve as a weapon. The home he thought of as a part of himself now seems utterly alien. Keenly aware, Keenly aware, keenly aware of the th thumping of his heart, Yosuke looks around the living room and sees a little that could be used as a hiding place. The intruder must have gone either to the guest room or to the dining room, to the kitchen. Something you guys need to understand is that I barely talk at all in my daily life. Um, I have like severe anxiety, so I talk as little as possible. Um, I talk way more making any of my videos than I do normally especially if it's one of these read through videos um where i'm gonna have to keep talking constantly to read but make do and hopefully i'll be able to improve the kitchen is close to the stairs if there had been movement yosuke would have noticed it when he came down which means that the guest room is the most likely place he shuffles over to the guest room door and prepares to slide it open what is that stench could the breeze alone carry something so foul? It's as if the odor is coming from inside the room. He readies his ashtray and throws open the door. Something seizes his ankle. The, in the instant he freezes in shock, his leg is yanked out from under him, sending him crashing to the floor. Stars explode behind his eyes as his head smacks against the door rail. The hand, if it can even be called that, wrapped around Yosuke's ankle, extends all the way back to the living room sofa. There are barely five centimeters between the sofa and the floor. Whatever is hiding there it can't possibly be human. Before the screaming Yosuke can, re before the screaming Yosuke can regain his footing, countless hand-like appendages seize his arms and legs, rendering him helpless. As the hideous voice burbles in his ears, something ca cold and soft crawls atop him. It sounds like it sounds like he was screaming. Then, tube-like appendages penetrate his ears and nose, wriggling deep and into his skull. Right before the sensation drives him mad, Yosuke loses consciousness. No, not my favorite character! あなたたちみたいな人が来てくれたのは 
私としてもありがたいとはじめまして先坂文典君の文典の友人で殿尾浩二と言います彼女は筑波洋 When they arrived at the T University Medical Center and asked to see Fuminori's doctor, Yoji and Yo had been prepared for rejection. They hadn't expected the ease with which their request was granted. Hello, recording session three. I know the、uh, end there was very sudden. But it's been a lot less time between these two than the previous two. And also, I have a lot less time to record now. So let's just get into it. Not accidentally hit start like I did once. Okay. I guess I'll just read from the top. When they arrived at the T University Medical Center and asked to see Fuminori's doctor, Koji and Yo had been prepared for rejection. They hadn't expected the ease with which their request was granted. He didn't come in for his checkup two days ago. I tried calling his home, but no answer. Two days ago, the same day Fuminori was searching that abandoned house, Koji frowns, wondering what was important enough for him to blow off his appointment. <laughs> Oh, geez, that is loud in my ear. Turn that down a little bit. Also, turn myself up because I have to be quieter. Seeing Yo's, seeing Yo's shoulders jerk out of the corner of his eye, Koji regrets not choosing his words more carefully. まるで人が違ったみたいに見えます。僕たちもいろいろと、その、どうし、あなたたちも偉大性。え、oh she actually has a sprite。have we seen this before？ because I'm pretty sure、pretty sure previously we've only seen the CG。彼のカルテ、見てみたいと思う。見せてくれるんですか？そんなもの。yeah it's pretty crazy that she would just Give away someone else, else's medical information like that. I don't know what the laws are in Japan, but I can't imagine they allow this. Stolen from the archives two nights ago. She stares hard at the astonished students, then shakes her head with a tired smile. あなたたちは無関係そうね。ちょっと安心したわ。当たり前です。でも、犯人は先坂君の容態に興味があるか。それとも、彼の治療記録を消したかったのか。うん。interesting。彼に関わりのある人間としか思えないわ。I mean, the only person that seemed to make sense there would be Saya, but what do we know? An ominous thought flashes through Koji's mind. It couldn't have been Fuminori himself, could it? Koji looks at Dr. Tanbo and finds her staring right back at him, her expression grave. He realizes that she must be harboring the same suspicion. Perhaps Dr. Tanbo didn't have anyone in mind when she asked. But Koji's thoughts immediately fly to that eerie house in to which Fuminori led him. She's gonna react to that. Koji stops speaking as she sees the dramatic change that has come across Dr. Tanbo's expression. Yep. Do you know what you know? Do you know what you know? いつどうやって知り合ったのかわかるいえ、こっちが知りたいぐらいです。先生、一体何者なんですかあの大外っていう人は。After remaining silent for some time, Dr. Tanbo loses a heavy sigh. いいわ
I've never seen loose used as a verb. That's interesting. I'm like I'm loosing this rope. That's not that's not how that's typically used, is it? Doctor Tucci got this hospital and dismissed six months ago. Koji has no argument with which to answer Dr. Tadmo's flat rejection. However, he can't shake the feeling that this Ogai person is the key to unraveling the mystery surrounding Fuminori. At this sudden declaration, both Yo and Dr. Tanbo raised their eyebrows. Apologies if you can hear all the sounds of my drinks like this. Um, I think it's most of it is being cut off, but uh, I guess enjoy the ASMR. If you can hear it. Koji is unable to bear the shock in Yo's voice. Dr. Tanbo is frowning, her expression even more serious than before. Dr. Tanbo hesitates for some time, refusing to make eye contact, but she finally shakes her head. Koji is out of options. All that's left is to trust this young doctor. It's frustrating, but a friend's rights only go so far. Having a bit of a an Oishi connection here. What the what happened to me? Yosuke's awareness returns slowly as though rising from a bog. He's cold. Oh hot. Something itches like tepid tongues and cold slugs crawling over his skin. What the hell's going on? Him and Lee, he opens his eyes. Yeah, that's what that would be my reaction to. It's everywhere. The thing that attacked him in the living room, it's everywhere. Terror shatters Yosuke's sanity. <laughs> he throws off the thing lying atop him, but his wild flailing sends him crashing to the floor. But is it really the floor? The long, wriggling fibers of what should be the carpet are winding themselves around his fingers. The floor is made of worms. That's a sentence. He tears his limbs free of the worms and tries to stand, but loses his balance and tumbles to the floor again. The worms immediately swarm over his body. Where am I? Where did that thing take me? Yosuke crawls across the worm-ridden floor toward the only exit from the pulsating room. When he gets outside, however, all he can see is blood, bile, and rotten meat. There is no place to run. Did he somehow catch whatever kind of disease is making um, our boy Fuminori see all this? Most terrifying of all, this hellish place has the same layout as, host as Yosuke's house. In a half-mad daze, he wanders through the nightmarish mockery of his home. It really looks like an AI-generated image, doesn't it? In the small room where his studio should be, he finds an easel made of bones displaying a blood-soaked canvas. 
like some cruel joke. Everything is exactly where it would be in Yosuke's studio. <laughs> Howling, Yosuke lashes out against everything within reach. So uh, is Saya like the source of this uh, psychological phenomenon and is like causing it to people? Is that what's happening? The easel of bone shatters, driving splinters into his fist. He feels the pain, but does not wake from the nightmare. If this isn't a dream, then what is it? When his strength gives out, Yosuke falls to his knees, sobbing. For the first time in his life, he prays. The sound of the door opening and closing grates on his ears. Oh, excuse me. Downstairs, the front door is someone else here. Yosuke trembles at the blood-curdling sound. It's that thing again. That monster has returned. Yosuke hears the sound of something slimy sloshing its way up the stairs. Even as he cowers in terror, he slides his trembling hand across the floor and grabs one of the bones from the broken easel. Okay, so here's the thing that is uh, sort of bothering me right now. Not in the way that I think it's like poorly written or anything, but it's a mystery to be solved. Is that what distinguishes the targets for which Saya goes to eat and for which um, she inflicts this upon? It's presuming that's true because he was attacked by a flesh beast. So, why is he not just, like, food, you know? The monster's growls are getting closer. Holding his breath, Yosuke presses his back against the wall to the next, next to the door. The pounding of his heart is like thunder in his ears, so loud that he fears the creature might hear it. He knows it will eat him if it finds him again, but it's all he can do to keep from crying. At last, the door creaks open. <laughs> Yosuke leaps on the creature as it enters, fear turning into his, turning his roar into a high-pitched scream. The flesh beast is covered in sludge and vile juices, but before, ho before horror can paralyze him, Yosuke brings his bone stake, stabbing down. The monster screams as the stake pierces its chest and punches through the other side. It falls back, writhing in agony. The sight of its pain sets Yosuke's blood on fire. I can win. I can kill it. If I finish off before it enters my head again, I'm safe. Yosuke grabs the bone and twists it with all his might. The monster convulses and gurgles, its trembling tentacles reaching as though begging for help. Yosuke knocks it to the floor and then brings his heel crushing down on his flopping body again and again. With each stomp, its groans and spasms grow weaker. When the monster at last stops twitching, Yosuke, panting hard, tears the stake from its corpse and rises to his feet. Yosuke turns to see another smaller monster peeking at him from the stair landing. There's still one left. His desperate, rage-filled attack both exhilarated him and gave him a taste for violence. This one will be easier. It's smaller and weaker. Grinning maniacally, Yosuke raises his stake and moves toward the second creature. The monster flees, screaming down the stairs. Not about to let his prey escape, Yosuke roars and gives chase. The thought, of ki the thought that killing the monsters might end this nightmare feeds his savage bloodlust. When the monster trips and falls in the dining room, Yosuke leaps on top of it and brings the stake crashing down. His bloodlust unsa unsated, he pulls it free then drives it again into the monster's flesh. Once, twice, three times and more until there is nothing left but shredded, pulverized meat. Eventually, the only sign in the house is Hyosuke's heavy breathing. 
He has slain two monsters, but the nightmare shows no sign of ending. Yosuke staggers to the front door and goes outside. The sky, the city, everything has gone bad. You know, when you see when you see this, it really makes you feel that um, Fumi Nodi really has really has his shit together. Twisted shapes, nauseating colors, stinking air. There is no escape, no end to the nightmare. The last remnant of Yosuke's sanity vanishes like dust in the wind. Yosuke turns to the sound of a girl's voice. Oh, hi. She is standing in front of the house next door, wearing a spotless one-piece over her pure white skin. In the midst of the filth-ridden world, she alone glows with beauty. Yosuke feels a sudden black lust rise within him. Yosuke walks up- Okay, first of all, experiment. Second of all, Yosuke walks up to the jubilant girl and brushes his hand against her long, smooth hair. She looks up the man towering over her, perhaps disturbed by his hungry stare. A grin parts Yosuke's lips and he replies. <sighs> With that, he grabs the girl's collar and tears the front of her dress wide up. We don't need to see a CG, right? Uh, shock and fear twist the lovely girl's delicate features, stimulating Yosuke's sadism. Even after killing those two monsters, the embers of violence still smolder in his heart, and now they have new fuel to burn. <laughs> the terrified girl flees into the Sakisaka house. Yosuke runs after her, feeling the joy of the hunt. Even in desperation, she has no hope of outrunning his longer stride. Yosuke charges down the hallway and catches up to her in the kitchen. He grabs her from behind and wrestles her to the floor before she can resist. <sighs> yeah, we're getting a CG. My screen is, um, it'll be blacked out in editing. Like I said, because they're too cute. Enjoying the sensation of thin arm struggling futilely against his grip. Okay. Yosuke stares at the smooth, perfect body. Okay. Thought of violating such an immaculate creature amid the horrors of this twisted world was irresistibly erratic. Yosuke. Okay. Her tear-choked voice satisfies Yosuke's lust for conquest. This nightmare has violated him, but now he is able to visit the same torm- Able to visit the same torment upon this innocent- I don't know if that's the word idea. Where he was the victim, he is now the victimizer. The release is- he feels is intoxicating. Okay. <laughs> Save me, Fuminoti. Okay. I'm pretty sure you can assume what happened in that scene without me having to tell you or show you. As always, the sights of the city grate on my nerves. Today, however, I don't feel as much hatred as I usually do. I have grown more accustomed to my condition, but that is not the reason for today's high spirits. My search of the Ogai house has finally borne fruit. When I pulled all of the drawers out of the desk in the study, I, find an I found an envelope stuck between the desk and the wall. 
excuse me. It must have fallen off the back of the writing tray. Inside were three outdoor photographs. I couldn't recognize the scenery due to my condition, but I'm pretty sure that they show three buildings. Scrawled on the back of each photo was an address. Nagano Prefecture, M Village, to okay, to Tochigi Prefecture, S Town, Shizuoka Prefecture, H Town. None of the names, none of the names is familiar, so they must be way out in the countryside. The photos are all dated more than 10 years ago. I don't know why they were taken or what they mean, but maybe Saya will be able to make some sense out of them. In any case, this is something that Saya missed while she was living in that house. I wonder how she'll react when I show her what I found. Saya, I so badly want to see her. The thought of her waiting for me speeds my footsteps. When I step through the gate, I see that the front door is wide open again. This is the second time this has happened. Upon entering the house this time, however, the sound of Saya crying chills my blood. It's not just her. I also hear a low, wet grunting. There's no time to take off my shoes. I race down the hallway, propelled by a terrifying premonition. Mo a monster is in my house, and it's Saya. It's... I'm sure you can guess what the word is. The filth oozing from its body spreads across her skin as it drives... Okay. Monster... Okay. Each time the beast moves, Saya's sobs become cries of agony. She looks at me with tear-filled eyes and calls my name in a weak, breathless voice. I'm curious to what this scene is supposed to be in the um the scene is gonna is like in the censored version rage erupts inside me like black lava the monster stops gorging itself on saya's body and turns its head to look at me surprised by my own composure i slip past it and grab the meat cleaver sitting next to the sink without a moment's hesitation i slash at the monster's face it, scre it screams and staggers away from Saya. My attack must have blinded it because it flails its tentacles wildly as it tries to drive me away. My bloodlust still unsated. I calmly s it this fan really likes that word, doesn't it? I calmly seize one of the one of the appendages and plunge my weapon twice more into its quivering flesh. The blade enters its body with fascinating ease. Each strike sprays my face with blood. As I carve the monster to pieces and savor its hideous screams, my mind is finally consumed by rage. No mercy. I'll see this monster suffer for what it's done to Saya. I give myself to the fury, howling at the top of my lungs as I slash and slash and slash and slash. Even after the flesh beast stops moving, I keep slashing until I realize that it can no longer feel pain. Cursing myself for killing it so quickly, I stab the meat cleaver into the floor, snapping it in half. When my thoughts finally begin to regain some cohesion, I find myself still digging the broken knife into the floor. The monster is gone, but the pieces of it are scattered everywhere. I stop cutting into the tile, and in the sudden silence, I hear Saya's faint sobs coming from a corner of the kitchen. Saya... <gasps> I pull the cowering Saya into my arms. She stiffens in fear at first, but as soon as she realizes that it's me, she clings to my body and cries. <laughs> I don't know what to say, I can only keep holding her. This should never have happened to Saya. Everything in this twisted world is to blame, yes, including myself. I couldn't protect her. If I'd been there, I, maybe I could have prevented this. Not wanting to hear that from her, I pull her head into my chest. I try to reassure her, but she shakes her head vigorously in denial. I don't understand. What is she saying? I 
フミノリが感じるのと同じように世界が見えるようにしたの。Okay, so if フミノリ has two brain cells, you can put together the fact that Saya is the reason that he has this condition in the first place. And the fact that he sees her as a sort of、um, reprieve from the, this world、uh, should, it should set off some warning bells in regards to Saya's character. Yes? It takes me some more time to understand the meaning of Saya's words. Finally, regaining her composure, Saya responds to my confusion in a low voice. I'm gonna have to do a lot of editing for this、uh, this part、um, of the video. Aren't I? I'm gonna have to like, censor specific parts at different times, and I'm gonna have to make sure that there isn't a single frame where it. Oof. Finally, we're getting our composure, so I respond to my confusion in a low voice. その生き物によってまちまちだから、フミノリの脳に何があったから、同じことができるかどうか、他の人で実験してみたの。So that's the excuse you're gonna use。なんで、そんなことを。そうすればみんな、フミノリみたいに、私に優しくしてくれるようになるか。My heart aches at the loneliness in her voice as she confesses her sorrowful wish. She starts crying into my chest again, unable to say any more. I gently rub her back while trying to get my jumbled thoughts together. What is Saya and that she can do such a thing? The answer is beyond me. However, there is one thing I can answer here and now Saya is mistaken. <laughs> Smile and shake my head. I guess I'll read this since you probably can't see this part. A relationship is the sum of so much more. The time you and I have spent together, those days, those experiences are what made us what we are. Saya is still crying, but now her te tears feel warm against my chest. Smile, her smile shines through her tears. What a liar. Now, more than ever before, I feel the depth of the bond between us, and I'm sure Saya feels it too. I wrap my arms tightly around her and seal her lips with mine. Saya responds, winding her arms around my neck as our tongues desperately seek each other's warmth. At the moment, Saya is my whole world and I am hers. I think you might be mistaken on that last bit, bud. It seems like you're kind of just、uh, giving this,、uh, this manipulative alien creature a spot to、um, not be confronted. The earth turns for us alone. Of course, I still haven't told her something very important. I don't know why I've never said it before, perhaps because it was always so obvious. However, I should put it into words at least once, this oath of mine. <laughs> Okay, something about her. She stops me with a finger against my lips. <laughs> Saya nods, staring into my eyes with unusual solemnity. Saya takes a deep breath before continuing. Okay. Okay. So we're confronting this already. 
Until now, that hasn't been in the realm of possibility. I replace Zaya's words in my head to be sure of their meaning. I... Oh, this Vian has choices? I was not aware of that. Um, why is it only one now? I was pretty sure I used it. Oh, because it's in quick save. Okay. Yeah. Um, like I said, I basically had no idea what anything about... I didn't know anything about this VN until I... Like, I mean, I didn't know anything going into it. So, I didn't know there were choices. I pretty much just assumed it was a kinetic novel up until this point. But I guess we're going to have to save the choices for next time. The next uh, recording session. But, I don't know. Obviously, Saya here is incredibly sus. Um... <laughs> I don't know. It is 2.02 a.m. currently while I'm recording this, so uh, my apologies for not having perfectly formulated thoughts. I say even though I am pretty much nocturnal at this point, so this is like day hours for me, I my brain is just not working. <laughs> but anyway, um, I guess I'll see you guys in three seconds for you. I don't know how long for me. Okay, bye. Hello, I am back. It has been another week, and I am very limited on time again. Um, so we're just gonna have to get into it. Last time, we were given a choice, and if I remember correctly, it is Saya offering to, I guess, reconfigure Fuminori's brain back to normal. Um... I really was not expecting a choice in this game, but I guess I'll just reread this real quick because you guys can't see the screen currently because there is nudity on it. Do you want to return to your old life? Do you want to take back what you lost in the accident? I, ellipses, want it all back or don't need it anymore. Um... So there are, I believe that don't need it anymore is the direction that the story wants to go. So that's probably going to be the longer slash the actual route. Whereas the other one might just be a shorter ending or it's just not going to be as long. But that would, I don't know. It seems like the answer that they want you to do is the worst answer. But at the same time, if you're just saying that you want it back, who knows what Saya is going to do in response. She doesn't necessarily have to comply, you see. So I guess I'll choose that one first. I want it all back. <laughs> God, that is... Were the voices always so loud in comparison to the BGM? Oh, okay. Alright. I've never wondered if there could be any other answer. I stopped dwelling on this question a long time ago, and... And if I'd asked before I'd met Saya, I wouldn't have hesitated. If I'd been asked before I met Saya, I would, wouldn't have hesitated. But what about now? What does it mean to wish for the past? And what could it do to me and Saya? As soon as these questions occurred to me, my true feelings became unclear. The hurried answer I gave her was less certain than I thought.
Yay, more censoring. Saya smiles softly, her expression an unreadable mixture of what seemed to be sorrow and relief. Seeing it fills me with a sudden unease, as though I've just wounded her deeply with my careless words. Saya silences me with another kiss and thrusts her tongue into my mouth with even greater passion than before. As the sweet softness as her tongue clouds my mind, I begin to feel an urgent need to say what she prevented me from saying. To speak those most important words. I can't speak, and for some reason my mind is hazy. My consciousness is slipping away as the euphoria from her kiss spreads to my entire body. I hear Saya whisper softly from far away. Okay, so it's not even really gonna, like, give me a choice, really. I'm guessing it's supposed to be a whole point of, like, oh, he is sunken this far. He uh, is completely blind to any other options. Or, Okay, it's just black. Wait. Okay. <laughs> I was clicking and it wasn't, like, progressing. Wait, I have to tell you something before I sleep. Just one thing. My efforts are meaningless, however, as Oblivion calls me into its embrace. Embrace? When I first awoke... When I awoke, the first thing that greeted me was a terrible stink. Mr. Suzumi's body was covered in flies, and I could smell the rotten stench she would expect from a corpse. The night had ended, but Saya was nowhere to be seen in the morning light. Aside from the blood-covered floor, the kitchen looked as sa the same as it had been before the accident. In the den, however, the colors that had been so soothing the day before now served as a stark reminder of what a distant world I'd been living in. Despite knowing it would be futile... I wandered the house searching for Saya. For almost an hour, I tried in vain to deny reality. Then I called the police. When the operator answered, I couldn't stop myself from crying. It had been such a long time since I'd heard a human voice other than Saya's. As became clear later, Mr. Suzumi had murdered his family before I killed him. Unable to give the police a satisfactory explanation, I was arrested for all three murders, and when they found the remains of Taka Takahata Omi in my house, a fourth was added to the charges. During my interrogation, I told them ex everything exactly as it had happened in every detail. The detectives didn't believe me, of course, but the doctor who came later did. He had moved me from the jail to a much cleaner white room. Excuse me. That's right. This room looks just as white to me as it does to everyone else. In the end, they declared me incapable of answering for my actions. Everything that had happened to me was real, but a part of reality incompatible with the rest of the world. So the doctors gave me a space all to myself, a place where I could live in my own world. I am sad that I wasn't believed, but I know it couldn't be helped. In this world, reality is what the majority says it is. I had the misfortune to step outside of that box. The walls of my room are undeniably white. That at least I can be thankful for as long as I live out for as long for as I live thankful for it as I live out the rest of my life here. Everyone said that there was ne never any girl named Saya. Well, so be it. Saya was probably never part of their world. But why shouldn't I be able to hear Saya's voice here in my room? This is my world, after all, a continuation of the very real time we spent together. How long did I wait with such, plots, such thoughts floating through my mind? One night, I awoke to the sound of something crawling down the hallway. The sound would not normally have woken me, but I must have found a premonition that night. Must have had a premonition. <laughs> Excuse me, it's... Sleeping lighter than usual, I had to, had waited for her arrival. And so I knew instantly that it was her. 
She did not answer, but I could feel her outside my door, struggling with some internal conflict. After a long silence, something small slid through the narrow bar bars of, the, of my peephole. It was a cell phone, the screen already showing a notepad with freshly entered text. My voice will sound strange to you. I couldn't suppress a chuckle at Saya's uncharacteristic display of shyness. After a short pause, the phone returned to my side. Please let me st stay the Saya you remember. I started to suspect it might be so. In the hell my eyes had made of the world, Saya alone had looked normal. I thought that she was somehow unique. In truth, however, she had probably been a different kind of unique than I'd imagined. It wasn't my sense it wasn't that my senses hadn't distorted her appearance, but that she had been so unusual as to seem normal to my twisted mind. Saya's true form was something other than what I had known. Now, however, I could see her for what she really was, but Saya didn't want that, and it was not for me to question the workings of her heart. I just had to accept that girls need to keep some things private. I slid the phone back to her. I was hoping that you'd forgotten. I smiled widely at the text on the screen, wondering if she'd really thought me so heartless. No one was listening, but still... It would have been embarrassing to speak the rest aloud, so this time I typed it into the phone. G-H-I J-K-L M-N-O T-U-V D-E It's like the alphabet in a weird order. W-X-Y M-N-O T-U I slid the phone back through the slot. Um, you know, I was going to just count, like, the parts in the alphabet that these letters are, but, because, like, maybe it's, like, some kind of cipher, but really not in a position to figure it out right now. I'm just going to continue. I could sense her trembling outside my door. I couldn't hear her or see her, but I st but still I knew. Saya was crying. Perhaps my words offered no comfort, spoken so late. Even so, I was ready. I had wanted to return to my old life, true, but I would have abandoned that wish for Saya. I know that I would have gone with her hand in hand as far as we could, even to the most forbidden of places. Saya, too, must have known that I was prepared. And because she knew, she stopped me from saying those words. If I had spoken that oath, there would have been no going back. I'm sorry, I was a coward. Seeing the words on the screen, I shook my head. He actually said it wasn't only her fault, but I was afraid of you, of how you were changing because of me. It's no one's fault. So I couldn't bring herself to take everything from me, and I couldn't bring myself to give up everything for her. You were too weak to find happiness. I'll keep searching for my dad. He'll, he'll know how to send me back to where I came from. A short time passed with no words or messages exchanged. I wonder how many times in that brief silence yes and no changed places in her mind. Yeah. When the phone finally returned, the characters on the screen seemed strangely uncertain. Um, ch -ch -ch. Uh. 
Hmm, okay. I was looking to see if I could switch it to the Japanese text so I could figure out what exactly this is. Because it's apparently strangely uncertain. Which I guess you could say that about... Yeah, but... I don't know, that's not like... What my first thought would be. Well, I hope you you find your father. I'll do my best. The time had come for our parting. She had chosen her path and I had given my blessing. There was nothing more to be said. I will. Thank you. Goodbye, Fuminori. Read her final message and returned the phone to the other side. She didn't leave gently slapped my door in response and then I heard the sound of her slipping off down the hallway. I'm gonna need to review this because I'm kind of only half paying attention because I have to read everything and it's late. I'm, t I'm tired. I'm just finding like any opportunity that I can to actually record these things and it's not always an optimal situation. Okay. ready I have one I would have abandoned that wish for Sai. I know I could have gone with her okay so he was actually about to say uh, nah actually I don't need to go back but Sai was like, no, obviously that's what would be best for you, so I'm going to do that for you. Okay. That's an hesitation. Okay, just staring at these words is not going to make it make sense, so I'm going to have to come back to this later. I'm sorry I can't give the most insightful commentary um, immediately. It's just how things are right now. I'm sorry. I'll review the content later, and hopefully I'll have some actual analysis for you. And I was left alone in the silence of the night. Ever since that day, I have been waiting. Perhaps Saya really did return to where she came from. Perhaps she is still wandering today, looking for her father. It must be hard. She must be lonely. When she can no longer stand being alone, she will surely return to me. I am the only one who will comfort her and whisper sweet nothings into her ear. So I wait. Dreaming of her face and her voice, I wait. Forever in my white world. Okay, so I was probably right about this being the shorter ending. Because this obviously isn't the direction that they wanted the story to go necessarily. There's no way to skip this. Uh, okay. Man, I can't wait until I can consistently work on stuff when I want to.
the ending song's going hard, but honestly, I'm not really feeling it. I'm not really feeling anything right now. Might just be the situation, but... And the fact that I come back here to resume after a week, really tired, and then instantly get an ending, so it's like... I don't know. Man, I apologize. This commentary sucked. But hey, that's not what most people are coming to this channel for. They're coming for the scripted videos, so... If I have enough thoughts to compile by the end of this, you should see some sort of scripted video covering uh, Sayanota, and it should be a lot more insightful than what you're getting right now. Why do I even keep talking? I think I just need to stop recording right now because obviously I'm not in the prime condition to do it. Um, I'm not going to redo that recording because now I've obviously read it already, but whatever. I'll see you in two seconds. Hello, everyone. I am back. I don't know how much time I have, but I was able to go back through that ending and sort of pick up things with a clear head. So obviously when Fuminoti was typing on the phone, no wasn't a secret code or anything like that. It was just uh, an old cell phone that had three letters on each key. And he was just typing out, I love you. So, I mean, nothing shocking there. Nothing to look too deep into. Um, somehow that was just completely lost on my very tired brain at the time. Um, so this other thing I have, I have some some notes written down. Saya said, I was afraid of how it was changing you. And then there was another line. Saya couldn't bring yourself to take everything from me and I couldn't bring myself to give up everything for her. We were too weak to find happiness. So obviously Saya uh, had intended to keep, I guess you could say, corrupting Fuminori, but knew that deep down that something about that was wrong. And likewise with Fuminori, he also kind of desired that path just to have, I guess, Saya to himself or whatever, um, but ultimately gave it up. Um, I don't know, apparently Fuminori thinks that he would have been happier had he let himself, uh, I guess, go further down that path, but I guess... I don't, I don't know. <laughs> and the other thing that I have notes on is, well, a note on, Saya's dad knows how to send her back to where she came from. So, this, I don't, I don't know what kind of, like, mystery this is going for. So I don't know if that's supposed to be, like, some meat dimension or whatever. I guess if I had anything to say about that, it would be that there are sort of two layers of reality at play here, the meat dimension, and I guess you could say the normal human dimension, um, and the sort of disease that Fuminori had, or however his brain was somehow reconstructed, it allowed him to see the other side of reality as compared to the one that he did, that he did before, rather, that everyone else sees, um, and Saya has somehow, she came from the meat dimension, but somehow found her way into the human dimension, or something along those lines. So I guess if you put it that way, if there was some sort of like switcheroo, maybe she, okay, okay, okay. So maybe she is actually like the little girl, but... Like, the meat version of her and the normal version sort of switched places. So, the meat version wants to get back to the meat dimension, and the human version wants to get back to the human dimension. I Listen, I have no idea. We're just going to get in, get back into this and see how far we can continue onward. Um, yeah. I'm just rambling at this point.
I don't need it anymore. On that terrible day when I first opened my eyes after the accident, what would my answer have been? When I think back on this many years from now, will I wish that my answer today had been different? It doesn't matter. Here at this moment, there is no doubt on my mind. He was hardly a stranger. We'd been neighbors for as long as I can remember. I'd go as far to say we were on good terms before the accident. And now I've killed him with my own two hands. I feel a little... I feel a little? I f that, that's not a complete sentence. Mr. Suzumi, the kindly painter who lived on the next door, is but a distant memory. No. I just misread it. I feel a little. Okay. The pieces of meat around me belonged to a creature whose mere existence was nauseating. Only by killing the vermin could I find relief. He complained about my yard being filthy. The swine. It doesn't matter what Saya did. He wasn't worth keeping alive anyway. These are my honest feelings. My hands are wet with another man's blood, and yet I am utterly calm. Now I know what I lost in the accident. Saya says that I can take it back. But I know that I cannot. It is gone forever, like the life of the man called Suzumi. Saya looks away, her expression unreadable. Everything is monstrous and loathsome in my eyes. Everything but Saya. I thought that she was somehow unique. I was wrong. I see her just as I do everything else, as something other than what she really is. But why should that surprise me? Saya is a part of my world, just as I am, as I am a part of hers. It doesn't change what we are to each other. I stand and walk over to Suzumi's dismembered corpse. I finally... I finally realize that even though the stench of, the, of these monsters' flesh turns my stomach, their blood and guts smell pretty good. In fact, I know this fragrance quite well. Is this a reference to an actual manga that I don't know about, or...? I retrieve the cleaver, pick up a piece of Suzumi's body, and start removing the skin and tendons. Ah, uh, just as I thought. The stuff underneath is exactly the same as what Saya and I have been eating. So it's interesting that, I guess, human meat tastes good to, pe to beings that are on the opposite... I guess, a side of reality than what they belong to? Or something like that? I answer easily. There is no longer any room for doubt in my mind. I guess I still haven't convinced her of my sincerity. I haven't read this manga, but I have a feeling that's not the takeaway you were supposed to get from that, Fuminori. Oh, great. More than I have to censor. By the way, it's looking like the desktop audio is very quiet compared to my voice. Let me bring that down a little bit. Oh, man. This is not going to be easy for future nachos to edit, but Ooh, whatever.
As Saya wipes away the tears flowing from her eyes, I could no longer see a hint of fear in her face. I don't want you to regret this, I don't, but... I have sworn my oath, and Saya has accepted it. We have nothing to fear now. Saya will never need to cry again. I can't help it. I'm so happy. I guess I'm pretty selfish, aren't I? I don't mind. I'll always indulge your selfishness. Filled with contentment, we exchange a smile and s set to the task of cleaning the room. A single person produces a lot more meat than I expected. Speaking of which, I seem to remember doing something similar before. After we finish here, we should go gather the meat from the Suzumi house. That should be enough to hold us for a while, and we can use the refrigerator to store what won't fit in ours. It's all coming together. Saya and I will be just fine. After we finish our labors and get into bed, I show Saya what I found at in Ogai's house. The photograph that Saya has selected is the one with a Tochigi prefecture address on the back. At the outset of my ordeal, I had to depend entirely on my sense of distance to decipher what I saw. The houses in front of me, the mountains be far behind them, the clouds above. Only distance and scale told me what they were. Photographs and other flat images used to be nearly impossible to make out. Recently, however, I've gotten better at understanding what things are by their shape. I know what, ma I know what the mountains and sky look like, for instance, and how to tell them apart from buildings. Each of the three pictures shows a similar scene, a lone house in the middle of a thick forest. <laughs> Judging by the address on the back of each photo, they pr probably are excellent places to hide from prying eyes. But why three? Okay. The dates are pretty old, and it seems odd they were all taken within a few days of each other. Maybe he was scouting properties, looking for the perfect location for his hideaway. Saya recognizes only one of the houses, so that must be the one Ogai picked. Checking the location on a road map of the Kanto area of the Pokemon of the Kanto area, I find that it's about three hours out of Tokyo by car. The way I see it, our only hope of finding Ogai is to follow whatever lead we have, no matter how small. The probability that his hideout will be will yield useful information may be low, but it's not zero. So that's what it is. Slightly exasperated, I smile and rub Saya's head. After a brief, brief silence during which her expression is hard to decipher, Saya looks up at me and says, That's the last thing I expected her to say. Okay, so for her, there are two sort of options, it seems. Either stay with Fuminori and have them basically completely... Have the two of them completely just become absorbed in each other and nothing else matters. Or go their separate ways and Saya looks for her father. It's just what I'm getting from this. I mean, anyone can figure that. Saya's words make me happy, but I also hear the loneliness in them. Yeah. 
Having finally found out how to explain my feelings, I continue. Saya doesn't seem upset, but she does tilt her head quizzically, as though my thoughts are strange to her. Another plan has started to form in my head, one separate from the search for Dr. Ogai. If I find the doctor there, great. If I don't, well, I think I can find another use for his mountain retreat. Fearing that Saya will start sulking, I hurriedly add. Don't get me wrong, even if I could have lots of friends, you'll always be special to me. I have to read out some of this text because I'm not sure if it's going to be like covered up by black or not. Because it's cutting really close to the edge of what I have to censor. Giggling, Saya rubs her cheek against mine. Today, all of Koji's classes were in the morning. On his way to meet Yo for lunch after his final lecture, Koji suddenly gets a call in the middle of the hallway. Without thinking, he reaches to his belt for his new camera phone, but curses when he realizes the ringtone is coming from the old phone in his bag. He hasn't transferred his contacts list yet, and still calls, and st and calls still come to his old phone from people who don't know the new number. When he finally fishes the phone from his bag, the name he sees on the display sends a chill up his spine. I wonder why they had to specify all this about the old and new, for, and new phone. I wonder if it's actually relevant to anything. Fuminori. Why, why now? What does he want? It's hard to be happy about a call from Fuminori after the incident at the Ogai house. Of course, Fuminori would know Koji is free on Thursday afternoons. Fuminori hangs up without another word. What's gotten into him? What does he want? Koji wonders as he sticks the phone into his jacket pocket. This sudden change is disturbing after a week of Fuminori avoiding both Koji and Yo. Maybe he's finally ready to talk, in which case Koji should probably consider this a good thing. However, he can't shake the feeling that something is wrong. Yeah, probably. In the parking lot, Koji finds Fuminori leaning against the fender of Koji's car. <laughs> okay. The last time they met was in the darkness of an abandoned house. This is the first time in over a week they've spoken face to face in the light. Perhaps that's that is why Koji senses something strange in Fuminori's expression. So is he gonna, like, get Koji to drive him out to this house and then probably just go home there? He's not sure what exactly, but something has changed. I think I was right. Fuminori seems more relaxed than before. He used to be tense all the time, like he was terrified of something, but now his expression is calm. He's even wearing what resembles a sheepish grin. Yeah, I wonder why. Nevertheless, the instinct is telling Koji that Fuminori's charges are not for the, be for the better. Changes are not for the better. Jesus. I've never considered having dyslexia or anything, but when I read this and have so many problems, now I'm actually starting to learn. I'm kidding. A smile, unreadable as ever, offers no glimpse of his true motives. Hmm. Why? Why does he sense malice, thick and viscous, 
lurking behind Fuminori's smile. Yep. Fuminori's car was destroyed in the accident, so Koji isn't surprised that he needs a lift. Koji unlocks his car and gestures for Fuminori to take the passenger seat, then gets behind the wheel and starts... Dude, don't be stupid. You already suspected that this guy killed your friend. Why are you doing this? Koji couldn't believe his ears. He seriously expects to be driven over a hundred kilometers and back? Koji doesn't know whether to be angry or impressed. Koji sighs heavily, tapping the steering wheel as he calms himself down. Now that he's come this far, the only thing he can do is see his friend's craziness through his... No! No, actually, that's not the only thing you can do. You can actually say no. Koji isn't looking forward to meeting the owner of that creepy house, but he's even more uneasy about letting Fuminori go home. It looks like he has he just has to grin and bear it. Koji drives out of the parking lot, leaving the rest of what he'd thought to say unspoken. <sighs> Fuminori's smile seems to be wrong somehow, like a mask hiding his true face. You think? Yo finds herself sitting alone in the cafeteria, searching for a f familiar face as her lunch cools on the table in front of her. She was hoping to see Koji today, but he must have had other plans. That wouldn't at all be at all unusual. Normally, Omi and Fumirodi would pick up the slack. Why didn't he, like, text her? But Omi and Fuminori aren't here anymore. Yo puts down her chopsticks, her appetite ruined by the lack of company, and by the anxiety eating at her. Omi is missing, Fuminori has turned on her, and she has no idea why. If Koji were here, she could count on him to distract her with some idle conversation. Now that she is all by herself, Yo becomes keenly aware of how little tolerance she has for loneliness. She begins to feel paranoid, like the whole world is plotting to take from her everything that she cherishes. What is going on here? Where has Omi gone? Is Fuminori really unrelated to her disappearance? Or is he the key to this mystery, as Koji and Dr. Tanbo suspect? Yo recalls the events of last Thursday. Alone and without an outlet for her pain after Fuminori verbally eviscerated her, Yo was lucky enough to run into Koji. Although he could hardly make her problem go away, his kindness was a comfort. At the same time, Omi was on her way to Fuminori's house, the, and, and she hadn't, hasn't been heard from since. Yo has only been aware of Fuminori's connection to Omi's disappearance since yesterday, when Koji revealed the truth during their visit to the hospital. What if a new possibility occurs to her, a reason why Omi suddenly decided to visit Fuminori? What if it hadn't been a coincidence that Yo ran into Koji that day? What if Koji and Omi had known what transpired between her and Fuminori and had to act and had decided to act separately? Omi might have seen the confrontation in the courtyard. She might have been eavesdropping. It's not unthinkable. As the idea forms in her mind, Yo feels as though something is tearing apart her body from the inside. It's only a possibility, but if it's true, then whatever happened to Omi is Yo's responsibility too, isn't it? <laughs> Yo clutches her head, groaning in agony. The food on her tray is now cold, not that she would have eaten it anyway. Despite her frustration and anxiety, Yo is unable to act on her own. She has never been good at adapting to challenges, and no one would ever call her proactive. She hasn't the slightest idea of how to respond to this situation. If Omi were here, she probably would tell Yo to think positive and trust her instincts. Yo has always depended on her best friend's energy. Now that Omi is gone, Yo realizes just how weak and useless she is. She can only sink deeper and deeper into the abyss of self-loathing. The sudden ringing of her phone pulls her back from the brink of despair. It's a text message. There's no title, and the sender is... Uh, oh, okay. Yo cries out in shock. 
The message itself is even more baffling. If you want to know about Saki Saka Fuminori, come to his house alone. Tell no one. So this is Saya's doing. If Saya has the ability to reconstruct the inside of someone's brain, she could probably, I guess, like pick out the memories from Omi's head of what her password was and text this, I guess. The message bears no trace of Omi's personality, but Yo can't deny that it was sent from her phone. She takes a deep breath to calm herself before typing her reply, taking care that excitement doesn't cause her fingers to slip. Is that you, Omi? Where are you? Yo presses send. The screen shows her that her message was received. As she waits for a reply, her mind fills with questions. Is someone else using Omi's phone to send text messages? If so, why to her? Okay, but why did you... <laughs> okay. Never mind. Something suddenly occurs to her. She and Omi have exchanged countless messages over the years, many of which contain the sort of embarrassing confessions that close girlfriends share. At times when her feelings for Fuminori grew too strong to contain, Yo often put them into words for Omi to read. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's Saya. Did Omi put a password on her phone? Even if she had, the person who sent the message was obviously un obviously able to unlock it, which means that whoever it is has full access to her history. Do you want to know about Saki Saka Fuminori? Yo reads the strange message one more time. Whoever sent it must believe that Yo has an interest in Fuminori. The phone rings again, startling Yo, but she quickly recovers and looks at the screen. There's no title, and the sender is Takahata Omi. Still Takahata Omi. I'll tell you everything when we meet. Come alone. Tell no one. Yeah, that makes... That, that That's something your friend would say. Okay, well, yeah, she's picking up on that. It's not Omi. She would never try to scare Yo with a, such a mean-spirited prank. So naturally, you aren't going to follow it, right? Anxiety had has brought Yo almost to tears. Her mind isn't made to deal with this. Who is using Omi's phone and promising to review Fuminori's secrets? Who? Excuse me. You know, desperately wants advice from Koji, from anyone. Even starts, starts to dial Koji's cell, but a sudden suspicion stops her. The sender might be somewhere nearby, watching her at this very moment. A cold chill runs down her spine as she looks furtively around the cafeteria. Why would you think that? Come alone. Tell no one. The lifeless characters on the screen are like a knife against her throat. However, Yo clutches her phone and forces her heart to stop pounding. Oh no, she's dead. <laughs> Isn't this cowardice exactly what she hates most about herself? Doesn't she want to know what she's capable of? Doesn't she want to do more than sit and wait? Come on. Yo realizes that her hand is shaking. How easy it would be to just give in to a cowardice to convince herself that Omi and Fuminori are beyond her reach. That is what she truly wants. Even if it means abandoning dignity and loyalty, she wants to flee from the unknown. But she also knows that even escape is beyond her. Okay, listen. Humans naturally fear the unknown for a reason. It's called a defense mechanism that doesn't always apply to every situation because our modern life is so damn complicated, but sometimes it does. And this is one of those instances. So, um, yeah. But she also knows that even escape is beyond her. Yo understands herself well. She knows that no matter how far she runs, regret and self-loathing will consume her after everything else has fallen apart. In the end, Yo is unable to overcome her cowardice alone. She lacks both the willpower and the courage to run. I do understand that feeling, though. The afternoon silence is somehow forbidding. A stink is in the air, the stink of garbage left out to rot. Even this perfectly normal residential neighborhood seems... <laughs> Come on, why did you go? Seems ominous to Yo in her current state. 
Obviously, because it's because the plot needs to progress. She feels like she's standing in the middle of a necropolis, as if everyone in the house around her houses around her is dead. Ironic. Yo pushes her fear aside and presses the buzzer on the Sakisaka house's front gate. Kuminori wasn't in class today. Is he home? He couldn't have sent those awful messages, could he? She doesn't even want to consider the possibility, so she forces the unwelcome thought from her mind. There's no response from the intercom. Yo doesn't know, of course, that Omi stood in the same spot one week ago, staring at the silent intercom with the same confusion that Yo is experiencing now. She, however, is not forced to wait as Omi was. The phone in her pocket rings, catching her off guard. It's another text message from Omi's phone. Come in, the door is open. Yo looks around quickly, a shiver running through her as she realizes that she's being watched. Searching fearfully for her observer, Yo spots movement out of the corner of her eye. On the second floor of the Sakisaka house, a tightly drawn window curtain just fluttered. The person who sent messages is inside the house. Only now does Yo realize that every other window has its storm shutters closed. No matter what happens inside, no one will ever know. This time, she nearly gives in to the intense urge to, to flee. But the terror she feels toward her invisible watcher is stronger. It will not permit her to turn her back upon the open door. Open window. She has nowhere to run. Yo bursts into tears, unable to take a single step. The phone in her hand rings again, demanding that she enter. She steps through the gate. When she enters the house, an overwhelming stench assaults her nostrils. You know, this- why would you do this? Like... I can't imagine arriving in this situation and taking these actions. If this happened, I would... If I even managed to get to the door, I would be like, as soon as I got that message saying to come in, I'd be like, no. No, actually, no, I won't. I'd at least get some other people to come in with me, right? I mean, I guess that would be rude to break into someone's house with other people. I don't know, I just wouldn't, wouldn't cross that door. The house is dark, even though it is the middle of the day. We know that he must be out, and as his shoes are not in the vestibule. However, Yo catches sight of a different pair stuffed behind the shoe cup cupboard. They look familiar, so she pulls them out of the shadows for a closer look. As soon as she recognizes them, her mind tries desperately to deny reality. They are identical to Elmi's favorite shoes. Yo has seen her wearing them many times before. That doesn't mean Omi is here, she tells herself. They may belong to someone else, someone who bought the same shoes from the same store. There's no way Omi could be here, is there? With a sudden flash of clarity, Yo presses the most frequently used speed dial button on her phone in her tightly clenched fist. The phone dials Omi's number. It takes only a second for the signal to reach the nearest relay station, and then... A familiar ringtone echoes through the house. It's coming from the second floor. Someone must still be up there in the room with the moving curtains. Omi's phone rings for just a few moments, and then it stops, as whoever is holding it realizes Yo's intention. For the first time, Yo feels the definite presence of her formless guide. She gathers her courage and calls out into the house. But there is no response. Whoever it is must not want to be seen. See, this is the moment where you get the fuck out of there. Swallowing hard, Yo walks down the hallway to the staircase. Maybe it's Omi. Maybe, or maybe it's Fuminori. Surely it's just the two of them playing a prank on her. Koji might, not, might even be there with them. Yo's mind fills with comforting images of her friends. Oh, excuse me. She needs to believe that there is still hope. Otherwise, she could not have taken another step. As she climbs the stairs one at a time, Yo calls out in a voice choked with tears. Please tell me you at least have, like... What am I, what? 
You have something to defend yourself. As she climbs the stairs one at a time, Yo calls it out in a voice choked with tears. Pepper Sprite is what I was thinking of. When they see her sobbing, they'll probably laugh at her. Let them. It would be the happiest moment of her life. She just wants this torment to end. She tries to move faster, but her trembling legs will not let her. With each agonizing second that passes, she begs for release from this nightmare. After climbing for what seems to be an eternity, Yo finds yourself standing in the second floor hallway. No sound greets her. There is only gloom, brimming with silent malice. She shuffles forward, calling out in a weak voice. The door in front of her is half open. It must lead to the room that overlooks the front gate. Yo watches helplessly from a corner of... From a corner... Sorry, those sentences are just weird. Yo watches helplessly from the corner of her mind as her body seeming to move seeming to move on its own volition suddenly open or slowly opens the door. The room is empty. The damp, stinking air clings to Yo's skin. She is at her limit, unable to take a single step more. Her spirit has been utterly crushed. Perhaps this is the moment her tormentor was waiting for. Oh, god damn it, more that I have to censor. Basically, she's being groped by some meat monster, I guess, Saya. And uh, her tits are just popped out. Something grabs Yo's arms from behind, something flexible and strong, like a slime covered rubber. As the thing binds her limbs, finger-like appendages tear roughly through her blouse and force their way inside. Yo screams at the top of her lungs, amazed that she still has the strength to do so. Responding to her distress, primal energy surges through her body as she flails wildly to free herself. However, the grip of the thing behind her remains unbreakable. When escape, with escape impossible, Yo can only scream louder as something cold and wet slips under her bra and wraps itself around her breast. She is helpless to resist as the in okay squeeze uh, squeezes her breast. Okay. Her ears are filled with the sound of something slimy sliding over her skin as the loathsome assault on her breast continues. An unimaginable- okay, why is this necessary? An unimaginable terror threatens to drive Yo utterly mad. Her throat is already raw from screaming, and now she can't breathe as she struggles desperately against her attacker. Suddenly, the thing releases its grip on her breast and pulls out from under her bra. Yo follows to the floor- falls, God. Falls to the floor, unable to support herself on her unresponsive legs. The creature that grabbed her is still here, lurking in a dark corner of the room. She can feel it watching her, but can't bring herself to turn around. She knows that seeing it will likely destroy the last vestiges of her sanity. And close by comes the beep of buttons being pressed. Yo hears a cheerful electronic sound terribly out of place in this room, and sees the phone in her hand blink coldly. A new message has arrived. She is powerless to stop herself from reading the characters on the screen. What the fuck? You're pretty and your breasts are so big and soft, I bet they're good for attracting males. Now she has her answer. The message messages from Omi's phone were sent by the thing that just mauled her breast. Yo curls into a tiny sobbing ball, unable to raise her voice or even move. The creature makes a burbling sound. Yo somehow understands that it is laughing at her. That must be how you tempted Fuminori. You tried to steal him from me, didn't you, thief? Oh god. 
Something cold seizes Yo's ankles, then troubles slowly up her legs until it has covered her entire lower body. <sighs> Some primal female instinct tells her exactly what is going to happen. She'll be raped, powerless to, f to resist a fate worse than death. She hears bubbling laughter again. The thing is enjoying her sorrow or despair. Yo no longer has the strength to resist the monster on top of her. She is only able to shiver in revulsion as a cold, slimy thing covers her body. Her sight grows dim as her mind sinks deeper and deeper into a black, swamp-like abyss. Happy Pride, everyone. I don't even know if this is going to go up in Pride Month, honestly. Depends on how far away we are from the end. I won't kill you. Though her mind is barely functioning, she, Yo hears a voice whisper to her inside her head. It is a girl's voice, sweet and sinister, the cruel innocence of a child gleefully plucking the wings from butterflies. Instead, I'll let you share in our happiness. Rejoice, Yo. We'll love you to death. The soft voice is a stark contrast to the unyielding strength that drives, drives irresistibly into Yo's core. Pain is sharp and savage, greater than anything she had ever felt before. It should be unbearable, but there is no longer enough left of Yo's mind to recognize it as pain. While she stares blankly at okay, things slithering deeper and deeper into her body, an idle th thought floats through her fading consciousness. I've still never been kissed, have I? Okay. It has begun to snow. It has begun to snow by the time they pass Utsunomiya on the Tohoku Expressway. The passenger seat, Fuminori, is gazing out of the frosted window in silence. He's been in this trance like state for almost an hour now. Taking advantage of, it, of his inattention, Koji stares unabashedly at Fuminori from the corner of his eye. He still doesn't understand the danger signals that he's been getting from the man. Fuminori has stopped avoiding Koji and is even looking him in the eye when he talks. So why does he seem even more distant now than he did when he was trying to push his friends away? Fuminori's posture is noticeably relaxed, but his gaze never wavers, not even for a moment. It's as though he is focused on a clearly defined future that he has chosen to bring about, one that has no place for the needs or the wants of others. Right now, Fuminori is complete. Koji cannot help but feel that beneath his bland exterior is a core of solid steel that nobody can touch. Fuminori's tone is completely emotionless. Koji might as well have asked him about the weather or the condition of the mountain roads near their destination. Finally, Fuminori shows some emotion. He sounds hurt, like he can't believe Koji could think of such a thing. He says, not worried. Sudden frustration wells up inside Koji. If possible, he'd like nothing more than to bear than to beat the secrets out of Fuminori's said. Koji is worried sick about Omi. To have his concern brushed off so coldly it would be unbearable coming from a complete stranger. But from Fuminori, who was his best friend, it's Fuminori never used to be this callous. Even if Koji tried to interrogate him, he'd probably never find out what changed him so. If Fuminori were still if Fuminori were still just hiding inside the shell he'd erected around himself after the accident, Koji might have been able to give get some answers out of him. With this sly, evasive Fuminori, however, there's nothing Koji can do. Fuminori will never reveal his true intentions, not to anyone. All that's left then is for Koji to discover the truth on his own.
merely smiles bitterly at the mention of Tsukuba's name, perhaps feeling sympathy for her pain. To Koji, however, it seems like pity, the sort one directs at an ant or a worm. Unbelievable. We know his feelings for Yo were really this cold. Then he w would have rejected her when she first confessed to him. But he didn't. Uh, or at least the Fuminori before the accident didn't. Once again, Koji couldn't help but wonder if this man who looks like his friend is really a different person who only possesses the memories of Sakisaka Fuminori. <sighs> I sort of know that feeling, man. I have... Uh... Or had a friend with severe schizophrenia and the longer that I knew him I guess the more lucid he became the less it seemed like that was becoming a burden for him it was like controllable but then that man got his hands on like religion and it was all downhill from there it like all, all medicines just stopped working and he just completely lost himself to delusions it's really a, really a shame. So I understand sort of what Koji here is going through. The snow has has stopped falling when they get off. The snow has stopped falling when they get off the west not soup flats interchange. Looks like you might you might have mixed up your tenses there, game. This area must already be getting a lot of snow, however, as the nearby mountains are covered in white beneath the trees. Is it just me or some of these backgrounds like beautiful paintings and then other ones are just photos that are made very, very crunchy? By the time they turn off the highway and enter the mountains, road conditions are already bad enough for Koji to regret having forgotten the t forgotten regret having forgotten tire chains. Nevertheless, he continues to power his car up the precarious slopes with only a road map to guide him. In places like this, an address isn't enough to pinpoint a location. His only choice is to drive down every road, including private roads that aren't even on the map, while searching for something that matches the photograph. <laughs> Far from prying eyes, you say. The more he hears about Ogai, the less Koji wants to meet him. Ooh, this is really crunchy. Fuminori is the one who spots the narrow road half hidden in the trees. It's practically an animal trail overgrown with weeds that are tall and strong enough to withstand the weight of the snow. Koji stops the car and sticks his head out of the window to stare into the dark forest, but he can't see it where the path leads through the tightly packed trees. Fuminori hands Koji the photo, which he compares to the mountain ridges visible beyond the trees. Although Koji is worried about his car suspension, that his car suspension won't be able to handle the terrain, there's no turning back now. He shifts into second gear and starts down the frozen road. The sun sets early at high altitudes. As the car creeps up the mountain path, Koji catches glimpses through the trees of the gradually darkening sky. The forest is completely still, with no, with no sound save for the rumble of the car's engine and the crackle of snow and brush beneath its tires. Fuminori is once again staring silently through the front window. In the ominous silence, Koji feels the same faint chill that he felt when standing before o Ogai's suburban home. He feels wrong as though he is traveling deeper and deeper into a world that is not his own. After some time, a blocky shape suddenly appears amid the trees, staring out against the twilight sky. Koji turns off the engine and compares the structure in front of him to the picture in his hand. It's a perfect match. 
Before he can tell Fuminori, however, his friend is already out of the car. Yeah, like, this is weird. The background is a crunchy photo, but the artwork in front of it is hand drawn. Weird vibe. I don't dislike it though. Oh god, my throat's starting to hurt. Realizing that it's pointless to call out to him, Koji shakes his head, grabs the flashlight from the glove compartment, and follows Fuminori across the snow-covered yard. You know, maybe, um... Mi Why are words on? Maybe ginger ale was not uh, the correct drink of choice for this. It's, I don't think it's really helping my throat. The photo must not have been taken recently as the old rundown cabin before them has clearly been left to the mercy of the elements for some time the front door appears to be locked but koji ki not koji but fuminori kicks it down without a second thought koji just watches knowing that nothing he could say now would matter all of the windows are shut with heavy curtains and the gloom inside is thick and stifling Fuminori turns on his own flashlight and starts rummaging through the cabin without regard for its owner's privacy. Koji is reluctant to do the same, but it is obvious that this mountain retreat has been abandoned for so long, for a long time, just like the house in Tokyo. There's no point in being considerate now. He goes to search a different room. Soon after entering the cabin, however, he realizes that their search is meaningless. There's nothing inside but the bare necessities of life. Some rooms are even completely empty, save for a thick layer of dust on the floor. Of what few pieces of furniture are present, more than a ha more than half appear to have never been used. There is an empty chest of drawers without a single scratch or handprint, but bearing the telltale signs of mold and moisture damage. The condition of the cabin is eerie, though in a different way than the filthiness of the house in the city. It's like someone put together a mock-up of a home and then left it to decay. The, oh, the only the, ugh, excuse me, the only signs that anyone lived here are found in the toilet, the bath, the kitchen, and the bedroom. It appears that the cabin was never used for anything but eating and sleeping. Beneath the darkened sky, the snow itself seems to glow with coal, with a cold white light. The scene is like something out of a fairy tale, but to Koji it serves only as an unpleasant reminder that he has stepped outside of the reality that he knows. Next to the front porch is a plain wooden door half buried in the ground. It's locked, of course, but Koji sees no reason for restraint after what Fuminori did to the front door. The door offers surprisingly little resistance to Koji's heavy kick, breaking open to reveal a set of concrete stairs leading down to a pitch-black basement. Koji would prefer to leave such a forbidding pace to Fuminori, but it's not like he can just ask him to take his place. He descends into the chilly darkness, the beam of his flashlight leading... Why are you doing this, honestly, though? Why can't you just, like, sit in the car while you wait? Like, what? There turns out to be nothing in the basement but a storage room and a boiler, exactly what one would expect to find in isolating isolated mountain cabin. I can talk. The few packages of pres preserved food sitting on the shelves have long since passed their expiration dates, and the boiler doesn't appear to have been used in years. Koji guesses that o Ogai's mountain home has been abandoned longer than the house in Tokyo. Was Fuminori simply mistaken when he said Ogai might be here, or was he lying from the beginning? Not sure what to do next, Koji goes back up the stairs and walks around the outside of the cabin. And there he finds the backyard. It's in much worse condition than the front yard, having been mostly reclaimed by the forest. It must have been neglected even when the cabin was still in use. The remnants of a woodshed lie in the yard, the mushrooms growing on it, speaking to how much time had passed since its collapse. 
Next to the rotten logs, however, stands a circle of stone that has not yet succumbed to the elements. A well. The well has no bucket or pulley, and when Ko Koji peers carefully into it, he sees that the water is no longer flowing. It's probably less than 10 meters deep, depending on how much mud is piled up inside. Koji's search of the cabin has revealed nothing of interest inside or out. Leaning against the edge of the well, Koji wonders why Ogai brought this remote home deep in the mountains and what he was doing here. As far as Koji could tell, there's no sign that more than one person had ever stayed here. Could this have been some sort of secret refuge, a place to remain hidden from the world? That would explain why there's nothing to suggest that whoever lived here did anything more than eat and sleep. Koji suddenly remembers the doctor he met yesterday at T University. Maybe she knows something. He takes out his phone and calls up the number. There's barely a signal, I was about to say, but it manages to get through. Koji's hopes are soon dashed, however, when his call goes straight to Dr. Tanbo's voicemail. He can s He considers calling back later, but realizes that it would be hard to talk with her, to her with Fuminori around. Fuminori would not at all be pleased to learn that Koji and Yo went to see his doctor. Koji decides that he'd better tell the doctor what he can while he's still alone. Koji leaves a, a clear and concise message explaining that he went with Fuminori to Ogai's mountain retreat, giving the address, and asking for confirmation that the property belongs to Ogai. Fat chance. After hanging up, hanging up, Koji thinks back to their visit to the hospital. Is Dr. Tanbo actually investigating like she said she would? Her reluctance to speak of Dr. Ogai is weighing on his mind. He talked to Yo about it on the way home, but they were unable to decide whether the doctor could really be trusted. Speaking of which, how is Yo doing? Koji hasn't seen her today. He didn't say a word to her about his trip to Tochigi. She might be, uh, might be worried, especially so soon after Omi's disappearance. Thinking to check up on her, Koji dials Yo's number and is surprised when it rings longer than it usually does. Did she forget her phone somewhere? Just as he's about to give up, the call connects. The, uh, the first thing Koji hears is a strange sound. It's not signal interference, but some kind of wet, distorted noise. Like the voiceless groans or perhaps sobs of someone far away. No, that's exactly what they were. The person on the other side is crying. There was a response, but is it really Tsukuba's voice? It's too twisted with agony for Koji to tell. Panic surges through Koji as he realizes that something is terribly wrong. After a short period of nothing but pain moans, words start coming through the speaker one by one as though each takes an act of will. What? What? Yeah. Yo must be delirious because Koji can't understand a thing she's saying. Her gasps and wheezes, however, are enough to tell him that she's in unimaginable pain. That's pleasant. She's not making any sense. Koji feels despair seize his heart when an, with an iron grip. What is happening to Yo now, a hundred kilometers away? Only her voice gives any hint of what she's going through. There's nothing he can do for her. Oh, shut up. 
Yo suddenly breaks into a violent hacking cough, as though trying to expel something filling her throat. It's not like I'm not finding this situation believable, but it's just like, this specific line is like, really... Is that really your greatest concern right now? Koji screams into the phone, his reason overwhelmed by an unimaginable horror. Like, I, I can imagine that, like, okay, she can't do that right now. It's literally impossible, physically. But, no, I can't let anyone see me like that? Okay. Koji screams into the phone, his reason overwhelmed by unimaginable horror. Which is why he is unable to react when the phone is suddenly knocked from his hand. And also why he didn't notice Fumi Nori sneaking up on him until it was too late. Fumi Nori seizes Koji's lower jaw with his right hand, cutting off Koji's angry shout. Koji can hardly believe the strength of the smaller man's grip. His biggest mistake- yeah, I figured. His biggest mistake was leaning against the well. There is nothing to grab onto as Fumi Nori pushes him backward over the edge. He can only flail his arms vainly against the air. Koji soon loses his balance entirely. He feels a terrifying weightlessness as the world spins before his eyes. Before he can realize what has happened, his back strikes something with tremendous force. He thrashes wildly as cold, dirty water fills his mouth and freezes him to his core. Only when his fingers find the wall of the well is he able to regain his sense of direction and right himself. On his hands and knees in the mud, Koji vomits filthy water out of his lungs. He tries to shout, but it comes out as a hoarse groan, distorted by the echo of the cramped space. <laughs> Fuminori tosses Koji's phone into the well. Koji catch- oh, good catch. Just before it hits him in the face, but finds that the battery pack has, oh, has been removed, rendering it useless. This is no joke. It's a miracle that Koji is uninjured. He could easily have broken his neck. And just because he's not hurt doesn't mean he's safe. Koji feels around inside the well, searching for something to hold on to, but the mud-covered stone offers no purchase. It's obvious he won't be able to get out without help. Today's sudden change in Fuminori's attitude, that smile, that it always seemed somehow malevolent. 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 Fuminori hadn't been smiling at Koji, but at the thought of his friend's death. He can't wrap his head around this turn of events. Why would Fuminori try to kill him? True, Fuminori had wanted Koji to stay out of his business, but is that really a motive for murder? <laughs> ついでにと思ってさついでにってお前そんな理由で俺をお前死ぬのに理由が欲しいのか何様のつもりだコージ人は何の理由もなく死ぬんだよむちゃくちゃだそんなに理由が欲しいなら一人でじっくり考えないよ
I feel great, the same feeling you get when the last piece of a difficult puzzle slides smoothly into place. I have killed a man and no one will ever know. I mean, technically this is this is your second, but it is a long way back to civilization, but neither the cold nor the exhaustion, exhaustion can ruin my good mood as I walk alone down the snow-covered mountain road. I was tempted to use Koji's card, but that would have introduced a flaw into the plan. I don't want anyone to connect me to his disappearance. The plan formed in my mind the moment I realized how remote the location was. Even if I couldn't find anything to lead me to Dr. Ogai, his, dis his absence would at least prove that the cabin had been utterly abandoned, in which case it would be the perfect spot to take care of a problem. I knew coming all the way out to Tochigi wouldn't be a waste of time. <sighs> My problem with these scenes is just that the victims are kind of acting stupid, which I guess is a common trope in horror, but doesn't make it a good one. I didn't even need to use the meat cleaver hidden in, under my jacket. A dry well. It's like fate itself provided me with the perfect setting. That idiot didn't even realize the danger he was in, and his phone call distracted him enough for me to take him by surprise. Now one of the two people whose questions might have caused trouble for me and Saya has vanished from the face of the earth. All that's left is to eliminate the other. Tsukuba yo. I mustn't underestimate her just because she's less aggressive than Koji. Even she should be able to see a connection between the disappearances of her two friends. I suppose I should be thankful that it was Yo who, to whom Koji was talking on the phone. If he'd reported our location to a third party, I'd have to track down and eliminate that person too. I'm a little worried what they were discussing, but judging by how Koji was screaming it into the phone, they probably weren't exchanging detailed information. Either way, I'd better get rid of you as soon as possible. After walking all night long, I finally reach the Nasu Flat station just as the trains start running. It only takes an hour to get back to Tokyo on the Limited Express. It's not enough time to rest, but I'm t too wound up for that matter. For that to matter. Besides, I don't want to waste any time thinking up a way to kill the Yo. Using the cabin again would be too dangerous, and I'm not sure how I'd get her out of there in the first place, or out there in the first place. I just exploded in her, her face the other day. I doubt that she'll be as quick to trust me as Koji was, which means that it will be difficult to get her alone. I could ask Saya for her opinion, but even I have some pride. I want to show her that I'm a man who can take care of business. I'd be a bit late for that. Unfortunately, I'm unable to come up with anything before I get home. I suppose I should just be proud of having dealt with Koji, the immediate threat. The search of Dr. Ogai's cabin was a bust with no trace of his having been there, but I see no reason to be frustrated. Saya isn't all that concerned about the doctor's whereabouts, so looking for him is just something to satisfy my own curiosity. It's morning, half a day later than I normally get home. And the sound of Saya running down the stairs tells me just how impatient she was for my return. It makes me feel warm inside. <laughs> Saya responds to my confusion with a mischievous smile. I don't realize how hungry I am until Saya mentions it. I walked all night without having a bite to eat, and now my stomach's emptiness becomes painfully clear. However, I can't sit down to a leisurely meal while covered in dirt and sweat of the road. Isn't it like flesh? Damn. Does water look like flesh to him? Like when he takes a shower? Or a bath, I guess. Is he like city is he like in a pool of blood? Is that what it like looks like to him? Uh okay, more sensor. 
While soaking in the bath together, I tell Saya about my adventure. The heat of the bath is soothing, as is the sensation of Saya leaning against my chest as she massages the, f the fatigue out of my stiff leg muscles. Okay. I'm home. Contentment fails me. I don't even need to sleep to retrieve my... To relieve my exhaustion. Just like the living room and the bedroom, the bathroom is painted the colors Saya and I find pleasing. We've left the entrance and hallway untouched just in case someone should see inside. So, these three rooms are the only places I can relax in my own home. Oh yeah, Saya's uh, Saya laughs and sticks her tongue out bashfully. Saya glances at me over her shoulder like she knows something I don't. I've got ways you could never dream of. It's as good as done. Really? Saya's voice is full of anticipation. She rises from the bath, her naked body glistening through the steam. I have no idea what's going on, but I do as Saya says and close my eyes. He takes my hand and leads me up the stairs. I wonder what she has in store for me. The sound of cry as I wonder what she has in store for me, the sound of crying reaches my ears. I stiffen. Little by little, the crying grows louder. I can hear the misery and pain in every choked sob. At first, I'm amazed that Saya would let someone in her house after what happened two days ago, but then I realize that something is strange. Isn't Saya the only one whose voice can carry such clear emotion to me? Although my eyes are still closed when Saya leads me into the bedroom, my ears tell me that there is someone only a few feet away. And yet, I smell none of the human body odor that normally returns my stomach. I open my eyes and am struck dumb by what I see. So, she turned Yo into a flesh monster, which makes her look normal to Fuminori. Am I right? Tsukuba Yo is, yeah, is curled up on the floor with not a scrap of clothing to cover her shivering body. I'm not sure if I actually need to censor this. No, I do. No, I do. Okay. When I first lay upon her naked flesh, I am entranced by the, sen the sensuality of her generous proportions, far more mature than I would have expected from her p usual pure and innocent appearance. Wait, forget about that. Why is she in my bedroom naked? Moreover, why is she? Well, does she look- how does she look to you? She's beautiful, but why can't I? It doesn't make any sense. This is the Tsukabayo I remember, not the putrid creature whose uh, attentions I've, I found so unbearable after the accident. My senses recognize her as a human that she is. The girl loves you, you know? I do know, but I never told Saya. How did she find out? So I decided to change her body into one that you can love back. Saya pauses to gauge my reaction, then continues with a satisfied nod. I made her like me. What? How? I still don't understand why Saya chose Yo, but the last statement is even more baffling. She changed Yo? Don't you remember what I said the other day? I can mold bodies of other living things. Yes, I remember. She claimed to have done something to Suzumi's brain. I didn't doubt her sincerity then, but I suppose that some part of me thought she was exaggerating. I hadn't seen her handiwork firsthand, but now... 
It was a big change this time, not like the little tweak I made to the man next door. But this is how my abilities are really meant to be used. This was my first time doing it, though. Is this really Yo? Yo finally notices my presence and turns her head to face me. I see a faint glimmer of recognition in her glassy, unfocused eyes. Her features are exactly as I remember them. Incredible. This is far beyond cosmetic surgery. Once a twisted creature unrecognizable as a human, Yo is now the very image of human femininity. There is no similarity between what she was and what she is, which can only mean that she has become something utterly inhuman. According to Saya, she has become what Saya is. No one on this planet... Okay, no, you can... You couldn't have learned it from Dr. Ogai. No teacher on Earth could impart such knowledge or skill. Um... Come? Saya blushes. Oh, okay. What is she really? I've accepted that she isn't human, but there's more to her than that. Saya is something that far transcends my species. When Saya approaches, Yo trembles and tries to crawl away, but is only able to flail her arms and legs wildly. It's like she doesn't know how to move her own body. And the only sounds coming out of her mouth are frightened moans. Yo looks up at me pleadingly as though begging me to save her. She is no longer able to ask me for help though or even call my name. Well, Saya asked, her eyes shining, shining with anticipation. Do you like her? I am at a loss for how to respond. What do you mean, like her? You said you wanted family and friends, didn't you? That's why I got you this present. Your innocent explanation only confuses me further. Present? Come on, she's not a dog. There's not much. There's not much difference. Her head, her head is totally empty. I'm happy that Saya wants to please me, but she could use a little more common sense. It's not that holding a person captive is probably a lot harder than you think. Don't worry about it. Look, I have her chained up. The only thing preventing Yo from being totally naked is the leather collar around her neck. I have no idea where Saya got it from, but it's the kind of dog collar that would be sold at any pet store. The chrome chain is fastened to one of the bedposts. Yo tries to get away again, but Saya sends her sprawling with a tug of the chain. Yo tumbles to the floor, squealing in pain. Her actions are those of an unintelligent animal, just as Saya said. I was racking my brain for a, a plan to kill Yo, but now my problem has been solved in a way I never could have imagined. If a normal person looks upon her now, they'll probably see no trace of the old Yo. And if she has no memories and can't even speak, then it's perfect. Saya has killed Yo without taking her life. Though there's still the problem of what she means by giving Yo to me. That's not it. The last thing I want is to reject the symbol of Saya's affection. But how can I explain to Saya why I'm trying not to look at the naked woman writhing on the floor? It's not that. Yo is the first human figure besides Saya that I've seen in three months since the accident. And she's a woman. A woman positively glowing with a voluptuous feminine beauty. Of course I'm happy, but I also can't... Ignore their voice of reason that's telling me not to be. I'm, re I'm happy, really, but if I show how pleased I am, I'm worried that you'll... 
Saya looks puzzled, as though she has absolutely no idea what I'm getting at. I mean, look, she's still a girl, right? Don't you balk at the thought of me living with another girl? After considering this briefly, Saya seems to understand what I'm trying to say. Maybe I am worrying too much, although I'm pretty sure that I'm just showing consideration to consideration that any man who swore in his love to a woman would show. Maybe Saya doesn't understand that a man faced with a woman's naked body can't help but react regardless of his feelings. I mean, I don't know about that, man. I struggle to find the right words to express my true feelings. Oh man, finally! A non-child! With each word that I could squeeze from my lips, Saya's grin grows wider and wider, until she finally starts, starts shaking with laughter. Saya answers me with a smile who with a smile whose like I have never seen before. what? It is calm, so terribly calm, and there is something bewitching about the soft set of her lips that sets it apart from her usual bright childish expression. I don't think you typically do sex stuff with your pets, Saya, I'm just saying. I finally know why Saya chose Yo, for the venom in her voice and smile does not escape me. Although she can no longer answer, if I asked, Yo would surely have chosen death over this fate. And that is the very reason Saya vi visited it upon her. How wicked and terrible Saya is. Perhaps others would fear and loathe her, however, I, however, find her malevolence irresistibly charming. The horrifying cruelty of what she has done to Yo is so very human. Though her shape might may be different, her soul is the same as ours. When I look upon Yo's wretched form, I see intens intensity and passion. I see the intensity and passion of Saya's love for me. For the flames that have consumed Yo are fueled by that very love. I find myself enthusiastically accepting Saya's present. Grinning happily, Saya grabs the chain and pulls Yo to her feet. As Yo looks at, up at me with teary, pleading eyes, I approach and let my gaze roam freely over her lush body and ripe breasts. I run my fingers through her hair, finding it as smooth as Saya's. Drawing the feel, I continue to caress Yo's head. Her fearful expression softens a little. Perhaps she remembers me in some part of her mind and believes even now that I will be kind to her. How foolish. <sighs> Skipping through this. I'll um point out if there's anything important. Uh, can't get this feeling from... Saya's tight, slender body, and besides, I would never think of treating her delicate frame so hard, should I? Yo, however. Yeah. 
Which do you prefer, a soft curvy body like hers or one like mine? As far as bodies go, probably this one. Makes me a little jealous, Saya complains, pouting adorably. You're the one who said you didn't mind. Come, join in. Yeah, let me play with her. <laughs> the tears in Yo's eyes and the Saya breasts, changing shape under Saya's hands, cause a new sadistic desire to well up within me. Okay, I probably cut some of that out if I remember to. Instead of just censoring it because I wasn't even reading a lot of it. I don't think there... I mean, reading a lot of it out loud. I don't think there was really anything of value there. Other than what I said. Again, mostly another pointless sort of sex scene. Like, I mean, I understand the point of it being in the story, but... There's no reason for them to really get that detailed with it, unless it's specifically for you to get off to, and honestly, it's kind of freaking creepy and weird. Later, as I lie on my bed, drained of ener energy, I consider what my life will be like from now on. Saya is resting in my arms. Yo is curled up on the floor. Yesterday, I could not have imagined that the three of us would be a family. A new home, a new food, a new family, all granted to me by Saya. She has selflessly led me from the brink of death to find, a, find new joy amid despair. And I too have changed. I have killed two people with my own hands and made a third my mindless slave. Yet despite all that I have done, I am still able to sleep peacefully. Without doubt, I am no longer the Sakisaka Fuminori I once was. How far will Saya take me? What will I become? Oh man, where was I? How far will Saya take me? What will I become? I feel somewhat unsure, though not discouraged, about the unknown world in w into which we are heading. And so, while playing with Saya's hair, I ask. I don't expect an answer. If Saya is asleep or doesn't want to respond, I won't mind. Saya lifts her head, however, and draws my gaze into the deep pools of her eyes. God, they love this CG. They they love showing this CG and giving me more work to edit, don't they? She thinks for a while, searching for the right words, then says simply, The wind carries those fluffy seeds far, far away from where they were born. What if one of them ends up in a desert where not even a single blade of grass is growing? If you can imagine how that lone seed will feel, then you might be able to understand me. As I consider Saya's answer, she continues her story. Saya smiles softly and caresses my cheek. The loving touch of her slender fingers fills me with peace and joy. I pull her into my chest, nodding silently. Basking in the soft warmth of our love for each other, we sink into the oblivion of sleep. So basically, Fuminodi here is going to be responsible for the spreading of the horrible meat creatures. Because he can't keep 
his dick in his pants. He has been buried alive. His world is the, is the silence and cold of the grave. Ever since his voice gave out and lost strength to, to scream, no coherent thought has passed through Koji's mind. Why are we even coming back to him, honestly? Perhaps this is his brain's way of protecting him from despair. I didn't expect we'd ever be back here. Instead, he dreams. Images flash before his eyes. Random, unconnected scenes from his 20 years of life. Not all are happy times. There are sad, painful memories as well. But even these are pleasantly warm compared to the death that is now encroaching upon him. He dreams of mountains. His older brother once took him hunting for insects when he was a child. They sealed their caught butterflies in a plastic bag, only to later find themselves holding a bag of tiny corpses. He dreams of his lover. They met of a mixer. They met at a mixer, where he'd only, when he, where he'd been the only one to realize that she couldn't hold her liquor. After she'd had too much to drink, he looked after her while she vomited in the back alley. They toasted each other with canned juice, and then. He dreams that he is diving into a black sea. When he reaches the bottom, he looks up and sees the moon shining through the surface of the water. As he gazes up at the circle of light, entranced by, his, by its roundness and brilliance, the distant rumbling of an engine reaches his ears. It's actually a... It's actually a pretty cool bit of writing when you pair it with the visual here. Because obviously this is the well. That's the opening of the well. But it also does look like this, especially when you put this filter over it. So, I just find that interesting. I think that that's a good bit of writing. Something still conscious within him tells him that this dream is wrong. Have I ever gone diving at night before? The dots begin to connect in his mind, forming a barrier to separate his dreams from reality. That isn't what this whole thing is. What is bothering him? Of course, the sound. The engine noise gradually fades to a low idling, then abruptly gives way to silence, followed by the sound of a door opening and closing. Hmm. Is this the doctor? This isn't a dream. Those sounds are real. Understanding comes like a sudden blow. This isn't the bottom of the sea, and that circle of light isn't the moon. It's the mouth of the well. The sun has already ri risen, and someone is right outside with the car. The last piece falls into place, and he becomes Tono Koji once more. <laughs> Nevertheless, he continues, his only desire is to be heard lest he die forgotten at the bottom of this well. Koji's wait is not long, but even a minute feels like an eternity on the edge of despair. Soon, the circle of light above him is partially eclipsed by the silhouette of a person staring down into the well. A woman's voice. Koji has heard it somewhere before, but for some reason he cannot remember to whom it belongs. The silhouette vanishes, restoring the light to a perfect circle. Fear of being left alone again threatens to send Koji into a panic. But his reason has recovered enough to resist. She said she's going to get me out. I haven't been abandoned. While waiting, he gingerly tests his body, which he had forgotten all about, all about until now. His joints ache, and his fingers and toes are numb. But though exhausted, he's still in one piece. After some time, the silhouette reappears at the top of the well. Toji lacks the confidence to attempt such a feat. His frozen fingers can barely move. After a brief pause, the owner of the voice tosses a knotted climbing rope into the well. He grabs the rope as soon as it reaches him. The rough threads bite into his palm, and relief nearly overwhelms him at the sensation. This is really happening. He's really safe. Now that he's free from despair, questions leap into the forefront of his mind. First among them, who is his savior? The rope shakes as the woman carefully climbs down, the beam from the floodlight slung over her shoulder, pushing back the shadow cast by her body. Soon she is standing in the same mud as Koji, and he finds himself face to face with... Yeah. 
Koji indeed had not imagined that his savior would turn out to be Dr. Tanbo Ryoko. I mean, why not? You're the one who sent the, the voicemail. Of course, it took him a moment to recognize her. Instead of a white gown and tight skirt, she is wearing a heavy leather coat, denim jeans, and boots with no heel. She must have expected to hike through the mountains. Her light is block. Her light is blocky, all-purpose type. Fe is a blocky, all-purpose type, featuring side-mounted fluorescent runners, in addition to the main floodlight, survival gear, and professional grade. By the looks of it. Pulls a flask out of her pocket and hands it to him. She walks around with a flask? Question mark. Maybe Koji's just old fashion, old fashioned, but it doesn't seem appropriate for a young woman and a doctor at that. Nevertheless, he unscrews the cap and takes a swig, and struggles to keep from coughing as the potent liquid sears his tongue. Of course, you would describe it like that. Her tone is straightforward and quite serious. Koji can only gape at the doctor, the dark smile on her face doing a little to ease his confusion. Is this really Dr. Tanbo? There's no trace of the bookish, mild-mannered woman Koji had met at the hospital. Her expression is now set in a hard mask, and her eyes are sharp and wary. In the darkness at the bottom of the well, it is possible, however unlikely, that the change in her features is due to the ominous shadows cast by her lamp. It's not so easy, however, to explain the change in her demeanor. Exactly. Koji still doesn't understand why she acted so quickly, but it's a different part of what she had said that seizes his attention. And why would you exactly? That's right, he almost died and at the hands of the man he thought was his best friend. Anger and frustration well up inside of him. He can't forgive Fuminori's betrayal, nor can he forgive himself for all for his foolishness. Now he has no idea if Tsukuba is safe. Fuminori tried to kill Koji. What could he have done the same to her? Okay, but are we are we are we gonna gloss over the fact that she's like, oh yeah. You you're probably gonna die. Without giving any knowledge or reason to that I mean obviously she has an idea of Fuminori's condition but actually mm, I it's been actually a few hours since um we got to the part where he sent where he sent the voicemail Maybe he did make it pretty obvious that that it was a possibility. I remember. I actually had to pause in the middle of this, and I just didn't tell you guys. Still engrossed in her examination of the walls, Ryoko laughed scornfully at the idea. In the light of the lamp, Koji sees that some of the stones are a different shade than the rest of the wall. This must be what Yoko was looking for. Yoko's gaze moves slowly along the wall, finally coming to a rest on the gap between two of the stones. The hole is just wide enough for an adult to reach into open handed. She wastes no time thrusting her hand into the opening. Though she feels around for a few seconds, Koji hears the thunk of something solid coming together behind the wall. So this is why she went in herself. I was actually wondering about that. Yoko pulls her hand out and gives the different colored stones 
a gentle push. With the rumble of weight shifting, the stone slides smoothly into the wall. I don't know why I had trouble reading that. Koji wants answers, but Yoko ignores him and peers into the opening. In the beam of her floodlight, Koji can see a concrete tunnel leading into a mountain. Considering his options, Koji looked from the tunnel to the rope and back again. He's practically sweating now thanks to the 190 proof vodka he just drank. But although feeling has returned to his fingers, he still doesn't have the strength to climb. That said, the thought of being alone in the well makes, again makes him shiver. Ryoko steps into the tunnel without looking back, and Koji doesn't hesitate to follow. Yoko suddenly stops and stares at the floor. When Koji looks over her shoulder, he sees a dust covered rope lying coiled in the middle of the path. Yoko picks up the rope, examines it, and hands it to Koji. ナガサは私が使ったロープのほぼ I'm not sure I'm understanding this. You loop one end of the circle around something top side, then you use the rest to climb down the well. When you're at the bottom, you cut the circle open and pull the whole rope in with you. That way there's nothing to show where you went. Am I dumb or is this not describing it very well? The echo shines your light down the tunnel, revealing that it ends in a closed wooden door about 10 meters ahead. Oh, okay. As Ryoko speaks, she opens her coat and pulls out what she had hanging underneath it. At first, Koji thinks she is holding a steel pipe. Amazed that she would be carrying a weapon, Koji looks closer and is appalled when he, re appalled when he realizes what it really is. A gun. Not one of those sleek handguns he'd seen in the movies, but a double-billed shotgun. The stock and barrel must have been sawed down for easier concealment, enhancing its aura of brutal efficiency. Ryoko looks over her shoulder and gives Koji her most chilling smile yet. That's not a smile. あの時にこいつに会ったのなら私は多分オーガイをきっちり殺せていたろう。そうなってれば、もしかしたら君たちがこんな災難に巻き込まれることもなかったかもしれない。
Kuichi listens in silence, helpless to do anything but watch, as understanding moves farther and farther out of his ga grasp. There we go, that's a smile. Koji can only nod weakly in response. With a light in her left hand and the shotgun in her right, Ryoko walks up to the door and takes a deep breath. Then she kicks the door open, put, putting her full weight into the ball flow. This is an interesting image. And obviously this one looks like a looks like one of the, the crunchy photos rather than an illustration or a 3D model. So I'm actually interested in what kind of set had to be created to do this. Or maybe it's uh, a little bit photoshopped. You got like books over here and a hospital bed and this giant metal ball thing in the wall and the star of david with a disappointingly feeble sound the door breaks off its hinges and falls into the room dust billows like white smoke in the beam of ryoko's light the room is large at least 35 meters square the tiled floor is set with drainage grates there's no mistaking the operating table sitting in the middle of the room Cabinets are full of enamelware and drugs line and drugs line one side of the space and against the opposite wall stand a writing desk and bookshelves. These things Koji recognizes. The mysterious objects cluttering the tables and shelves, however, such as the Star of David, are beyond his comprehension. Mirrors delicately engraved with complex patterns, grotesque statues and masks must have been left by a race of savages. Wow, that's a that's a rude thing to say about Jewish people. Tapestry is woven in nauseating arrays of color, a crystal ball the size of an infant's head. Any would fetch a hefty price at an antique antique store, if not for the one thing they all have in common. Every last piece is so loathsome and full, foul that. Koji feels sick just looking at it. Jeez, he's anti-Semitic. It's as though each was designed for a soul-sinister purpose of immortalizing its creator's hatred of the world. Okay, dude. Right? Okay. Wait, I'm gonna have to read that. I was a little bit too caught up on the joke. Crystal ball. Tapestries. Stat. I mean, it doesn't... I don't know if it's that bad. Rare-looking books of the sort that he had found in Ogai's home are piled here here and there. And on one shelf are stacked with some scrolls that look to be made of some... Made of sheepskin or papyrus. Whatever it is, it's not paper. Finally, there are some indecipherable chalk patterns and symbols filling every available space in the walls. Even the two sliding blackboards are covered in strange, unreadable scribblings. Just looking at them is making Koji dizzy. So wait. So, so wait, this guy had blackboards. He had blackboards to draw on. And then just drew on everything else. Why did he, why did he even need the blackboards? Yoko switches her lights fluorescent runners on and sets and, and sets it on a nearby table where it can illuminate the whole room. She then holsters her shotgun only to pull out an even more confusing set of tools, a digital camera and a can of spray paint. She gives the can in her hand in her left hand a good shake, switches the camera in her right hand on, and then steps up to the blackboard while looking at the camera's side-mounted screen. After recording one set of symbols, she covers it up. She covers it with a thick layer of paint, then moves on to the next. Okay, 
Now that she mentions it, Koji realizes that she is only looking at the screen of her camera, even then only in short glimpses, and never directly at any of the drawings. He understands what she's saying, but it still doesn't make any sense. Koji begins to fear that this doctor might be even more, even crazier than Fuminori. Despite the burst of energy he received from the vodka, Koji is still exhausted from his night in the well. The fear is affecting his body, making him dizzy and nauseous. Soon, the walls are covered in black paint and the stale air is thick with the smell of turpentine. Without stopping her examination of the papers on the writing wall, Miyoko points nonchalantly to a Chinese-style screen standing in one corner of the room. What's a Chinese-style screen? He was there. He quote-unquote was there. Her clinical choice of tense makes her meaning instantly obvious. The urge to see for himself is irresistible. Koji staggers across the room to the screen, taking the utmost care not to look at the scaly octopus thing that is painted on it. Behind the screen is a large, easy chair. Although he's never met the man before, Koji is fairly certain that the person sitting on it is Ogai Masahiko. Ogai's corpse must have shrunk significantly while drying in the sealed chamber. The body is barely the size of a child's, with only the business suit hanging from the bones offering any hint of Ogai's former stature. His empty eye sockets and wide open jaw are filled with darkness. The same darkness that surrounded Koji at the bottom of the well. Compared to those gaping voids, the tiny hole in Ogai's right temple is almost a mirror. The revolver that he presumably used to kill himself is still clenched in his dangling right hand. It looks like a child's toy compared to Ryoko's shotgun. Ryoko must have noticed Ogai's corpse while she was spray painting the walls, and st still she kept working without batting an eyelash. Impressive, though not exactly surprising after what he's been through. It's getting difficult to remember the last time you spoke to someone sane. Okay... So what was that about saying... That whole thing about how she wanted to kill him before, it didn't, at least from what they were describing, it didn't seem like it was that long ago. But if not for her, Koji reminds himself with a bitter smirk, he would have ended up joining this mummified corpse here, and no one would have ever found him. Koji's vision suddenly dims. He pushed himself too hard, and the sp spiritus, spiritus vodka couldn't help him anymore. He collapses to the floor, unable to hang on to his slipping consciousness, and the last thing he sees are Ogai Masahiko's gaping eye sockets staring at him. When he wakes, Koji finds himself lying on something dry and soft. A bed is a bed, he thinks to himself. Even one that smells of mold and dust, and especially after sleeping in the in cold mud all night. There are no lights hanging from the ceiling, but the soft, warm light of a lamp that fills the room. Lamp fills the room. Simple furnishes, non-existent de decor. Koji realizes that he's in Ogai's cabin in the bedroom that he had searched before Fuminori pushed him into the well. Oh, look, my nice little sandwich. Ryoko was sitting in a chair against the wall, her expression blank as she studies the pile of documents on the table in front of her. She must have brought them up from Ogai's underground lab. She turns a page, then takes a bite from the sandwich in her free hand. Koji couldn't imagine that a woman, even a woman like Ryoko, could have climbed out of the well with him on her back. 
本棚の裏に開かない扉があってね苦労して破ってみたら別荘のボイラー室に出てた反対側は薄くモルタルを塗って隠してあったんだな隠し部屋に機材を運び込んでからドアを塞いでその後は井戸から出入りしていたんだよシュッここまでして隠さなきゃならないものが昔はねそれにさっきまでは Having finished her sandwich, Ryoko picks up some unsorted papers with her free hand and waves them into the air. Koji has the slightest idea what Ogai's secret might have been. From what Dioko said in the tunnel, however, he can guess that Fuminori is involved somehow. Dioko Dioko pulls several sheets of loose leaf paper from a different file. She sighs bitterly, then returns her attention to the papers in her hand. The icy certainty in Ryoko's voice sends a chill down Koji's spine. Ryoko doesn't respond as though she didn't even hear what Koji just said. Damn, A-Cab? I mean, actually, that's not what police are for. That's what this is what this is what courts are for. Police are for arresting people on suspicions until that can be that sort of truth can be reached. She hasn't spared Koji a second glance since looking at him earlier. Even while talking, her attention is always focused on the papers in front of her. Again, that's not the police's job, though. That's the court's job. I'm pretty sure... I mean, I see, I see what you're getting at. But I'm pretty sure if you accuse someone of murder to the police, they would arrest them. 
at least temporarily. I mean, I do see that point. I think she's just sort of misrepresenting what the police specifically do. Koji has no response. Can he really explain with cold, clear logic what drove Fuminori to do what he did? How can he convince anyone else when he doesn't even understand it himself? A heavy silence falls upon them, with only the soft rustle of pages turning in Diyoko's hand to mark the passage of time. Once again, Ryoko ignores Koji's question. This time, however, Koji doesn't back down. His silent glare demands her attention as she pours in through the documents before her. After some time, Ryoko rearranges the papers in her hands and sets them aside as though having come to some con conclusion. She then turns her chair to face Koji for the first time since he awoke. な、これから it was futile to argue with this woman, Koji realizes. Her values are fundamentally different from his own. Nothing he can say will ever move her. Koji gets out of the bed and stands on shaky legs. Koji looks at his watch and sees that it's 4 in the morning, which means it was already early evening when Ryoko rescued him. He can't believe that he survived in that well for almost two days. Now that the gaps in his memory have been filled and his sense of time has returned, he realizes it's already Sunday morning. Yoko's right, a lot of time has passed since he spoke to Yo on the phone. Koji grabbed a sports drink and two jelly packs from the bag of food that Yoko brought, then gra okay, and then heads through for the door. His legs are still a little unsteady, but he can compensate for that with sheer willpower. <laughs> Koji is expecting Ryoko to watch him go with that cold. No, excuse me. Koji is expecting Ryoko to, to watch him go with that cold, mocking smile of hers. Instead, however, she sighs heavily and rests her jaw in her hands. Koji 
体筑波が死んでると決めてかかってるあんたなら当然そう思うでしょうね In truth, Koji is extremely uneasy about going it alone. At the same time, however, he knows that he mustn't depend on Dioko. She has made it clear that she doesn't care about saving lives. Teaming up with her will only make it more difficult to salvage something, anything, out of this nightmare. I don't know if I'd say she doesn't care about saving lives, otherwise, she wouldn't have done anything about you being down there. It seems like she's just kind of brutally realistic about this. <laughs> She picks up some she picks something up from the table and tosses it to Koji. See, she's this is the thing. It's not that she doesn't care about saving lives, because she is actively trying to protect Koji here. Oh, when Koji catches it, he feels its solid weight fill his hands. Koji stares at the menacing shape of the cold metal. It's a revolver, the same what it's the same one that was clinched in Ogai's skeletal fist. If Koji were his usual cautious self, he would not hesitate to reject the dangerous offering. The only time you truly need a gun is when all hope is lost. He'd prefer not to fight a losing war. And yet, without even knowing it, Koji has already set foot into Ryoko's world. Choosing instinct over reason, he accepts the small but deadly weapon and stuffs it into his pocket. I don't know if that's the safest thing to do with no safety. There is no question that Koji intends to save Yo and bring Fuminori to answer for his crimes. In the back of his mind, however, you can hear the footsteps of Ruin approaching. I don't see this revolver being useful at all against Saya. When he steps out of the cabin's front door, Koji shivers as the wind tears into his skin. To his surprise, the outside air is even colder than the mud at the bottom of the well. Perhaps the, cr perhaps the cramped space mitigated the cold somewhat. If he had been exposed to this chill all night long, he sure would surely have frozen to death. Koji finds two cars parked in the yard. The smaller car next to his must be Ryoko's. When he sits behind the wheel of his car, he gets some relief from the feeling that he has taken the first step, however small, back into his world. He sips the sports drink, wetting his parched throat. Then I need to wet my parched throat. Give me a sec. All right, then washes down some jelly. He his stomach rebels at the rebels at the sudden influx of food after thirty six hours on empty, but he manages to force down the urge to vomit. Koji needs the energy, no matter how hard it is. He must regain enough stamina to overcome the challenges ahead. After forcing down as much food as he can handle, Koji leans back in his seat and takes a short break. When he begins to feel like himself again, he reaches into the back seat and pulls his spare cell phone out of his bag. He never expected that carrying two phones would be such a stroke of luck. So this is where it this is where it comes in. Okay. Remember when I pointed that out earlier? As he calls up Fuminori's number and prepares to hit send, Koji is overcome by a flood of emotion. Rage, despair, sorrow, pity. He is unable to decide what to feel towards his friend. Dude isn't your friend anymore. However, there is no time to dwell on the past. Every second lost diminishes the chance of saving Omi and Yo. Koji refuses to consider that it may already be too late. He steals, he steals himself and presses the button and holds the phone to his ear as it rings. The shrill sound seems to go on for longer than it has ev ever has in his life. Right now, Fuminori's phone might, must be displaying the name of the caller. Koji wonders what his reaction will be when he sees it. The call goes through. In the silence on the other end of the phone, Koji senses surprise, apprehension, and dark fury. Feeling slightly gratified, Koji delivers the first jab.
as Koji is about to answer, an idea suddenly comes to him. Yeah, this is the moment, this is the time where you just fuck with him. Oh, he's just telling the truth. But apparently he has a plan. He pauses to let that sink in. Then with satisfaction filling his voice, he says, What's your plan? You're just saying... You're just... Okay. Never mind. Because he's gonna lie about them being alive or something. Kuminori's gasp tells Koji the advantage is his. Keeping his voice bold, he decides to further exaggerate the truth. It's obvious from Fuminori's tone that rage has overwhelmed his reason. Koji's bluff is working perfectly. His victory is tainted, however, as Fuminori's response to the, the name Saya brings a cry of anguish from the corner of his heart that still wants to believe his friend can be saved. He mustn't allow emotion to sway him. Koji suddenly switches topics, trying to get Fuminori, keep Furi, Fuminori off balance. It all comes down to this. Kuminori's voice trails off. He's obviously trying to decide how far Koji can be trusted and whether there's room for negotiation. Kuminori has been called out and now it's time for him to show his hand. Kuminori pauses, then gives a knowing chuckle that sends chills up Koji's spine. Koji is relieved to learn Yo's location and that she is at least still alive. At the same time, however, he remembers that horrifying phone call. It is clear now that Fuminori played some part in Yo's suffering. Had she already fallen into his trap back then? What has happened to her and how is she being treated? Koji, Koji feels despair settle over his soul. How much lower will this man go? Must Fuminori seek out and destroy every memory of the friendship they once shared? Koji instinctively realizes that it's dangerous to push his bluff any further. He hangs up without waiting for a response. Fuminori doesn't know that Koji is still in the, at the cabin in Tochigi. Right now, he's probably worrying about whether Koji will show up in one hour or one minute. Koji hopes he will be able to take advantage of Fuminori's confusion. Three hours. That's how long it will take to race all the way back to Tokyo. Oh, oh my god. Based on what was described earlier, he's gonna... <laughs> he's gonna be speeded. His mind is clear, but his limbs still feel half asleep like they're weighted down by lead. Although he knows he had... Wait, 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 no, 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 no. I'm pretty sure they said three hours before, too. Never mind. Although he knows he has to stay resolute, Koji still longs for the peace he had just a few days ago when life or death struggles were the furthest thing from his mind. Back then, he never could have imagined himself fighting to rescue a friend from the clutches of a madman. With each passing moment, he feels himself becoming less like the person he was. When all of this is over, will he be able to return to his old life? Or will this change continue until it has consumed him utterly? 
Time is against him. Every second that passes is wasted. Even so, if he dis even so he decides to allow himself just five minutes of weakness. For exactly five minutes, he leans against the steering wheel and cries. And when his tears have run dry and his heart is calm, Koji starts up his car and drives away. It's good to give yourself that time. I'm glad they acknowledge that in the story. Okay. Okay. And then we're back to this. I stare at the silent phone in my hand. There is anger, of course, but something cold and heavy holds my emotions in check. A sense of danger. To be honest, I'm surprised at how calm I am. Ugh. Yo looks at me apprehensively, her head between my thighs. Okay. Just jerking him off the whole time. Perhaps... And you're telling me this didn't come... You're telling me our boy didn't hear this at all? What was whatever his name was. I'm so bad with names. Koji. The remaining fragments of her memory seem to have joined together and as she has regained some degree of speech. Upon realizing this last night, Saya began to to teach her language once more. I assume she finds her pet's efforts amusing. Still gazing up, up at me, please. Okay. Her ministration... Uh, uh, threatened to fill my head with a white flag of pleasure that would impede my thoughts and... Bes okay. First, I consider making her stop... When I gaze into her puppy dog eyes, however, I begin to feel differently. Thanks to Saya, I have a family once again. For the first time, I am becoming aware of the responsibility that places on me. I am now the head of a new Sakisaka house household, as well as its only male member. It is my duty to protect, comfort, and ensure the happiness of the women living under my roof. Should I even... A little, I'm a little bit worried about getting demonetized even from this audio alone, so I'm just going to mute it for a little bit. With that in mind, I know I mustn't show fear or confusion. That would only cause them distress. It is clear that I made a grave error when I failed to finish Koji off two days ago. Right now, I need to send my frustration and anger aside... Why did I even say demonetized earlier? What the heck? I, I don't even make money from this. Why did I even say that? What the... Okay. The behind the scenes this time it is 2.18am. But no, seriously. Why did I say that? I guess I meant... Like community guidelines. It's time to leave. I have no way of knowing when Koji escaped from the well. Or how much he has learned. Or how many people he has had contact with since then. Now that it is impossible to know how far the problem has spread, merely disposing of Koji won't guarantee our safety. Do I really have to listen to this and look at this while we're talk while the narration is going over something serious? When the enemy has poisoned your water supply, you can't take the risk that even one drop might remain. Your only choice is to stop drinking the water. Do we know who you're talking to? Saya returns from the kitchen, where she'd gone in search of a midnight snack. She's munching on her favorite, spare ribs. Purging myself of an unease and impatience, I respond with a casual shrug. But breaking the news suddenly and without any trace of anxiety, I am able to avoid the fright avoid frightening Saya. Instead, she is merely surprised. I knew that remaining calm would work. Moreover, I'm getting... Okay, okay. Saya lowers her eyes and strokes her chin thoughtfully. I 
Everything will be fine. I will protect my life with Saya just as I have up until now. I have that power. By the way, I'm sorry if that whole bit was silent. Um, I forgot that my desktop audio is still muted. And it's going to continue to be muted because the sound is still going on. But, yeah, I was just playing the dialogue. Knowing that we've overcome one problem fills me with a new confidence. By the way, Saya, I'm almost... Ah, wait, wait. Saya hastily discards her spare ribs. Spare ribs. Spare ribs. And pushes the still-sucking yo off of me. You know, you, you never... Okay. Ah, oh, goddammit. Despite her scolding tone, Saya... Okay. Okay, the sound is gone. It's adorable how Saya goes from angry to pleading like this. I find myself reaching down to muss up her hair. Don't worry, I won't. Now then, we'd better get ready. Okay. We can travel. We can travel light. Travel light and take the Suzumi family car. Oh, okay. We can travel light and take the Suzumi family car. I'd better withdraw everything that's left in my bank account and carry it as cash. I'll also need a weapon, something more reliable than a butcher's knife. Koji will most likely follow. He thinks that Yo can be saved. However, I'm not abandoning this house just to run away. As long as Koji knows our location, we're stuck on the defensive. Leaving gives me the chance to regain the initiative and deal with him at any at a place of my choosing. The next time we meet, I'll kill him with my own two hands. I'll make sure to wring every last drop of life out of his body. A shiver runs through me as I anticipate the battle ahead, and my bloodlust burns like an orgasmic fire. Is the game audio still that quiet compared to my voice? The heck? Uh, I guess I'll bring it down a little bit more. The desktop audio is at max, so that's not the factor. When Dioko looks up, the morning sun is already streaming in through the window. Tired from hours of poring over files, she removes her glasses and massages her aching eyes. Her dreams are always filled with horror, yet the night she just spent was more nightmarish than them all. It is not over yet. She has only just set foot on the threshold. As expected, the files left by Ogai Masahiko were not the sort Diogo could simply pick up and read. Fortunately, Ogai had been too old-fashioned to put his trust in electronic media. If he'd encrypted his files on a computer, she'd have to find a hacker to decipher them. In fact, he had not employed any co kind of code in his writing. That would have been too time-consuming by hand. The method of obfuscation he did use was quite simple. Of the files Dioku pulled from his underground lab, the majority turned out to be notes and theses from Ogai's days of a student. The more important papers were the diaries and research notes that had been scattered throughout piles of worthless scrap. At first, she was unable to understand the documents she had found. Each sheet was covered in text on one side and blank on the other. Each line was completely unrelated to the next, making it impossible to glean any meaning from the whole. The trick revealed itself, however, while she was sorting the pages that made no sense. She found that each line continued on the same line of a different page. In Ogai's diary, for example, the first day began on the first line, then continued not with the next line, but with the first line on the next page. Similarly, the second day was the second line, and the third day was on the third line, and so on and so forth. After filing all the, all the lines on one set of pages, 
Ogai had torn them out and scattered them among his other files. There was no regularity to how the pages were numbered, of course. Unable to locate any sort of key or legend, Nyoko had no choice but to figure out the page order manually. Okay, so if he didn't want these to be found after his death, why didn't he just, like, burn them all? I mean, maybe that's not the case. Maybe he didn't want them to be found while he was alive and, I guess, decided it didn't matter once he wanted to kill himself, but... Uh, okay, okay. Despite knowing that the task would be exhausting, Gyoko said to it valiantly. After separating all of the loose leaf sheets from the jumbled files, she began painst the painstaking process of linking pages together according to the, doc to the contents of their first line. She found that Ogai had dismantled and scattered his diary each time he completed a number of days equal to the lines on one page, and had done the same with his research notes every 30 pages or so. The diary was much easier to restore, because the entries varied in length, later pages had a larger number of blank lines. The page with only one line, however, was the last page of the diary, and those with the most blank spaces could be considered closer to the end. Yoko's perseverance had paid off, for she had already succeeded in restoring several volumes of Ogai's diary. As she reads them, she feels despair draining her spirit, as it has so many times before. This cursed feeling of powerlessness that comes with knowing hidden truths, those who have tasted it once, shall be beaten down by it again and again until the day they die. All secrets are connected, after all. Once you have glimpsed even the tiniest fraction of the world's true face, you have no choice but to watch in horror as the veil rolls itself back inch by inch. This sounds like Junibio stuff. All that remains is to wait for the day when insanity will crush your reason under its ever-mounting weight. I have succeeded in communicating- well, I wonder what the line sort of is between Junibio and Lovecraftian. I couldn't tell you. There's got to be some kind of gradient there. I've succeeded in communicating with the organism. It shows enormous curiosity, and its intelligence is beyond doubt. See research notes for confirmed vocal patterns in body language. Its appetite for knowledge is insatiable, and its learning speed is off the charts. However, it ex exhibits absolutely no desire to be recognized as an individual. Its ego appears to be quite weak, suggesting a psyche wholly unlike that of a human. The speed of the organism's linguistic development is astounding. Interesting that we just got a parallel to that. When I laughed at its mispronunciations, it immediately picked up the concept of puns. By laughing at its mispronunciations? What? Ever since, it had has been employing its entire vocabulary in an attempt to find puns that will make me laugh. Perhaps in a few days' time, it will have learned enough language for us to communicate freely. The organism's command of spoken language is now sufficient to facilitate higher-level discourse. Although it has regaled me with questions all day, it remains unable to answer any of mine. Its replies suggest that it has gained awareness only after materializing in this universe, it has no knowledge of where it came from. While I am disappointed, the fact that it has reached this level of intelligence only one week after starting to think tells me that there is no end to what I can learn from it. Hypothesis. It is not a naturally occurring organism, but was created by an even more sophisticated sentient life form. This would explain why it has no ego, yet possesses such a hunger for knowledge. It might not be any- it might be some sort of reconnaissance drone that was sent here from another world. Yoko smiles humor, hum humorously, humorlessly for the umpteenth time since she started reading. How wonderful it would be if she could laugh the diary off as the delusions of a madman or the work of a science fiction author. At last, she knows too much. When she thinks back to the many horrors Ogai brought into her life, the, wor well, the words before her take on a chilling credibility. I have confirmed that the organism's brain power far surpasses any human's. 
This morning, I taunted about prime numbers. After I explained the Lucas Lamer test for Mersen primes... Oh god, don't show me math, it'll kill me. It immediately began to list examples that it had calculated in its head. I was only able to confirm by memory up to number 10, M89, M89, whatever, but it continued to list further examples without any trouble. I left it to its calculations, and when I returned a few hours later, I discovered that it had written down more than 70 of them. Computers all over the world are currently working to calculate Mersenne Mersen, Mersen primes, but the last one I remember being found was the 39th back in 2001. Hold on. When I entered several of the results into my laptop and ran the Lucas Lamer test on them, I found that everyone was correct. The same is no doubt true of the rest. After all, the organism has never shown the pathological need for respect that would lead it to lie about its accomplishment. I see no reason to doubt its veracity. If I could reveal to the world an expedient method for discovering Mersin primes, the prize money would make me a billionaire. Of course, my current research is worth far more than any sum of money. I must keep it a secret. The organism's computational speed exceeds that of even the most powerful supercomputers. I can only conclude that its cognitive faculties are beyond anything humanity could imagine. At the organism's request, we have begun a new field of study. Despite its immeasurable aptitude for mathematics, it now desires to concentrate on sociology and the natural sciences. Perhaps our math problems are simply too elementary for it. It has shown, uh, it has shown especially keen interest in the means by which organisms reproduce and multiply, as it possesses nothing that could be called emotion. I hesitate to use this description, but when I learned about DNA, it seemed somehow, when it learned about DNA, it seemed somehow excited. In fact, the organism itself seems surpassed by its reactions. When asked about the nature of the of the impulse, the organism decided to label it as instinct. If this description is indeed accurate, then this is extremely significant development. I imagine if this is a scientific paper, it wouldn't say it seemed somehow excited, quote unquote. It would, it would list the, you know, the like w what it actually did. Whatever. It would mean that there was a deeper level to the psyche than just the knowledge it had, has acquired since coming to this world. If I can use this discovery to trace its roots, I might be able to learn what it truly is. Note, candidates for the plane and world of the organism's origin are discussed in my writings on the silver key filed separately. I spent the whole day carrying books into its room. Apparently, the organism is no longer satisfied by the knowledge I am able to impart. It should come as no surprise, considering its linguistic prowess, for the speed at which it consumes texts is, uh, is astounding. The diary continues for some time, chronicling the intimate relationship between Ogai and the organism. In the back of her mind, Yoko imagines the old doctor climbing down the well in the middle of the night to hold Congress with some inhuman creature in that bizarre laboratory. The image is disturbingly similar to the nightmares that have shattered the silence of many nights with her screams. What follows, however, makes even her worst nightmares pale, pale in comparison. The organism has made a very strange request. This is the first time it has asked for anything other than food and reading material. It wants sex. It can hardly believe it, but it wants to consume the sperm of living creatures. This is separate from its desire for food. Once again, it is describing this impulse as instinctive. Now that it has declared itself a life form that requires the seed of males, it has begun to identify itself as female. After today, I suppose I shall have to start calling the organism a she. I can't tell if that's... I can't tell if that's progressive or not. Is the personality that she has begun to exhibit really just an imitation created for her amusement? Ever since she started to immerse herself in our literature, she has been acting astonishingly human. 
She identifies herself as female and is al and already possesses an enormous store of cultural knowledge. Is she trying to create a human identity for herself based on these? I have seen her laugh, grow angry, and today she cried. Is she just copying our emotional displays? If not, then she is already is the soul something that any intelligent life form can acquire? I feel I am witnessing something more mysterious than the, than the genesis of life itself. Today is her birthday. Although it is a year late, I want to give her a special gift. Saya is, was the name of my mother's cat. In childhood, she was my sole friend and my beloved. I decided long ago that if I were ever blessed with children, I would give this name to my daughter. Happy birthday, Saya. Let this be the name of your soul. You have earned it. The ability that Saya has discovered in herself is showing more extraordinary results each day. I have no doubt that she is a kind of artist. What exactly is it that she created in her body from the rat semen I gave her? At this point, I can only surmise that it is a type of retrovirus, a reverse transcriptase enzyme that creates exactly what she desires. The rats that have been transformed by her art are so beautiful now. The enzymes secreted by her body and various appendages she uses are discussed in detail in my biological observations, filed separately. Here, I will say this. By witnessing Saya perform her op operations in several rats, I have gained much confidence in my theory that her body is designed specifically to manipulate the biology of other organisms. Yoko looks grimly at the still unsorted mountain of research notes. When she finally manages to separate those papers, she will probably find the many other files mentioned in the diary. Oh guys, biological observations at the very least. She wants to look through those before facing the thing called Saya. Under no circumstances does she want to go into a battle unprepared. She looks at her watch and sees that it's already 7 in the morning. Assuming Tono Koji made no stops, he should be arriving in Tokyo about now. Now that it's too late, she wishes she'd stop that stubborn fool from leaving, even if she had to shoot him in the leg to do it. Koji pulls up two blocks away from the Sakisaka house and stares at the silent building. In the bright light of morning, the house seems shrouded in a dark miasma. Like a black hole torn out from out of the landscape. Is it just a figment of Koji's imagination? Every window is closed, offering no glimpse of the inside. Koji has no way of knowing whether Fuminori is home. The pedestrian walks his dog home down the street, glancing at Koji through the windshield after he passes by. Koji isn't surprised by the attention. He hasn't bathed or changed clothes since spending the night buried in mud. He must look like a vagrant even inside his car. When he looks into the rearview rear mirror, he sees a haggard visage of a man with one foot in the grave staring back at him. It's hard to believe that the tired, unshaven face is really his. If he stays here for too long, someone might report him to the police. He better pull himself together and get moving. He drives slowly up to the front of Puminori's house, quickly checks to make sure no one is around, and gets out of the car. Anyone who might be in the house probably heard the sound of the engine, but there's no point in worrying about that now. Koji walks swiftly through the gate and yard to the front door. He puts his hand on the doorknob, foregoing the bell. The time for such pleasantries has passed. The door is unlocked, and the knob turns easily in his hand. He puts his ear to the door and listens for any sign of life. He's acting like a thief, he realizes, with some shame, but that is the least of his worries now. No sign, no sound from within. After checking the street again to make sure no one is looking, he quickly opens the door and disappears inside. An indescribable stink immediately assaults his nostrils. He is already prepared for anything, however, so rather than discourage him, the stench only sharpens his caution to a razor's edge. He has crossed this threshold many times in the past, and his memories of days spent here are still bright. So why? Why does he feel the same ominous, blood-chilling aura that permeated Ogai's home and cabin? Mm -hmm. Did we get earlier that Fuminori has already left? 
that he's not in the house anymore. If that's not the case, then I'm assuming he's gonna like shoot Saya and it's gonna come and Fuminoda is gonna see it as like obviously bullet wounds. It's not actually gonna like be that dangerous to her at all. But either way, it's gonna send Fuminoda into like a blind rage again. That's how I. That was my first thought anyway. Anger and sorrow sees Koji's heart as though a dear friend's grave has been defiled. Koji doesn't remove his shoes before entering. He knows why he's here, and it's not to be polite. Every storm shutter is closed, filling the house with gloom, and he can see nothing but pitch black darkness through the open doors in the hallway. He should have brought his flashlight from the car, he thinks ruefully, but then remembers that he dropped the light when Fuminori attacked him. It's still lying in the backyard of the cabin in Tochiki. The house might be empty, then again, it might not. Each particle of air of the air seems charged with silent malice with, with silent menace thank you is the enemy lurking somewhere in the darkness it's not hard to imagine Fuminori waiting for a, a chance to take him by surprise and finish what the well failed to koji walks down the first floor hallway then climbs the stair and checks the second floor too he moves slowly and carefully keeping his senses sharp but feels nothing watching him from the shadows after completing his round safely, he is convinced that the house is empty. He suddenly realizes that his right hand is touching the cold steel of a gun in his pocket. Did he intend to draw the weapon upon encountering Fuminori? Now that Koji thinks about it, his own actions seem mysterious to him. What is he planning to do when he meets Fuminori? Will he lay into him with curses and epithets? Will he force him to turn him in, or will he? Koji shakes his head. This isn't the time for such hopeless questions. If he thinks, keeps thinking, he'll stop moving. If he stops moving, fear will paralyze him forever. His only choice is to keep marching on. He has to close the distance to his prey. This is the first time that I'm actually considering one of these people's actions to be believable when they enter Fuminori's house. Yeah. In any case, Fuminori isn't home. What form their reunion will takes will probably be decided at the moment of their meeting. All Koji has to do is not hesitate when the time comes. Still, why does the whole house smell like stagnant water? It's been three months since Fuminori distanced himself from his friends. Just what kind of life has he been leading all this time? Koji enters the room and feels along the walls for a light switch. The moment he flips it on, the answer to his question is revealed. <gasps> How far has Fuminori gone? Koji realizes this is the first time he encount has encountered Fuminori's insanity in visible form. From the dust piled in the corners of the room, it is clear the paint was not applied recently. How many nights has Fuminori spent surrounded by this maddening array of color? Why, if such obvious signs were available, why didn't Koji realize that something was wrong before it got this bad? Was he deaf to the dying screams of Fuminori's sanity? Was their friendship really so worthless? He stands petrified in the unfamiliar living room. As he stands petrified in the unfamiliar living room, Koji directs his anger entirely at himself. If he could, he would like nothing more than to apologize to Fuminori for failing to help him through his suffering. Koji feels he might have been able to save his friend. Perhaps he is arrogant to think so, but if so, it is arrogance born of kindness. Koji passes through the living room and opens the sliding door that leads to the kitchen. When he enters, he finds the most disturbing finds that the most disturbing of the house's many stenches is strongest here. Blood. The room is red redolent with a smell of countless layers of blood grown stale over time. He peers into the well you sink. Around the rim he sees faint brownish red blotches that water alone couldn't rinse off. Even more obvious are the stains on the dish rag. Such stains are proof that the rag has been used and reused countless times. What could it have been used on to make that sickening, sickening burgundy color? Koji stares at the refrigerator next to the counter as though it were a monster waiting to swallow him whole. He stands motionless until he is able to work up the courage to simply touch it. Then he steals himself, grabs a thick candle, and opens the door. First he'll check the freezer, and then the refrigerator. The freezer is packed with frozen meat of varying shapes and sizes. 
as each piece is wrapped tightly and frosted over plastic, you can't tell what kind of meat it is. The meat in the refrigerator, however, has already been thawed for consumption. Oh, nice. For a while, he can only stare at, stare in disbelief at the five fingers beckoning to him from the back of the comp compartment. They are, they are the long, slender fingers of a woman, their bluish tinge giving them the, appearing, the appearance of waxworks. Koji is unable to remember what Omi's hands look like, even though he has kissed her fingers countless times. When he finished crying after his conversation with Fuminori, Koji promised himself that he would not cry again. In fact, he does not. He regrets his decision, however. He indulged himself too early. He should have saved his soothing tears for this moment, for now he knows that truly, knows that, that truly nothing is sacred. At last, his doubts about Fuminori have been utterly obliterated. Koji pulls Ogai's revolver out of out of his pocket and wraps his hand around its grips like he would a charm. Its definite presence, the promise of merciful annihilation, is the only thing keeping his sanity intact. He will surely use it to kill Sakisaka Fuminori, not for revenge, but not for justice, but to make this place, this world. Once more, a place governed by reason. For that purpose alone, he must eliminate the anomaly. He breathes deeply. He breathes deep, exhales, then lifts his hand before his face and stares at his bread fingers. All right, he's not shaking. He is prepared to face his new objective. Koji sticks the revolver back into his pocket and pulls out his phone. Oh, another choice. Okay. Am I not allowed to put this in? Oh, oh, what? Why am I not allowed to put this in? Oh, quick save. God, again. I have to just censor freaking the save menu because it, it has the image from the last choice in it. Okay, so let's think about this. He calls Fuminori or he calls Dioko. Okay, who is Dioko again? My freaking. I'm so bad at names. Was Nyoko the nurse? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, I wonder which one the game wants and which one is the, like, quote-unquote, bad end. Because I kind of want to do the shorter one first to get out of the way, you know? Um, I'm going to look it up, actually. I'll be right back. I am back, and it looks like the second ending is the Dioko choice. The ringing of her cell phone interrupts Dioko's labors. When she sees that the caller is Tono Koji, she unwittingly breathes a sigh of relief. Even over the phone, Dioko can hear the change in Koji's tone. His, his is the dull, flat voice of someone who has had all the energy beaten out of him. His first steps into Dioko's world had already brought him face to face with something particularly gruesome. In consideration of his probable state of mind, she decides to say nothing. With her understanding of Saya deepening uh, by the hour, Lyoko is able to make this declaration with a new confidence. <laughs> Koji, 
Koji's actions were rash, but there was no point in regretting them now. The more proactive approach would be to use the pressure that he's placed on Fuminori. Ryoko's involvement is still a secret that makes her a wild card. Depending on how she plays it, this advantage could be decisive. Is this going to be the ending where he actually does end up killing Fuminori, but it's the shorter one because it's not the direction the story wants to take? Lack of emotion in Koji's voice is actually reassuring to Ryoko. He's a machine now, able to do whatever it takes to accomplish a simple goal. The extermination of Sakisaka Fuminori. He is even willing to accept help from Ryoko, whose principles hardly mesh with his. A praiseworthy change indeed. After Ryoko hangs up, she gloomily counts the stacks of loose leaf that still need to be restored. There's no time left. She'll only be able to get the general picture. If she has to go into battle with only fragmentary knowledge, then there's one thing she absolutely must decipher. Ogai's biological reports, which should contain information on the strengths and weaknesses of the organism called Saya. That's what I was assuming as I was reading the sentence. All she can do now is pray for luck as she dives into the mountains of paper. Today was the first time I've been driven since my accident last summer. The proposition was always too dangerous to, re to consider given my inability to recognize roads and cars. Things have changed, however, in the three months I've had to adapt to my condition. I know what cars and pedestrians look like now, and even though I can't exactly see colors, I've learned to decipher lights and turn signals. I still can't read street signs, of course. Nevertheless, I managed to make it safely to our destination with Saya and Yo in the backseat. It was Saya who came up with the idea for a new hideout an abandoned building she discovered while living with Dr. Ogai. In these hillbillies, in the, these hillbilly suburban residential areas, it's not hard to find thick patches of undeveloped forest just off the beaten path. Saya's old playground is located in one such secluded area, unaffected by the flow of everyday life. It used to be a privately operated sanatorium hidden among the silent trees. After the owners went bankrupt, it remained unsold and was eventually forgotten. After I left Saya and Yo in the hideout, I returned to town to make some preparations. Now I'm finally back to our new refuge. I like this ruin from the moment I saw it. Mountains of constructed construction materials and garbage litter in the front yards, and a serviceable barricade. This place looks even less likely to, rece to receive unwanted att attention than our house. Since my brain sees humans as revolting monsters, places they've been tend to stink or seem covered in filthy slime. Ruins like these, long empty of life, are the places I find the most restful. To allow to them to let them know I'm not a stranger, then I go down to the basement where they're hiding. もう全然問題ない。一方通行の標識もどういうのか分かったし、スピード I'm a little worried that this abandoned building could become a hangout for biker gangs or homeless people. It doesn't bother me at all, I rather like it in fact, but of course, normal people would feel differently. Okay, I proudly unwrapped the weapon I just bought from the camping goods store. A one meter long wood axe, the biggest and sturdiest I could find. I'm 
I grip the axe with both hands, testing its dependable weight, then swing it like a baseball bat. The, steely, the deadly steel blade s sweeps through the air right where a person's neck would be. Yo. You sprawled out on the floor, flinches at the sound. For the next. Okay, I read that weird. The deadly steel blade sweeps to the air right where a person's neck would be. Yo, who's sprawled out on the floor, flinches at the sound and curls herself into a ball. I definitely wasn't expecting Saya to suggest anything so brutal. <laughs> you think? <laughs> okay, that's where you draw the limit. It must have slipped her mind completely. She smiles at the oblivious Yo as if to hide her embarrassment and says, An interesting parallel, because obviously he doesn't mind killing flesh bees, which are actual humans. So it's completely about his perception rather than any sort of ingrained moral code at this point. Should be obvious, but I guess Saya still doesn't understand. Kiro,が潰そうが平気なもんさ。人間には良心があるからね。どんなに憎い人間だろうと、人を殺すと思うと、ブレーキがかかるもんだ。そこが僕の挑戦でもある。本当に。Saya seems awfully subdued. I guess she's concerned about what'll happen when I have it out with Koji. Kaitakujan,あいつが上だし。普通に喧嘩したんじゃ勝ち目は薄いかもしれないけどね。でも僕にとっての化け物退治があいつにとっては人殺しなんだ。こいつは大きいよ。なんだか不安なんだよね。そういう心理戦っていうの確実じゃない
but that's part of what makes her so cute. Koji will come. I know he won't leave us alone. We could just keep running now that we've started, but I want to eliminate Koji as soon as possible. Therefore, when he con when he contacts me, I intend to meet with him unless it's an obvious trap. Humans are extremely dangerous and their filthy, stinking bodies makes me sick just being nearby. Ironically, however, nothing tastes better than their meat. I truly regret having to abandon our well-stocked fridge. Saya giggles happily at my praise. I find these childish qualities of hers adorable. Mm hmm, do ya? Because of the casual way she says it, I almost miss the emptiness to which her question leads. Saya's right. This won't last forever. No matter how safe this hideout might seem, we will have to abandon it eventually. The slightest mistake could put our life together in jeopardy. Just like when I failed to silence Koji. Some dumb kids might decide that this old ruin is a good place to test their courage, or this land might be targeted for new development. In order to be together with Saya, I have chosen to live apart from society. We will never find lasting peace in this world teeming with humans, not unless we can somehow escape from it. I pull Saya into my arms and fold my hands around her slender shoulders, then whisper, what deep and encouraging words. Saya smells softly, perhaps in resignation, perhaps in sadness. Either way, there is peace and contentment in her expression. I have no regrets. As long as I can hold Saya in my arms, I will gladly pay, pay any price. Oh, really? Because you're gonna spread. It sounds like a fairy tale, but for some reason she seems absolutely certain. I have no idea what Saya's prophetic words mean, but this isn't the first time she's said or done something mysterious. She's performed any number of miracles already. The hands of his watch move with agonizing slowness, as though counting down to the end of the world. In the hours since contacting Nyoko, Koji went back to his apartment, showered, changed clothes, and even had his first meal and first full meal in days. He wanted to take a nap knowing that he needed the rest, but no matter how hard he tried, excuse me, sleep never came. Forcing himself to relax only made his nerves colder and sharper. With nothing else to do, he decides to wander the city until nightfall. Downtown Tokyo is bustling. Surrounded by smiling pedestrians, bright lights, and windows decorated early for Christmas, 
It feels as if all the happiness in the world was gathered in this very place. Shoji takes it all in, burning the memory and burning it into his memory like it's the last thing he'll ever see. Is the world so beautiful because of the horrors that lurk in its shadows? The glow of the city can no longer warm him. Perhaps that is why it seems so precious. Shoji watches the city for hours. It feels unreachably distant, like reading the obituary of someone you loved long ago. His phone reads at eight, rings at 8 p.m. It's Yoko. The conversation is short. She hangs up as soon as they decide where to meet. And so ends Koji, Kono Koji's final night of peace. Yoko arrives at the dinner at at the diner at 1 a.m. One hour later than agreed upon. How is it even open? She has a heavy look heavy looking duffel bag under her arm. Koji doesn't feel like asking what the bulges represent. Guns. Okay. Yoko doesn't sound at all apologetic, but Koji decides to just nod expressionlessly. Only a few tables are filled at the sour, like lonely islands in the midst of a vast restaurant. After sending the bleary-eyed waitress away with an order of two coffees, Koji and Dioko are left all alone in the corner of the dining area. The silence that follows, Koji tries to soothe his parched throat with another mouthful of weak coffee. It's obvious that her grimace isn't for the coffee. Yoko tries to ignore Koji's question by nursing her coffee, but that only works until her cup is empty. Staring at the brown stain at the bottom of her cup, Yoko says, her voice hard and flat, Orego the things Fuminori had done are so horrifying that Koji's only recourse, his only hope of coping, is to kill the man who was once his friend. Yet despite that, Yoko makes this nightmare sound like just the beginning. Koji doesn't understand where the morbid cynicism comes from, nor does he want to. The brusque tone says that she doesn't care whether or not Koji is satisfied with her explanation. Koji considers Dioko's words calmly without letting himself get emotional like before. The final line, true, Fuminori is somewhere beyond that. Although Koji has gone far enough to be willing to kill Fuminori, he has no intention of eating his enemy's flesh once he's dead. That, at least, still separates the two. Then what about Dioko, who has treated Koji like an ignorant fool ever since she saved him from the well? How close is she to Fuminori? In response to Koji's bright, biting question, Dioko mocks look Dioko's mocking smile turns inward. Dioko pats one of her duffel bag's bulges. Dioko 
申し訳ないと思ってるよ私は両親にとっては自慢の娘なんだそれが金庫の銃を盗み出すなんてそうするだけの必要は先生にはあったいいや全然 A quick denial isn't what Koji was expecting. Oh, so it was a、um, long time ago. Yes, it was a long time ago. ベッドサイドに中を隠しておいたんだ。夜一人で部屋にいるのが耐えられなくてね。どんなに世界が底抜けにめちゃくちゃになっていこうと、悲鳴を上げて逃げ回る以外の選択肢が自分にはあるんだって。そう納得させるためにはね。Uji、oh. doesn't know what to say. He's amazed, impressed even. That someone with such a serious case of delusional paranoia could function as one of the T University's top doctors. So there's a tie stack, you know, not at the Amni Surunia, Nakaja Mada Tainaka. Kona Huni Jusin of Smirtone Sandanga Moto Kohani Tobichirio in that day, Sasoruka Matsunda Sonda. America de Mojuzai in our ties on and that is. One night out of three. At this point, Ryoko seems to have gotten everything off her chest. Smiling like someone who just finished a hard job, she adds. それでダメなら自分の口に突っ込んで引き金を引くっていう選択肢もあるし先生は<笑>専門家の治療を受けるべきだ That's a good line This is a good screenshot 端的な感想ありがとうでもね君だって他人事じゃなくなるよこれ以上先に進むんならね Koji is already doubtful that meeting with Ryoko was the right thing to do. One thing he and Ryoko had in common is an unwillingness to leave Fuminori to the proper authorities. Fuminori not only killed Koji's lover and friend, but went as far to defile their corpses. Koji isn't about to give him the chance to get off at, on an insanity plea. No matter what crimes he must commit, Koji will end Fuminori with his own two hands. If he doesn't, He knows he will never sleep again. It helps to have a partner, like, partner in crime, but only when that partner doesn't cause trouble. Ryoko talks big about exposing Ogai's secrets, but she might just have a head full of delusions. If so, Koji needs to rethink this whole thing. そこまで言うかなまったく。リオコ、スマークスのシェイクスのヘッドルーフォーリー、ポツアップノーフォーザーレジスタンス。シポツアスタックペーパーフォーマーバーグのハンセットコージー。ノーリスリーフシーツアーバウンドウィッシュリング。一行を読んだら、続きは次のページも同じようだ。まあ、触りだけでも読んでみるといい。As directed, Koji looks through the handwritten pages and gives up after less than three minutes. Koji deliberately scoffs at the document, doing everything he can to show contempt for what he just read. At the same time, he tries desperately not to remember the mountain of bones in Ogai's bathtub. And the unidentifiable smell permeating Fuminori's house. Fuminori's house. 
王外が使おうとした機材から察するに奴はそいつを P3 レベルのバイオハザードとして取り扱うつもりその程度の用心で十分だったのかどうかは近隣の住民を退去させるべきだったんだがまあそこは偉い人たちが偉い人なりに頑張って全部なかったことにしてくれたよその代わり私たちはキャンバス中のネズミを一匹残らず駆除する羽目になったネズミとかつてネズミだった何かをね The first meeting, Ryoko brushed Koji off when he asked about Ogai Masahiko. Now, however, she's telling the whole story, her voice as flat and emotionless as a machine's. Yoko pauses for a moment, then grins with self disdain so maniacal that it strikes Koji like a blow. As though fleeing from the quiet insanity that he keeps glimpsing in Ryoko, Koji finds himself paging through the loose leaf in his hands. He reads a line at random. The organism's flesh is not fibrous, but reticulated. Put simply, it is an extremely tough substance that expands and contracts not in one direction, but in all directions. That This means that slashing or piercing damage has very little effect. Since the flesh can contract in any direction freely, any wound would be sealed instantly. It's nonsense. What else can it be? If he lets himself believe it, then everything else, all the logical rules that define the world, will be rendered meaningless. <laughs> Ryoko reaches into her duffel bag, again, this time removing a stainless steel thermos that looks able to hold about 500... Uh, that those of liquid. Now that she's given up on persuading him, her ascent is swift and cold. In this moment, Koji's fate has likely ceased to matter to her. Despite the determination in her voice, Koji can't bring himself to touch to trust this paranoid doctor completely. Her reasons are similar to Koji's own. He doesn't want to bring a murderer to justice, nor does he want revenge for Omi and Yo. If he did, he could have left everything to the police. The reason he can't is that the villain is Fuminori. The man he believed was his friend has turned his whole world upside down. Everything and everyone with a part in this madness is to blame, and that includes himself for allowing the betrayal. This self-loathing, his desire to destroy, is what's keeping him on his feet. Koji nods, pulls out his cell phone, and calls his friend for what will probably be the last time. The call goes through quickly. Fuminori must have been waiting for it. Fuminori must have been quite anxious to hear from Koji. 
His voice is hard and completely emotionless. Koji can't help but smile at Fumino's disappointment. Perhaps Ryoko's maniacal sadism has rubbed off on him. He's lying, Koji thinks, remembering the contents of Fuminori's refrigerator. Just what part of Yo did you eat, huh? Did you carve out carve that poor girl up like a pig? Fuminori hangs up without waiting for Koji's response. Just like Koji, just like Koji did the first time. Yoko's praise sounds serious, drawing a glare from Koji. With those bold words, the Dioko grabs her duffel bag and rises from her seat. I'm probably going to go until we reach the ending here, and that'll be the end of this recording sesh. <laughs> okay. Even after Koji arrives at Y Station as directed, Fuminori calls him and makes him change the locations three more times. Koji is beginning to doubt that Fuminori is watching. He might just be using the time to guess when Koji arrives at each designated location. Nevertheless, Koji can't let his guard down. Fuminori might choose any moment to make sure that he's alone. If he makes a mistake and puts Fuminori on alert, Ryoko will lose her chance to take him by surprise. She'll just have to put up with a cramped trunk for a little while longer. After the nature preserve in the dry river bed, the fourth location to which Fuminori sends Koji is in the thick forest at the top of the foothills, high above the developed area at their base. This car's GPS shows a road that leads nowhere, but according to Fuminori, there should be an old abandoned sanatorium there. The park and river were emptied this late at night, but during the day would likely have considerable traffic. This time, however, his instinct is telling him that it's definitely a place that no one could find, not even by accident. It looks like this is the final stop. Koji drives up to the steep incline, soon leaving the residential neighborhood behind. See, this is the sort of moment where you could tell the police, right? You could inform them about this meeting coming up and how and be tr like be tracked at, at this moment right i don't know i guess it doesn't really matter with saya uh okay even though the hands of progress are right at its doorstep the undeveloped forest is darker than he has expected this looks like a great place to live in secret, or to kill someone and hide the body. Places like this, lost and forgotten, aren't found only in deep jungles and hidden valleys. Holes in the world are everywhere, even in the midst of civilization. That's true. A broken down gatepost suddenly appears in Koji's headlights, like a ghost rising from the darkness. It looks like this is the final stop. Ugh. I don't know, as someone... You know what? Never mind, never mind. I've, I've seen spots like this. I know they exist. He rolls up to the gate and turns off the engine, giving himself the silence of the forest. Or giving himself to the silence of the forest. His phone rings almost immediately. He doesn't need to check who it's from. Waga? He uses Waga? Fuminori is nearby, close enough to hear the sound of the engine. A shiver of excitement shoots up Koji's spine. 
Kuminori hangs up without another word. After grabbing his new flashlight from the glove compartment and checking that the revolver is still in his pocket, Koji opens the door, making sure to pop the trunk at exactly the same time. Yoko would, shouldn't need any more explanation than that. Realizing that the interior roof light will stay on and broadcast that the trunk isn't closed, Koji quickly unscrews the bulb, then gets out of the car and deliberately slams the driver's side door hard. Mountains of trash litter are... Mountains of trash litter the front yard, forming a serviceable barricade. Koji sees everything from small refrigerators and mopeds to huge chunks of concrete and plaster that must have been abandoned by construction workers. The fact that they could get away with leaving all this stuff behind shows just how remote this place is. Glancing sidelong at the rear of his car, Koji sees no movement inside the barely open trunk. Yoko knows what she's doing. She'll probably wait until Fuminori's attention is focused on Koji before making her move. The moon is brighter than usual, allowing Koji to walk through the front yard without tripping on debris. Staying alert, he heads for the building beyond the mountains of trash. Hmm, so I could see Yoko here basically completely ignoring the encounter between um, Koji and Fuminori and going straight for Saya whenever she pops out. I could see that. Just using that window as an opportunity to take out Saya if she knows how to. Something must be buried underneath the piles of garbage because the whole yard is filled with the sharp stink of chemicals. Even the homeless probably wouldn't come to this place. If you need to get out of the wind and rain, there are plenty of shelters more suitable. When he reaches the gaping, doorless entrance to the building, Koji glances back the way he came. His car, parked at the gate, is hidden behind the mountains of trash. Even if Fuminori is watching from inside the sanatorium, he shouldn't be able to see Ry Ryoko crawl out of the trunk. It looks like she'll get her chance to take him by surprise. How many times now has he stood like this, alone in some ominously silent place far removed from everyday life? life stink sneaking into the deathly quiet houses to find tr sneaking into deathly quiet houses to find traces of unimaginable happenings has become as normal as going to class the houses that he explored before were like freshly shed cicada shells empty and dilapidated both traces of the life they had sheltered this place however is different oh, excuse me a perfect ruin, its walls and pillars rising from the dark forest like an army of ghosts with no signs at all of people who once lived and worked here. The structure resembles a skeleton more than a shell. Time and the elements have stripped it of its formal sh former shape, and now there is only death. Koji has gone as far as he can. This must be the final stop. What will Fuminori's next move be? He must be planning to kill Koji, but how? Just as he's about to turn on his flashlight, Koji reconsiders. If he wanders around with the light on, he'll be broadcasting his exact location. That will give the advantage to Fuminori, who's probably lying in wait for him right now. He holds the light before him in his left hand, with his fingers poised on the sw switch. In his right hand, he raises the revolver, keeping it pointed in the same direction. Now ready to fire when he turns on the light, Koji steps quietly into the dark ruin. It takes a while for his eyes to adjust, but even when they do, he has only moonlight streaming through the empty windows to guide him. Everything appears gray and indistinct. However, Fuminori has to deal with the same conditions if he's hiding here. This is a battle of nerves, exhausting and deadly, where the first to make a sound and give away his position will lose. The rooms on both sides of the hallway are all open. Some are even missing their doors. Koji creeps up to each entrance, makes sure no one is inside, then carefully proceeds on. The stink that he noticed in the garden has changed. Now it smells more organic, like rotting meat. It's the exact same smell that filled Fuminori's house. The organism's flesh freely expands in a manner 
that renders piercing damage meaningless, meaningless, meaningless. Koji grits his teeth and forces the madman's words out of his head. What good could come of taking them seriously? This is not a time for something so useless. Squish. Koji freezes and stares down the hall. It was a wet sound that he heard just now, like someone dragging their feet through a swamp. And it came from the room at the end of the hall. Something is there. Something alive. Koji creeps toward the sound, his light and gun at the ready. Now it sounds like someone's squeezing mud through their fingers, and as he gets closer, Koji begins to hear breathing. Could it be Fuminori? No, that's impossible. He'd be waiting for a chance to ambush Koji, not making careless noise. As he proceeds, the strange sound coming through the cracks in the concrete walls grows clearer. Before he knows it, he is standing on the threshold. The room is filled with a thick, viscous darkness, just like every other room he's passed. There is more than just darkness, however. Something is there. He can hear pain breathing, like that of a wounded animal, and what sounds like sobbing. Sobbing? Koji whispers into the darkness. Now that he's given away his position, he might as well turn on his light. For some reason, however, Koji feels that to do so would have disastrous consequences. The last time I heard her voice on the phone, she was sobbing. The wheezing suddenly, suddenly stops. And then, a whisper comes out of the darkness. Though not a human voice, not by any measure, it speaks blasph some blasphemous semblance of human words. A nightmarish flash of insight connects the dots in Koji's mind. Can't be. Yo doesn't sound like this. She doesn't smell like this. But if it's not Yo, how does it know his name? Why is it picking him for help? No, it can't be Yo. She's human, not some creature that slithers and hides in the shadows. The thing wriggles closer. His reason cries out, imploring him to switch on the light before it's too late, or to turn and run if he cannot. But Koji is unable to make either choice. He can only call out in vain to the amorphous shape in the darkness. Something soft and slimy slides over Koji's toes. Instinct overrides his will, forcing him to turn on his light and shine it at his feet. The white beam reveals everything. The merciless truth that finally shatters Koji's sanity. Why doesn't he have his light in the CG? Terror wipes his mind, but of all but two words, gun and trigger. His finger responds with instant obedience. There is an explosion of light and sound, both more intense than he anticipated, but then the destructive forces are swallowed up by the darkness. His ears are still ringing from the bang, but he hears a weak voice coming from the shadows. Oh, god damn it, you only have four bullets. Koji screams and pulls the trigger again and again, certain that salvation can come only from the barrel of his gun. Light and darkness, explosion and silence. They dance before him three more times. Koji doesn't even need to aim. The horrible creature is right at his feet, far too close to miss. Yoko warned him many times how many bullets were left in the gun, so that information had already been driven from his mind. Even after the cold, heavy gloom wraps itself around him once more, Koji keeps pulling the trigger like a man possessed, paying no heed to the clicking of the empty weapon. His panic-stricken legs suddenly give out, sending him down hard on his backside. Even then, he keeps firing the empty gun. He knows no other way to erase the memory of the thing that he glimpsed in the beam of his flashlight. The light which fell from his hand during the attack is now pointing in a different direction. And all four bullets must have hit their target. They were Koji's last card. And though all four bullets must have hit their target, they were Koji's last card at play. To play. Which leaves him alone in the darkness with no way to defend himself. 
And just as he realizes this, a mass of rotting flesh rolls over him like a tidal wave. He can no longer even scream as the thing pushes him onto his back. Beer seizing his throat in an iron grip, Koji struggles desperately against the monster as it crawls up his body toward his face. Oh, jeez. Covering his face with his left hand, he scrabbles wildly along the floor with his right, searching for a way out that doesn't exist. His mind is that of a feral animal, empty of everything but primal terror. And that is why, when his right hand closes around something hard at the last moment, he recognizes it instinctively as a weapon. Putting every ounce of strength into his arm, Koji swings the heavy object at the creature in front of him. He hears the thud of a blunt object striking something soft and wet, and then Koji's attacker rolls off him. As soon as he is able to move again, Koji leaps to his feet and grabs the new weapon with both hands, brandishing it like a charm. Again, the same turn of phrase, to ward off evil. Only now that does he realize that he's holding a rusty steel pipe. I mean, this is just the start of Itai, or It Hurts. She's still trying to say the same thing. The monster is still sobbing. With a cry that is part scream, part roar, Koji raises the steel pipe and brings it crashing down on the cowering creature. He hears a wet sound and feels the blood chilling sensation of thick, soft flesh absorbing the blow. What is this background? Looks like a sky, and that's definitely not the situation. These combine to evoke an instinctive loathing that wipes his mind of all but the urge to destroy. Consumed by the same desperation in which he kept firing the empty gun, Koji rains blow after blow upon his enemy. After the 10th blow, it stops sob sobbing. After the 20th blow, it stops moving. And after the 30th blow, it begins to feel and sound more like he's beating a puddle of viscous liquid. Koji doesn't stop thrashing the creature until he recovers enough of his senses to realize that whatever it might have been before, it is now nothing but a corpse. The pipe in his hand, covered with an uni with unidentifiable fluids and uh, unidentifiable fluids and filth, suddenly feels unbearably heavy. <laughs> Kyoko's voice plays in the back of his head, and at last he knows how merciful her warning was. Now that his eyes are as open as hers, he is able to laugh in contempt of his own foolishness. When he years of memories in the light of the sun, they were indeed precious to him, then he never should have come to this place. The black flames of despair rise within him, consuming fear and revulsion and pity. Only rage and hate remain. Every cell in his body cries out for vengeance for the blood of the man who poisoned him with the with truth and tore him from the womb of innocence. And then Koji, slave to hate, hears the sound of someone sneaking up behind him. Koji whirls, whirls, swinging his pipe with all the force he can muster. His enemy hastily leaps back to avoid the strike, surprised by his failure to catch Koji off guard. Twisted shadows dance in the beam of light on the floor. Readying his pipe for the next blow, Koji faces off against his second attacker. Before this moment, Koji could have never imagined he would ever speak his friend's name with such hatred. And now, Fuminori is smiling, as though the huge axe in his hand is just a sick joke. Koji sneers too, unable to contain his contempt for the notion. Koji at the blade of Koji's- Oh, is this paddle music? <laughs> yeah, it is. 
The blade of Fuminori's axe carves a murderous arc through the darkness, glittering menacingly in, th in the faint light coming from the floor. Koji rages, raises his pipe to block the ferocious swing. The heavy impact numbs his arms, but his large frame takes the blow without giving any ground. Fuminori presses the attack, delivering a second blow and a third. His axe, designed for chopping down trees, is deadlier and more durable than the piece of pipe Koji found discarded on the floor. Each strike Koji blocks sends the chunks of rust flying from his makeshift weapon. He can't win as long as he's on the defensive. He needs to create an opportunity to attack. Koji blocks a crushing downward swing, then pushes back hard before Fuminori can pull away, throwing him off balance. This is where you kick, dude. Fuminori stumbles backward, then plants his feet to steady himself, taking advantage of his opponent's... Yes! Taking advantage of his opponent's temporary immobility, Koji delivers a punishing low kick to Fuminori's outer thigh. Fuminori grunts in retreat, swinging his axe wildly to prevent Koji from following up with another attack. Koji, however, does not press his advantage. He just stands where he is, calmly spearing Fuminori with his stare. Fuminori roars and comes with another attack, but the damage to his right leg seems to be slowing his swing. Easily blocking the axe with his pipe, Koji waits for Fuminori to exhaust himself. Fuminori des delivers blow after heavy blow, howling savagely all the while. While he does not realize, however, but what he does not realize, however, is that the situation favors composure, not brute force. Well, Fu when Fuminori raises his act, th axe high, th for bah! when Fuminori raises his axe high for another attack, he Koji sees that his movements have grown dull enough. Seizing the opportunity, Koji charges into Fuminori's rage and grabs the haft of the axe with his left hand. As Fuminori recoils in fear, Koji swings his pipe hard at his enemy's unprotected side. He feels the crunch of ribs breaking. <laughs> the, delivering... the pain drives... I don't know where I got that. The pain drives Fuminori to his knees. Staring down at Fuminori's defenseless head, Koji, surprised by his own lack of emotion, raises his pipe high to deliver the finishing blow. Which is when something wraps itself around his left ankle. The instant Koji panics at the unexpected sensation, something soft yet strong winds itself around his white right leg and drags him to the floor before he can resist. He twists his body and tries to swing the pipe at the unseen enemy behind him, but his right hand too is seized by some flexible force. He wasn't able to feel it through his pants, but now his blood turns, it turns to ice at the cold, slimy sensation at the thing, of the thing wrapped around his uncovered wrist. That monster's still alive? Saya. Even while kneeling on the floor, his face twisted in pain, he manages a terrible, victorious grin. Saya. This monster is Saya. Okay, where is Ryoko? Koji struggles desperately to free his limbs from the creature's slimy grip. But more tentacles swarm over his body, stealing his freedom of movement. <laughs> The horror has already driven Koji half mad. Just imagining the creature's appearance is enough to send him into a mindless panic. His scream is suddenly cut off as the slimy appendages seize his throat. This most deadly tentacle isn't just cutting off his windpipe, it's trying to snap his neck and it's getting tighter. One sec. Sorry about that, I need a drink. Koji is certain that this is the end, but just as his vision begins to dim, an explosion brings him back to his senses. Oh, here we go. With a horrifying inhuman scream, the creature releases Koji and retracts its tentacles. First thing he sees after regaining mobility is Ryoko running through the hall with a smoking shotgun in one hand and a silver tube in the other. Yoko responds by tossing him the tube, but though still lying on the floor, he manages to catch it out of the air. It's the thermos she showed him at the restaurant, the one she called her secret weapon. Yoko shouts to Koji, at the same time 
She aims her gun at Fuminodi, who's still on his knees five paces away. The double barrel shotgun still has one shot loaded. The monster that attacked Koji is writhing in agony. It hasn't yet recovered from Yoko's shot, but he's still but he's already seen that bullets aren't enough to kill these creatures. Now is his only But a pipe was? Forcing himself to be calm, Koji stands and carefully unscrews the lid of the thermos. There's no question in his mind that something extremely potent is inside. As soon as it is unsealed, a thick white mist pours from the thermos, and the surrounding air turns freezing cold. Instantly guessing what's inside, Koji lobs the thermos at the pile of flesh convulsing on the floor. The thermos seals through the air. It's liquid nitrogen, isn't it? The thermos seals, sails through the air, spewing, spewing white fog like a baptismal font showers its liquid contents upon the hellish creature. Its scream this time is incomparable to before. The monster crashes in agony, wreathed in white smoke. It scream, its screams are joined by Ryoko's cackling. <laughs> Perhaps the joy of vanquishing her nightmare was worth the last remnants of her sanity. The manic glee blazing in her eyes can belong to only a shattered mind. Okay, shoot him now. Shoot the dude now. We know these staggers to his feet, roaring black curses. His rage seems to have drowned out the pain in his broken bones. Yoko is not one to underestimate the threat posed by his axe. Her mad laughter fades away, leaving only a cold smile as she pulls the trigger. With a sh sh short burst of dark flame, Ryoko's gun sputters and dies. Ryoko is not an expert on firearms. It never occurred to her that the shotgun shells need proper store. <laughs> okay, need proper storage. And besides, she had always expected that any situation where her gun would be necessary would also be the one that she would not survive. Oh, okay, it's a little bit stupid. Cursing in anger and dismay, Yoko breaks the shotgun open and awkwardly pulls the dud out. Meanwhile, Fuminori stalks toward her like a vengeful demon, head of his ass screeching as it drags along the floor. Why are you dragging it on the floor? That's it's friction. That's not gonna. Okay. I have to stop him. And also, the position your body would have to be in. That's not optimal for running at someone with him. That you're trying to kill. I have to stop him. Koji's. Koji tries to charge Fuminori, but only succeeds at sending himself sprawling. One of his shoes is stuck to the floor, frozen by the liquid nitrogen. I was right. As Ryoko fumbles in her pockets for a new shell, Fuminori closes the distance and raises his axe in both hands. Koji curses and rips his shoe free of the frozen concrete, but he knows that he'll never make it in time. Ryoko thrusts the new shell into the chamber of her shotgun and snaps closed, then looks up at her target. Fuminori is right before her, too close to evade, and his axe is already crashing down with the wind howling in its wake. Sound of bones shattering, tendons snapping, and flesh tearing blend together in foul harmony. A thick blade enters through Ryoko's left shoulder, plowing through her collarbone and shoulder blade, smashing several ribs and popping her along like a balloon before sto stopping in the center of her chest. Her expression frozen in shock by the impact, she sprays a geyser of blood from her mouth. She should have died instantly, but through some un unimaginable force of will, Yoko clings to life for a few seconds more. Grinning through bloodstained lips, she raises her shotgun. Not to the front, but to the side. Beyond the barrel of her gun, wearing 77 degree Kelvin mist, like a uh, white cloak of death, is the weakly wriggling Saya. Yeah, Fuminori's screams vanish. Fuminori's scream vanishes into the roar of the shotgun. The destruction is absolute. The impact of shotgun pellets obliterates the half of Saya's body that fell prey to the liquid nitrogen. The frozen particles of Saya's shattered flesh drift to the floor like snow. Even the creature's special biology is insufficient to seal a wound of this size. I knew her priority would be Saya but I didn't expect it to be in this kind of situation. From the opening pour its internal organs, a tide of liquid slime and fat whose color is far too foul to belong to any living creature. 
The monster convulses, wailing in a weak, pitiful voice. Saya. With his axe still buried in Ryoko's body, Kuminori stares at the dying creature, his expression utterly devoid of emotion. Koji grabs his pipe and prepares to attack Fuminori from behind, but freezes when he sees the emptiness on the face of the man he hated. Fuminori pulls his axe out of Ryoko's corpse, then looks at Koji with glazed eyes. There is no recognition in them, nor hate, nor rage. When Koji meets Fuminori's blank stare, he knows. There is nothing left in him to kill. Fuminori grips the axe closer to its head and raises it high, the blade towards his face. Koji doesn't know whether he should interfere, but even if he wanted to, what, he, what could he say to stop Fuminori? Fuminori pulls, back, pulls his head back slowly, then drives his face into the blade of the axe like a spring-loaded toy. Crunch. The skull caves in with a dull, wet sound, and the spray of blood catches Koji in the face. Despite Fuminori's utter lack of hesitation, his first attempt at suicide succeeds, only in transforming his face into a hash of crimson. Fuminori pulls his head back one more time, even slower than before. With every ounce of strength still left in his body, he slams it into the bloodstained axe. The sound is wetter than before. Fuminori's body goes limp and tumbles face first into the floor. Koji stares at the two mangled corpses for a while. He feels completely left behind, like he can't remember why he's standing in this place with a steel pipe in his hand. The stale air filling the ruined building becomes choked with the stench of blood and the crimson puddles gradually spread across the snow-covered floor, yet the tranquility of the scene makes it seem like a painting. A soft, slimy sound breaks the silence. Koji looks at the mortally wounded monster. The creature is on death's door, but even so it moves. Slowly, feebly, it drags its broken body through the sea of blood. It's coming for Fuminori. Koji had forgotten his anger, but now it comes surging back at full force. He growls and stabs the monster with the end of the pipe. Can you stab something with a pipe? It convulses in agony, but it keeps crawling toward Fuminori. Koji explodes into a frenzy of rage. Again and again, he smashes the helpless flesh beast with his pipe. Something tells him that if he does not stop it here, he will truly have lost. The monster, however, never succumbs. It struggles on beneath his blows until it finally reaches Fuminori's corpse. Koji keeps swinging, his fury unabated, even as tears start to pool in his eyes. The monster's slime flies through the air, joining the blood already covering his face. The creature extends one thin, trembling tentacle to Fuminori's shoulder, then lovingly caresses his bloodstained cheek. Then it stops moving. Even in its final moments, the monster would not let Fuminori go. It died, joined with him. At last, Koji knows that the world he loved is gone forever. Um... Chunks of her body are missing, though something's been nibbling on her. It makes her look a lot thinner. She's been worried about her weight recently, but sh now she shouldn't need to diet. <laughs> he sounds amused, but it's hard to tell from his expression since his face has been cleaved in two by an axe. Omi and Yo laughed at Fuminori's dumb joke. Yo never used to laugh with such exuberance. She seems truly happy now that she and Fuminori are officially together. おみちゃん、すごくない。容量はバットとそう変わるもんじゃないけどな。思い切り振り回して、物頭の重さに任せて叩きつける感覚とか。フミノリにそう言われたもんだからさ、騙されたと思ってやってみたわけよ。そうし
私も見てみたいなオミちゃんが食べられるところ Ah, that's it. When he sees Yo's envious smile, Koji realizes what's bothering him. Yo tilts her head quizzically like she doesn't understand what he means. Oh, of course. Koji looks down and is satisfied to see wriggling tentacles where his arms and legs should be. When he opens his eyes, his mattress and pillow are soaked in sweat. It's always the same nightmare. He doesn't know how many times he's had it, but at least he's not leaping out of bed screaming anymore. He sits up, clutching his throbbing head. It's four in the morning. He hasn't had nearly enough rest, but he probably won't be able to get back to sleep tonight. Time for a smoke. A full pack will last him until dawn. Now, where did he put the pack he bought yesterday? Koji wan wanders sleep sleepily into the den, where yet another old friend is waiting for him. <laughs> Yoko's chopped up corpse is sitting at his dining table, looking as deathly pale as ever as she sips coffee from a mug. Hallucinations like these are easier to deal with than elaborate nightmares like the one he just had. They should probably worry him more, though. Ryoko chuckles, smiling with the same cruel manic smile that she used to when she was alive. Her left arm hangs from her half-severed shoulder, dangling like a forgotten wind chime. The corpse shrugs her intact right shoulder and grimaces in disgust as she takes another sip of her coffee. She's probably right. Everyone dreams at night. No matter how dim the memories may get, your nightmares will always be the nightmares will always be there to tear into Koji with fresh fangs. I'll take this moment this is one statement to assert the fun fact, I guess, that everyone dreams at night. That's a there's nobody who does not have dreams. Everyone has three to seven dreams a night. And if you say you don't have dreams, you're lying. Or, more likely, you just didn't know that fun fact. Okay. This insanity that has taken root in his heart will grow, eventually consuming everything that's left inside of him. Koji nods, smiling confidently, then stands and walks to the bathroom where he retrieves the weapon that he keeps hidden behind the mirror. Oh, guy's revolver, the one souvenir Koji brought back from the other world that night. In the mirror, Koji sees Yoko with her axe of flinted gash reversed. She raises her mug in a toast to Koji's resourcefulness. This time, it's Koji who shrugs his shoulders. He uses both, exercising his privilege as the survivor. The corpse in the mirror nods, nods sagely, her smile approving. There is a brief silence. Koji doesn't really feel like getting all melancholy with a dead woman. 
ねえ先生いい加減ファミレスのコーヒーはやめましょうよなんなら新しいの入れますから When Koji turns around halfway through his sentence, he realizes that the room is empty, but for the silence of the night. And so, Koji returns to the world of the Saiyan. He lights his first cigarette of the night, then takes a deep drag. While sitting alone in his den, puffing on his smoke, he stares at the gun in his hand. He knows how, just how precarious a cliff he's standing on. The final line which Ryoko spoke is now one step behind him. Koji no longer has anything to protect his soul. Now that Ogai Masahiko's fantasies and Tanbo Ryoko's delusions have all become tangible horrors, he knows what insanity and despair truly are. Back in the real world, Sakisaka Fuminori is wanted for several gruesome murders. It didn't take long for someone to discover that the stockpile of human meat in the empty Sakisaka it didn't take long for someone to discover the stockpiles of human meat in the empty Sakisaka and Suzumi homes. And the two refrigerators were in the two refrigerators were found the remains of Suzumi Yosuke, his wife and daughter, and Takata Omi. They found the clothes and other effects of Tsukumayo, but were unable to locate any trace of her among the various body parts, a fact that made Koji's nightmares all the more vivid. Dr. Tanbo Ryoko of the T-University Hospital vanished mysteriously around the same time. Because she was Fuminori's chief physician, the police have been investigating her connection to his crimes. As for the two corpses secretly buried in the backyard of a certain ruin, well, they'll probably never be found and this incident will become just another cold case. Koji alone knows what really happened and he has no intention of revealing it. Not now, not ever. Ogai's writings were not nonsense, which means that everything else was. What fool was it who said that men are lords of creation? Those who can believe in paltry things like human wisdom and valor are those lucky innocents who have not looked into the abyss. Koji can no longer share in their blessed ignorance. He knows he has been defiled by the insanity called truth and will never believe again. He has been poisoned, as Ryoko's ghost said. If, it, if he has been poisoned, as Ryoko's ghost said, then that poison is none other than the truth itself. Just as pure oxygen is harmful to the body, the naked truth has the power to destroy men's minds. Only by diluting it with lies and taking it in small doses can humans maintain a healthy soul. That, without a doubt, was the comfort that she had kept hidden in her bosom. The only thing that allowed her to face her dreams each night. Koji has taken his predecessor's lessons to heart. He's prepared for anything. One bullet is always behind the bathroom mirror, promising him salvation. Okay, so that's that ending. interesting i'd say more about it but i have been recording for almost three hours just in this session alone and i recorded another one to two hours earlier so i'm a little bit pooped maybe when i return i'll have more thoughts for you is this freaking this is conical music that's her name, right? Damn. Well, I guess that's it for this recording session. I'll see you guys in a few seconds. Hello, welcome back. I am back from a very bad day at work, so hopefully some Sayano Uta can cheer me up. And I hear that the final ending that I have to get is actually kind of short so hopefully we'll be able to do it in this sitting while I still have time but before that I believe I said something about giving my thoughts on the previous ending the next time I recorded so I guess I'll be doing that now so 
part of it sort of runs into a problem I am tentatively calling the survival horror protagonist problem with um, Koji, which is that once you get deep into the weeds of survival horror, any protagonist to fill the sort of role of protagonist, any character you could put into that role, tends to end up acting in exactly the same ways. And we don't really get to understand them very well as their own complex person. And we did have hints of Koji's personality coming through. But ultimately, he kind of just felt like a flesh suit there for the plot. Um, which I definitely kind of felt that way about several characters throughout the story and in this ending in particular. But... That's neither here nor there. I still enjoyed it, and I thought that it was fairly well paced. Um, some of the info dumps were a little bit weird because it's just they just give us that info and then sort of don't really return to most of it. I guess. I mean, I guess most of it is just backstory and lore stuff and stuff that you could sort of go back to to reference when thinking about other parts of the story, but. It felt like there wasn't, I don't want to say there was not that much of a payoff for it because they did find the method for killing Saya, but still, I wish Dr. Ogai's whole thing could be delved into a little bit more, and I don't know how much they're going to do with this final ending because apparently it's not that long. Um, but that aside, I did enjoy the sort of perspective of the themes that we got at the end which is that the whole you the whole how humans deal with truth idea that this story has been getting at i don't want to delve too much into it because first i haven't fully parsed my thoughts on it and second we're not at the end here yet so i won't but i did find it interesting the kind of contrast that we got with I guess uh wait, his name is already disappearing Koji with trying to handle the truth in small doses as he says and throughout this whole bit has how he is constantly pursuing the truth in a way although it doesn't really add up mostly he's just pursuing revenge but I guess you could see it more with the character of Dioko and her pursuit of the truth, um, despite knowing the consequences it has on her and her way of living. Um, and you have that versus Fuminori, who is actively accepting lies. Uh, he knows that Koji is human, for example, but chooses to just see him as a monster, the same way he sees Saya as a human. He knows that it's not true but he gives in to it anyway and the fact that he is sort of the villain of the story i think says a lot about the direction that they want to take the themes in so yeah those are all my thoughts i guess that i could give out at this moment so let's just get into it and i'm actually going to pause the video now so that i don't have to give future me even more work with censoring out the save load screen so i'll see you in a second here we are at this choice and apparently this is typically seen as the true end despite i think being shorter than the other end so um, let's just get into it it's time to finish this just as he promised earlier koji calls fuminori again the call goes through immediately fuminori must have been waiting for it as soon as Koji responds, a shrill ringing, ring, ring, ringing fills the house. Startled, Koji spins around and looks into the hallway. The house phone is flashing to signal an incoming call. This song is very loud, isn't it? Koji fell for it. Fuminori is the one calling the house. Now he knows exactly where Koji is. Hmm. 
Okay, so wait, okay, it's time to finish this. Get my music mag. Oh, yes, 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 I understand. He must have predicted that this would be Koji's first stop, and that Koji would call him upon finding it, it empty. Koji keeps his voice bold to conceal his horror. When did Fuminori become so cunning? When did you become so stupid? Just kidding, you were always not that smart. Koji no longer feels sadness or horror when faced with Fuminori's inhumanity. There is only the cold desire to kill the creature speaking such revolting words from his friend's voice. Koji had already abandoned hope, but it's still a shock to hear of his lover's brutal end. It's obvious that this deal is a sham. In all likelihood, Fuminori is planning to kill him and bury his secrets forever. Moreover, Koji doubts that Yo is even alive. Her meat could very well be somewhere in the refrigerator in right in front of him. However, Koji isn't particularly interested in Fuminori's true intentions. After all, he has no intention of making a trade either. His only goal is to get close enough to destroy Fuminori and whatever is pulling his strings. Fuminori hangs up without waiting for Koji's response. Perhaps Fuminori too has sensed his opponent's intent. If so, then he has realized that Koji is not just the hunted, but the hunter as well. So we're like duelists maneuvering for an advantage. Koji smiles grimly as he pockets his phone. It's not astounding how much their relationship has changed. The question is whether or not to comply with the 7 o'clock rendezvous agreement. If this were a serious negotiation, then it would be wise to avoid preempting Fuminori in any way that could provoke his anger. What Koji and Fuminori are really doing, however, is trying to lure each other into a deadly trap. Koji doesn't know what Fuminori plans to do between now and then, but he's not about to let his enemy keep the initiative. The fierce bloodlust that has taken root in his heart is more than enough to energize his exhausted body. Koji leaves the death-filled house, his stride more determined than before. Is he not gonna contact Ryoko this time? Today was the first time I'd driven since my accident last summer. Wait, is this? Yeah. I've seen this before. Oh, so he still has the hideout. Yeah, 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 that makes sense. Is there a way to skip? Oh, okay. Oh,あれから電話があってさ。とりあえず関係ない場所に誘い出したら少し散らしてやろうと思ってね。やっぱり暗くなってからがいいよね。あ、これは読み 
うん、<笑> Yeah, I've, I've read this before. Ah. Okay. Koji has nothing to do but wait. He has spent almost half a day in the dark, empty study, breathing stale air choked, breathing stale air choked with mold as he strains his ears for the slightest hint of the movement below. Of the movement below, few people can en endure such a vigil, but Koji has accomplished it without complaint. If anything, the suffering is welcome, for it keeps his nerves honed to a razor's edge. Without a doubt, his single-minded focus is the only thing allowing him to push the limits of his stamina. Koji understands this and embraces the pain. His closest friend has shattered his world li like glass. And now Koji only feels hate towards the madness that has replaced it and towards himself for allowing it to happen. Self-loathing self is a more reliable source of willpower than any faith or resolve, no matter how noble. When he arrived at the old guy house, Koji snuck inside carefully, hoping or p hoping to perhaps take his enemy by surprise. It was only after he got inside that he realized the house was still abandoned. Even so, Koji was sure Fuminori would arrive earlier than promised in order to set up an ambush. However, the light streaming through the windows turned red, then faded to darkness with no sign of anyone coming. Koji's patience has grown weaker and weaker by the moment. And now the appointed time has arrived. Just as Koji's frustration is about to peak, his phone begins to vibrate and flash. It's from Fuminori. He's calling rather than sh he's calling rather than show up himself. Rage threatens to overwhelm him for an instant, but Koji manages to keep his voice calm as he answers. Koji <laughs> leaps out of his chair and kicks it across the room, unable to find any other outlet for his rage. He has no choice but to do as Fuminori says. His stamina is already exhausted, only his obsession is keeping him going. If he allows himself even a moment's rest, he fears he'll never again find the strength to face his madness. Tonight is the only chance to kill Fuminori. Koji knows, of course, that his enemy is planning to ambush him. Fuminori isn't going to fight fair, but then neither is Koji. With the unsteady stride of a man half asleep, Koji leaves the Ogai house and heads for his car. Only the base of these foothills has been developed for housing. The address Fuminori gave Koji is outside of that area in the thick forest that still covers the mountain's face. This car's GPS shows a road that leads nowhere, but according to Fuminori, there should be an old abandoned sanatorium there. It's definitely a place that nobody could find out even by accident. Maybe this next stop will really be the last. Are you seriously not going to contact anyone when you do this, dude? Koji drives up to the steep incline, soon leaving the residential neighborhood behind. Even though the hand's progress are right at its doorstep, the undeveloped forest is darker than he expected. This looks like a great place to live in secret, or to kill someone and hide the body. Okay. 
we've we've read this. After grabbing his new flashlight from the glove compartment and checking that the revolver is still in his pocket, Koji opens the door and gets out of the car. So this is all the same? Yeah. Oh, all the way up here. All the way up to here is the same. Hmm? Okay. So he's just doing this without Ryoko. Okay, dude. Oh, okay. My mind hazy from the pain, I watch as Saya feasts upon her slain prey. We've won. It was hard, and I wasn't able to do it alone. But together, we have defeated our enemy. The price was steep. At least two of my ribs are broken, sending a sharp pain through my chest every time I breathe. And then there's Yo. I didn't expect her to fall, like, fall to Koji so easily. I suppose that, unlike Saya, she might have been unfamiliar with how to use her new body in combat. Uh, okay, if, if that's what you want to assume. My injury must have fueled Saya's anger. Her slaughter of Koji was merciless and complete. As soon as her, as her prey stopped moving, she sank her teeth into the vital organs and ruthlessly extinguished the last embers of life. Though her brutal, grisly actions were unbecoming of her girlish appearance, Saya's face, covered in blood and gore, was that of a victorious queen of beasts lording over her a defeated foe. There was something noble and sacred about her primal fer ferocity that made me reluctant to disturb her. I don't know how long I've been sitting here and watching Saya feast. I've nearly fainted from the pain several times. To be honest, I'm not used to violence. The wounds I suffered in the, in the car accident were worse, of course. These broken ribs are the most severe injury that's ever been deliberately inflicted upon me. You'd think that Saya could show a little more concern for my condition. Koji is already as dead as can be, so there's no reason for her to be so greedy. Yeah, can't she just heal him? I suddenly realize that Saya has stopped eating. Now she's lying on her back, rolling from side to side. Has she eaten too much? It's been several days since we've had fresh, unfrozen meat, so I understand where her enthusiasm is coming from. But still, I'm wounded here. She could give me a hand. Because I'm preoccupied with my own selfish ones, I'm slow to realize that something is wrong. Saya isn't re resting. She's trembling in agony. My blood goes cold, and the pain from my broken ribs is suddenly forgotten. I jump up, run to her side, and cradle her fallen body in my arms. Her face is pale and drenched in sweat, and her half-closed eyelids and lips are shivering like she has a fever. What's going on? Was she wounded in the fight? Could the meat she just ate be poisoned somehow? I don't understand. All I know is that something terrible is happening. Saya! Saya! You gonna sing yet? The only thing I can do is call her name with all my strength. Saya slowly opens her eyes and gazes vacantly into my face. There's no way she's fine. It's glaringly obvious that her condition is dire. Even so, I'm the only one panicking. Saya's expression is serene, as though she understands everything that is happening to her. She even smells softly up at me.
I might lose Saya. The thought is unbearable. Terror and despair are quickly overwhelming me and a feeling of utter helplessness that I cannot resist. Whatever is happening, I can't just happening. I can't just sit by and watch as it causes Saya such agony. In a soft voice, she reveals her secret. O okay. For a moment, my mind goes completely blank. I nod. What else can I do? If I speak, I'm afraid that I'll be unable to hold back my tears. I mustn't cry, not when Saya is facing her torment so bravely. It feels like Saya is burning up in my arms, and I fear that the terrible convulsions about that shoot through her at intervals will tear her frail body to pieces. Praying for her safety, I scoop Saya up and carry her swiftly out of the ruined building. Maybe the cold night air will soothe her fever, but that hope is futile, cruelly dashed as her breathing grows shallow and she moans through bluish lips. In response to my call, she opens her eyes once more. Her gaze is cloudy and unfocused. She can no longer see. Nevertheless, nevertheless, Saya looks at me. I can tell that she is imagining my expression where my face should be. Does she see you as a meat thing? It takes every ounce of my willpower, but I manage to make my voice light and cheerful. In Saya's mind's eye, I know that I am smiling. She won't have to see my face streaked with tears. Saya's whisper is weak and pained, but there is ecstasy in her voice. Ecstasy and joy. Her back suddenly shifts, then bulges outward. So she's gonna make everything meet, which makes it look normal to him. Okay. And then Saya blooms. How else can I describe it? Flower petals long and wide spread from her back like the wings of a newly formed butterfly. Their brilliant glow comes from the countless tiny scales that cover each petal like particles of light. Saya's pain must have already left her, and for her expression is infinitely peaceful and content. Okay, okay. The radiant motes rise on the wind, painting rivers of light in the frozen winter sky. It is beautiful, overwhelmingly, painfully beautiful. Singing victoriously of their freedom, the shining seeds of life are released into these vats, into this vast and fertile land. Their song, oh, there it is, finally, heralds the coming of the new world and the destruction of the old. It is a boundless healing. It is an eternal blessing. We shall fill the world with our joy. Embracing Saya's pitifully shrunken body, I gaze into the shining sky and let my tears flow freely. Thank you. Thank you for this final gift, Saya.
She was worried at first how long the preserved food in the underground storeroom would last her, but now it seems that her fears were unfounded. It's the liquor she should have been worried about. By savoring each drop of spiritus as though it were her last, she thought she could make her flask hold out a little longer. But she must have been consuming more each day than she realized. Who can blame her? There was no way she could have gone through this without the intoxicating effects of, a, of distilled alcohol. After Dioko chased useless emotions like hope and despair from her mind, she found herself spending most of the most peaceful days of her life. As resignation set in, set in, even hate and fear left her. Now she only feels off what Ogai Masahiko did in respect for the depth of his intellectual curiosity. After all, neither she nor this world has any reason left to deny his research. Alone in the mountain cabin, Dioko killed time by bringing order to the documents that Ogai had left behind. He took the scattered and ciphered papers and rewrote them in a more readable fashion, eliminating redundancies and adding indexes and tables of contents. Dioko did not intend for anyone to read them, of course. She knew full well how meaningless her actions were. With, re with her reason to live gone, however, having something to devote her to devote to to devote her mind to was at least some relief. And now, as the last congratulatory drops of Spiritus Vodka burned their way down Dioko's throat, all of Ogai's research lies before her in a single volume. She has finally finished transcribing and annotating the last of his writings. Enjoying the satisfaction of a pointless job well done, she idly pages through the manuscript that she had just completed. I shall conclude by summarizing my theory as it currently stands. The life form that I named Saya did not appear in our universe by chance, nor even as a result of my summoning, but because of the instincts that were programmed directly into her biology. A result of her summoning? What? Magic? She was created to fulfill the same ultimate purpose that all life shares, reproduction. Saya and her kind procreate by spreading their seeds to other dimensions. What is the probability that they will discover the doorway to another world? Even if they succeed in doing so, the chance of that world being suitable for reproduction may be even more minute. In order to make the most of that scant probability, evolution has granted them a certain advantage, none other than the astonishing ability that I have witnessed in Saya. To wit, they select the most prosperous life form that they encounter, take control of it, and in doing so gain dominance over that planet's biosphere. In other, worlds, in other words, they hijack the entire species. They do this by analyzing their target's genome, then overwriting its genetic code to remake it in their own image. Saya's biology is more than capable of inducing such dramatic and widespread mutation. There is a significant probability that the target species will have evolved into an intelligent life. This element may be necessary to gaining control of the planet's environment. Therefore, Saya and her sisters also plunder their target's culture and psychology. Their extraordinary learning ability and intellectual curiosity are likely instinctive tools that enable her to inhabit the target species' entire wealth of knowledge. In fact, it may be that Saya's kind has always had its sights set on intelligent life. Perhaps they always, perhaps they wait patiently for some foolish extra-dimensional species to gain knowledge of other worlds and in attempting to satisfy its curiosity, make contact with the outer universe in which they dwell. Rather than send Saya and her kin on their dimensional journeys with only luck and their own strength to depend on, would not waiting for such contact greatly increase the chance of finding a world worthy of conquest? Just as I, having acquired the silver key, fancied myself an explorer of the unknown, how many intelligent life forms in other worlds have thoughtlessly congratulated themselves for discovering Saya's sisters. Taken by the urge to go outside for a change, Dioko gathers up the manuscript and heads to her car, which is parked on the front yard. In the yeah. She has completed her self-imposed final duty. There is no longer any reason for her to remain holed up in the mountain cabin. She drives a little farther up the mountain to an open place that offers a scenic view of the land below. In the early days of the change, Yelko came to this spot to watch helplessly over the mutating city. The one flaw in my theory comes from none other than Saya herself. 
After using me to learn everything she could about humanity, Saya should have finally been prepared to begin the last stage of her invasion. However, she never carried out her mission. Why? I hypothesized that Saya was an irregular among her kind. It is said that the human race's intelligence has allowed us to conquer our natural instincts. Perhaps in absorbing the human psyche, Saya accidentally inherited the disease that infects our entire species. What is human love, really? What behavior could be more of a hindrance to the efficient propagation of a species? I reminded of how, at the end of her studies, Saya consumed vast quantities of romantic literature from across from all over the world. She tried to understand romance as an integral part of the human reproductive process. As a result, she may have unwittingly neutered her own par unparalleled reproductive capabilities. After all, she had not known love. She had come to this world to rule it in our place and had studied humanity to fulfill that purpose. But ultimately, she could not share love with a human. Without Lo's blessing, Saya was unable to find the passion to fill this world with her kind. And learning all that there was to know about humanity, she herself had become hopelessly human. Weary of loneliness, she despaired of the world. How pure her maiden soul must have been. If this hypothesis is correct, then it means I have failed her as a teacher. I cannot help but feel ashamed of, for having spoiled such an extraordinary organism. Saya. Next up, Ogai Masahiko, Ryoko knows more about that entity than anyone else. No. When the young man named Sakisaka Fuminori was added to the running, perhaps she only comes in third. In the end, she never encountered the creature face to face. She would like to have met it once, though. If Ogai's analysis of Saya's psychology is correct, then it must have been Sakisaka who were restored her desire to conquer the world. Perhaps as Sakisaka's chief physician, Ryoko played some role in bringing that lonely man and Saya together. In which case, she should at least have the right to attend their wedding to end all weddings. She might have even charged them a matchmaker's fee. I have a dream that one day, my daughter will know the blessings of love. I pray that there will come a day when her heart burns with the flames of passion and her world becomes bright and joyous once more. When that day comes, Saya, your terrible, irresistible purpose will surely consume us, that your progeny may flourish. The whole world will know your love and be reborn. Ah, what wonders the future holds. I deeply regret that I must end my life before I can see that day come, but the footsteps of those who would destroy my dream go closer by the hour. If I seal my lips in death, then their grasping hands will not reach you. Please forgive me, my daughter, for leaving you alone in this barren world. With the knowledge that you now possess, I know that you will find your own path. The radiance of your hard-won soul shall light the road ahead. Have no fear, have no doubt. March onward until you reach your answer at last. And I, Saya will dream forever of the world that you create. And I, Saya, will dream, yeah. Perhaps it is the isolated environment or the mountain air. Maybe she's just more resent resistant to the change. Whatever the case, Ryoko has not yet become as inhuman as the creatures wriggling through the city below. She does not know exactly how many people on this planet could still be called human. But she's one of what must be only a handful of survivors who are left to watch over the end of mankind. Of course, it's only a matter of time before she changes too. It has been three days since she chopped off her right hand, which had ceased to function as anything resembling a human hand. But the itching that is spread across her entire back is growing more intolerable by the hour. She could look in a mirror to see what she is becoming, but she doubts that would make her happy. Yoko thinks that maybe it would be best to just go to sleep here, with the world spread out before her. When she awakens, perhaps she will be ready to descend the mountain and join in the city's revelries. Or maybe she won't even need such a resolve anymore. Whatever the case, Ryoko thinks dreamily. Whatever the case, Ryoko thinks dreamily as she licks at the very last drop of from her flask. Even after I stop being human, I hope I'll still enjoy the taste of booze.
Oh, that's the end. Okay, then. I'm actually running out of time here, so I won't be able to give my thoughts right now. But that will be added to the end here. So, um, yeah, I guess I'll see you guys in a few, three seconds again. Okay, bye. Hello again, it's Future Nachos. Did you miss me? While this bit is scripted, it can hardly be called a serious breakdown or analysis. This is just me a day after, piling some of my thoughts having completed Saya no Uta. It was a bit of a mixed bag for me. On one hand, I believe I do understand what makes it so meaningful and immersive for some, but on the other, it was dragged down by some glaring problems I cannot overlook. For one, the H scenes. Now, don't get me wrong, I would never remove them from the story entirely as they play a pivotal role in the story and to an extent the characters. I have no problem with erotic scenes being included in a story, nor do I have a problem with its characters doing horrible, depraved things. What I do have a problem with is the clumsy intersection of the two where horrible, depraved things are being done and it's written in a way obviously intended to get the reader off. Saya is portrayed as a child and has sex with Fuminori, a grown adult. Yo becomes a sex slave. Neither of these things are inherently bad inclusions to the story, but they didn't need to write the sex scenes like any other smut. They could have wrapped it in atmosphere and metaphor, elegantly portraying the darkness in these acts and the psychology of the characters involved without needless fluff text designed to make your dick hard. You feel me? But enough of that. Another problem I had was that the characters and other bits of the story felt sorely underdeveloped. For example, Dr. Ogai's experimentation and the relationship with Saya built with him were presented as nothing more than an info dump. We could have had flashbacks or at least Saya describing it in her own view, but we get neither. It's completely left to the imagination, which isn't entirely a bad thing, but it makes it feel as though something is missing. I also found Fuminori to be a rather underdeveloped character, even though he is obviously the most complex in the story. I felt a little too focused in on the parts of him it most wanted to convey, which is fine, but it leaves a lot to be desired. By the end, I felt like I still didn't really know Fuminori, which is a bad thing. Even his descent into madness, while well established in theory, felt lacking in practice. I guess what I'm getting at is that this whole thing feels like a pitch. It doesn't feel like a fleshed out world. Part of that is due to its modest length, but part of that is due to its own impatience. I don't mind that Omi or Yo aren't well-realized characters. It was never their purpose to be. They're there to satisfy the rest of the narrative. But when Fuminori or Koji feel lacking in depth, that's when something is wrong regardless of its short length. Maybe you disagree with that. That's totally fine. These are just my impressions after having recently completed the VN. Another small critique I have is that the story falls into the horror genre pitfalls of characters making common sense defying choices to raise the suspense and stakes. I don't really have anything to add on top of that though, so let's move into the positives. I thought the story overall was competently written and paced. It had a clear vision and themes it wanted to get across and did so well. In particular, I enjoyed its take on truth as a concept. The line about humans needing to take it in small doses to be healthy stuck with me. I don't want to get too deep into it because I could end up talking for much longer and this is already starting to balloon out a little much for something I meant to mock up in a few min minutes and end this video with. So I think I'll cut the thematic discussion here despite how important it is to Saya no Uta. These ending impressions might seem more negative than positive just by the amount I'm talking about either side, but know that my real impression was overall positive. I'm not utterly blown away by this and it isn't racing to the top of my charts or anything, but it was an ultimately satisfying story that prods one's mind a little bit if they're willing to think about it. Some stories have aspects that really irritate you or damper your enjoyment of it, but with the exception of the aforementioned H scene problem, there is nothing really like that in here. I didn't dislike any characters or plot threads. It was good. Well, I guess I'll see you next time. I go by Tasty Nachos, and you go by.